On Tuesday, January 14, 2014, just before noon, law enforcement officers were dispatched to a residence in Frisco, Texas, USA, to conduct a welfare check on Anna Moses, a 43-year-old woman living independently. Her boyfriend, Michael Stodnik, expressed concern when he couldn't reach her. They were scheduled to meet for a date the night before, but when Michael arrived at Anna's house at 7.30 p.m., it was dark or the lights were turned off and her car was not in the driveway. This was unusual because Anna usually left her car in the driveway except for inclement weather when she parked it in the garage. Michael rang the doorbell, called, and texted, but received no response. Following his initial attempt to contact Anna, Michael drove to a nearby Starbucks and waited 15 minutes. He returned to Anna's house and found no apparent change, so he decided to go home. The next morning, Michael tried again to reach Anna via text messages and phone calls, but received no response. Concerned, he contacted some of her friends, who also reported not hearing from her at 9 a.m. On the morning of January 14, Michael returned to Anna's house and discovered that her trash bins were still at the front and packages remained unopened on her doorstep. Despite having a house key, Michael refrained from entering because he was unfamiliar with the alarm code. The situation indicated that Anna had not returned home from work on the 13th. Michael contacted the police and requested a welfare check after becoming concerned about Anna's well-being. The police advised him to contact the University of Texas at Dallas Police, which was Anna's last known location. Anna worked as a statistical analyst in the UDIS Strategy Department and had worked all day on January 13th. Michael went to the campus and spoke with the police, but they did not appear concerned. They only took Anna's disappearance seriously after her boss reported her missing. His boss also informed them that she had not been at work on the morning of January 14. Following this report, a 911 call was placed, prompting the police to arrive, but as residents nothing seemed out of place. There was no evidence of forced entry. They contacted Anna's son, Igor, who had a key and met them at the house. The alarm was disarmed at 12 or 5 p.m., according to the alarm log for the first time since January 13 morning. The question remained where was Anna? The police searched several rooms and found Anna's lifeless body in the garage, where she had been fatally shot. Despite her death, she remained dressed in her coat and scarf. Surprisingly, nothing seemed to be missing other than her car. Her purse containing money was discovered next to her, and mail was scattered around her. Notably, an empty Taco Bell sack with a quesadilla wrapper was on the ground nearby. Anna had seven gunshot wounds distributed as follows. One in the neck, two in the chest, three in the back, and one that did not break the skin, with the bullet lodged in her clothing. She also had abrasions on her left hand and a minor abrasion on her right hand, which could be the result of a fall or defensive wounds. Surprisingly, the police discovered 11 cartridge cases in the garage, which contradicted the initial count of seven. Interestingly, there were no bullet holes in the garage. This led the police to suspect that the crime scene had been staged to give the appearance of a robbery. Notably, no fingerprints were found on the patio door or the interior garage door. The police believe Anna was murdered on the evening of January 13 as she returned home from her job at the University of Texas at Dallas. The crucial question remains, who is responsible for Anna's murder? The investigation into Anna's death generated more questions than answers. Originally from Russia, she moved to the United States after meeting Robert Moses. Their union led to marriage, and Robert was formally adopted by his son Igor. Initially, the family appeared close-knit, with Robert and Igor having a strong bond. However, as the years passed and Anna gained confidence in her new American life, she began to engage in activities separate from Robert, causing strains in their relationship, and his interactions with other men contributed to the breakdown of her marriage. One of these connections was with Dr. John Wheeler Kowski, a colleague who would generously provide her with financial assistance when necessary. Anna also spent time with Jerry Casper, a man who shared her passion for opera and musicals. Jerry was so taken with Anna that he dedicated books of poetry to her. Despite this, he claimed there was nothing romantic between him and Anna because he was married. During their investigation, the police spoke with one of Anna's friends, Dr. Jacques, a Christian who worked at the University of Texas at Dallas. Dr. Christian described an incident that occurred on December 15, 2012, between Anna and her ex-husband Robert. According to Dr. Christian, Anna was in great distress and contacted her, claiming that she was trapped inside a closet with her two dogs. The police were called, 
but the incident was reported as an error. Dr. Christian stated that Anna appeared genuinely afraid of Robert, recalling an encounter in which Anna was visibly shaken and expressed concern that he would kill me tonight. Anna and Robert finalized their divorce in March 2013. Despite the separation, Robert remained in the house while Robert moved to a home shared with three other divorced men, most notably their son Igor, who maintained close ties with both parents and paid frequent visits to them. Despite their divorce, Robert continued to assist Anna with household repairs as needed. Surprisingly, Anna did not tell any friends or family about her lingering fears about Robert following the divorce. In fact, she appeared content and happy, having found companionship through online dating. Anna had been in a year-long relationship with Michael, whom she met through Match. Come. When questioned by the police, Robert gave his version of events on January 13. He claimed to have spent the day watching football at home before visiting Twin Peaks Bar. Surveillance footage confirmed his timeline with him entering the bar at 7.06 p.m. and leaving at 7.57 p.m. During the questioning, the police discovered a small cut on Robert's right hand, just above the knuckle of his ring finger, with blood seeping through the bandage. Despite this, Robert cooperated with the investigation, providing a DNA sample and allowing the police to search his room. During the search of Robert's belongings, several firearms were discovered, including a Ruger long rifle, a black pocket pistol, and a black Browning Buckmark target pistol. However, extensive testing eliminated these firearms as the murder weapon. The day after Anna's body was discovered, her car was found a few blocks away from her home. Upon inspection, the police discovered blood on the driver's seat, as well as muddy footprints on the car's hood and on top of the vehicle. Inside the car, a Red Bull can on the backseat passenger side and a cigarette butt on the floorboard raised suspicions because Anna was not known to smoke or drink energy drinks. The police believed that the blood found in the car was consistent with the type of injury on Robert's right hand. Subsequent DNA testing revealed that the blood in Anna's car matched Robert's DNA sample. When asked about the blood, Robert initially claimed ignorance saying he couldn't think of a reason for its presence. He later admitted to being in Anna's car on January 28, 2015, explaining that he was fixing a broken water pipe in the garage at the time. Following these findings, Robert was charged with murder. The prosecution built its case on the assertion that Robert was the only person with the motive, means, and opportunity to commit Anna's murder, claiming that everything pointed to him. It points to nowhere else. Their disagreements revolved around the belief that Robert murdered Anna for personal financial gain. The court learned of this on January 13. Anna left for work at 8.23 a.m., as she usually does, and setting the house alarm before she leaves. She spent the day at work, with a tea break around 2 p.m. Alongside Dr. Wheeler Kowski, Anna finished her workday at 5 p.m., her usual departure time. At 5.2 p.m., video surveillance captured her walking into the parking garage at work. At 5.7 p.m., Anna drove away from the garage, stopping at a Taco Bell drive, through to buy a chicken course, Dilia. Crucially, surveillance near an elementary school near Anna's house captured a car resembling Anna's passing by at 5.44 p.m. This begs the question, if Anna drove home, was someone waiting for her inside the garage? The prosecution's case was heavily based on establishing the timing of Anna's death, which the police claimed occurred between 5.50 p.m. and 5.50 p.m. and 5.55 p.m. testimonies in court included statements from people who live on the street where Anna's car was discovered. Stephen Brockway testified that on January 14, around 1 p.m., at 1.40 p.m., he and a friend were moving a trailer and there were no cars parked nearby. He returned around 3 p.m. and noticed an SUV parked there. Another neighbor reported seeing a blue Chevrolet truck on the street around 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. Based on this information, the police concluded that Anna's car was most likely left there after 6 p.m. On January 14, it was revealed in court that the police had interviewed the other men in Anna's life, specifically Michael and Jerry. Both men willingly provided DNA samples for investigation, but Michael denied possessing any firearms. Jerry, on the other hand, admitted to owning a 9mm Glock and a two-point target pistol. Although the police did not recover these weapons, the court learned from toll records that Jerry left his Arlington workplace around 5, 18 p.m. on January 13 and exited the Renner Road toll booth at 6 p.m. This information, when combined with the police's belief about Anna's death time, 
suggested that Jerry was not in a position to be responsible for the crime at the time it occurred. These details were presented to the court in order to rule out any other possible suspects. The court was informed that Dr. Wielerkowski had been excluded as a suspect based on toll records confirming he was in Garland Robert on his way home at 5.47 p.m. Furthermore, the type of firearm he owned, a .40 caliber Glock, did not match the gun used to kill Anna. DNA testing of the Red Bull can and cigarette butt found in Anna's car revealed that the DNA belonged to an unknown male. Despite entering the profile into the combined DNA index system, there were no matches. The prosecution emphasized the financial motive, claiming that Robert stood to benefit financially from Anna's death. A review of his financial records revealed that several credit cards were nearly maxed out. During police interviews, Robert allegedly expressed a strong interest in Anna's finances. Michael informed the police that shortly after Anna's death, Robert inquired about her financial situation and approached Anna's mother to inquire about the location of Anna's jewelry. Dr. Christian testified that she overheard Robert saying that it would be beneficial if he lived in Anna's house to avoid the cost of maintaining two homes. Tatiana Heber, another Anna friend, described Robert as a businessman who was interested in Anna's bank accounts, passwords, and other documents. The court learned that Frank Shuvra, Anna's independent executor, advised Igor to set up a trust, but Robert told him to deposit the money in a bank account. Instead, Igor was named the beneficiary of Anna's $750,000 life insurance policy. On February 4, 2015, Anna's estate deposited $25,000 into Robert and Igor's joint bank account. Igor claimed that the money was used to pay off the car he was driving, which Robert had previously owned and had since transferred to Igor. The proceeds were also used to pay off Anna's mortgage. The defense claimed that in their focus on Robert, the police failed to thoroughly investigate other men in Anna's life. They stated that the items discovered in Anna's car, as well as the footprints, did not match Robert's DNA, and that the weapon used to murder Anna had yet to be found. In Robert's defense, it was argued that he was not financially impacted by Anna's death. Robert claimed that his move into Anna's house was solely to assist Igor, who was the beneficiary of his life insurance. Igor supported this claim, testifying that Robert's decision to move in was his own, motivated by a desire for assistance in managing bills and household responsibilities. The trial revealed that Anna took excellent care of Igor, doing everything for him, so it was not uncommon for him to seek assistance with bill payment. Igor testified about the blood stain discovered in Anna's car, claiming that it had been there for years and was not a new or fresh stain. The defense also questioned the accuracy of the time of death. The medical examiner stated during the trial that Anna's stomach contents had been nearly completely digested. The defense argued that if she had eaten the quesadilla and died before 6 p.m., there would have been more identifiable food remnants in her stomach. This raises the possibility that she was murdered later, providing an alibi for Robert and some of Anna's other male acquaintances. Despite the defense's arguments, a Collin County jury found Robert Arthur Moses guilty of first-degree murder of his ex-wife Anna over finances and their relationship in late 2016, sentencing him to life in prison after more than eight hours of deliberation. In court, prosecutors referred to the then 64-year-old as a calculating killer, claiming that Anna 43 was targeted and ambushed at the time she died. She was shot in her prime and no one should ever fear him again. Following his conviction, he filed an appeal to challenge the court's decision. Robert's appeal focused on a lack of evidence, claiming that the conviction was based solely on conjecture and speculation. The appeal centered on specific pieces of evidence, including the chicken quesadilla from Taco Bell and the unexplained large sum of money in Anna's savings account at the time of her death. Concerning the chicken quest idea, the appeal focused on Dr. Williams' testimony, which challenged the established time of Anna's death. Dr. Rohor acknowledged that if Anna had eaten a chicken quesadilla on her way home at 5. 45 p.m. It is reasonable to expect the stomach contents to be partially digested after being shot 10 minutes later. However, he testified that he could not recognize any type of food in Anna's stomach contents, casting doubt on the timeline's accuracy. The appeal argued that the uncertainty about the digestion of the chicken quesadilla calls into question the accuracy of Anna's time of death, implying that she was killed after 7 p.m. Is true, this assertion would provide an alibi for Robert 
who was reportedly at the Twin Peaks bar at the time. Furthermore, the appeal highlighted Anna's substantial savings account, emphasizing the significant increase in funds over a 23-month period, despite the fact that her spending records showed she spent the majority of her income. The appeal faulted the police for failing to investigate the source of the funds. However, the state appeals court rejected Robert's arguments regarding the quesadilla. The court stated that no one knew what happened to it, or if Anna consumed it. Regarding Anna's savings, the court noted that prosecutors brought it up during the trial, claiming that some of the money came from a former romantic interest who wanted to help Anna. Despite the appeal, the court upheld Robert's conviction, and he is still incarcerated. The rejection of the appeal upholds the previous judgment and preserves the trial outcome. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. story about the life and brutal death of a young 27-year-old mother of two. Laura Ackerson was born April 30, 1984. In 2011, she was 2011, she was 2011. She was living in Kingston, North Carolina, with her husband of 32 years, Grant Hayes, and their two sons, ages three and two. Laura cared deeply about children, and so did her own children, whom she simply adored. Laura met her husband in 2007. Grant was a musician who performed at bars and restaurants. Laura was working at the bar when they met. Grant was a well-known local musician with a charming personality. They began dating, but Laura kept it a secret from her friends and family. Until one day, she informed them that she had married him. Friends were stunned, particularly Laura's best friend, Heidi. She always assumed they shared everything in their lives with one another. Laura's brother, Jason, was equally shocked. Nobody knew anything about Grant or who he was. The wedding seemed rushed. Despite this, those around Laura supported her decision. Laura became pregnant with a baby boy several months later. She was overjoyed, but Grad began to act strangely, as did Heidi's best friend and Laura's brother, Jason. Grant was very quiet, always angry, didn't like anyone, and disliked socializing with other people. Then Grant took control of Laura and her every movement. Grant began to suggest to her that everyone she loved and trusted was a negative influence on her. He would yell at her during phone calls with friends and family to hang up and stop talking to them because they were a negative influence on her. When Jason arrived, when Jason arrived, Grant would begin yelling at her to kick her brother out because she was not permitted to be in his company. Laura had to go out with her friends without telling her husband. Grant turned out to be an abuser who attempted to isolate her from society so that she would belong solely to him. Some believed he isolated her from her friends so that they could see the real him and persuade Laura to leave him. Grant also began to behave strangely toward his son. He refused to immunize the baby, claiming that African-American children are more likely to be autistic. Grant began to use alcohol and illegal drugs. He always used illegal substances, but after marrying the law, he stopped. But after the baby was born, he returned to those horrible substances. He began to focus more on his business and had less time for his wife. He went on long business trips and dated other women while working because of the illegal substances or because they exacerbated an existing mental illness or disorder, Grant began to have increasingly bizarre thoughts. He claimed that he was the chosen one, that the government was run by aliens and that they needed to raise a large sum of money to board a spaceship that would only transport the chosen ones during the apocalypse. He did not listen to Laura. They began arguing all the time. He justified his cheating by claiming he needed connections for work. Then he receives a business offer in the Virgin Islands. Grant decides to travel to the island, leaving Laura and her baby in North Carolina. There he meets a woman named Amanda. Amanda was an actress seven years older than Grant, and she was also wealthy because she was a widow who inherited all of her husband's money. Granted, he did not hide Amanda from Laura and claimed that she was simply a tool for his business. Laura could no longer stand being treated this way, and she wanted to leave Grant's. Laura's family advised her to flee and avoid him. Laura intends to move in with her brother, Jason. However, she was unprepared for what happened. She got pregnant with her second child. As a result, she reconsidered and chose to remain with Grant. She moved to the Virgin Islands with him and gave birth to her second son. The baby had health issues and required proper medical care. 
so they returned to North Carolina. Grant wasn't thrilled with the relocation. He kept thinking about doing business in the Virgin Islands. Then he began using illegal substances and alcohol more frequently, and he became even worse at manipulating people by using them for his own gain. Not thinking about anyone but himself, Amanda, a resident of the islands, was in New York at the time. Grant continues to socialize with her while humiliating Laura in every way possible. In the same room as Laura, he told Amanda over the phone that he loved her and wanted to marry her. Soon, he began to leave for New York, claiming that there were more business opportunities. However, Grant wanted to accompany Amanda. He left Laura at home with the kids. Laura had completely lost her patience at this point. Grant was not only constantly humiliating her and cheating on her, but he also spent almost no time with his family, oblivious to their disappearances. While Laura was preparing to leave her husband, Grant wanted to take her eldest son to New York for a couple of days to shoot a diaper commercial. Laura declined to give her consent. Laura, however, wanted the children to have a positive relationship with her father. She gave her son to Grant, but he did not return after a few days. Laura discovered a week later that there were numerous photos from Grant and Amanda's wedding on Facebook. Laura was shocked and called him, asking, Are you married to me? What wedding? Grant replied, I am not married to you. I did not sign any papers. Following Grant's statement, Laura discovers their marriage certificate, which does not bear his signature. Consequently, they were never married. Laura lived a lie for almost four years. Laura was in a panic, unsure what to do or how to reclaim the son he refused to give up. Grant and Amanda eventually sued for custody of Laura's sons, but she was not invited to the hearing. Grant appeared before the judge alone, claiming that Laura was a terrible mother and that their son should be in Grant and Amanda's custody. The court ruled in Grant's favor 30 days before the trial began. The court also separated Laura's youngest son from her and gave him to Grant and Amanda. Most likely, the court granted Laura's custody request because she did not have a job or a place to live. But Laura refused to give up. She got a job and found an apartment in a secure neighborhood with a surveillance system. She was willing to do anything for her kids. Grant and Amanda were then relocating to Raleigh, North Carolina, to deal with custody issues. Laura was fully prepared for the trial. She needed her children back. She was assisted by a friend, Heidi, a lawyer. Laura planned to tell the court about his addictions, manipulative behavior, and mental illness. Laura believed Grant possessed sociopathy. Laura provided all of this information to the court, and the judge determined that a psychological evaluation of both parents was required in this case. This analysis or examination also involved observing how the parents and children interacted with one another. For several months, there was a legal battle. Laura tried not to give up. She knew she had to work with Grant for the benefit of the children. She was allowed to spend weekends with the children and to call them every day. But Grant made things difficult. He kept the kids distracted, played loud music during phone calls, and constantly complained about his ex-wife. Laura recorded and saved all emails and voicemails. She was extremely serious about custody. She recorded everything she did with the kids, including what she played, what she fed them, and when she put them to bed. The truth is that Grant repeatedly publicly accused her of being a bad mother. He accused her of making the children ill, not feeding them, and even hitting them. He even hitting them. He even called the cops once after a child returned home with a bruise. As time passed, Laura began to receive dire threats from Grant. She told her friend Heidi that if anything happened to her, whether it was an accident or a natural death, Grant would be to blame. Laura turned out to be a wonderful mother after the psychological evaluation was completed. They had a great relationship with the kids. Laura's children adored her because she had a steady job and income, whereas the grant evaluation was unsuccessful. He did not have a strong bond with the children, which is understandable given that children form attachments to those who care for them. Grant never sat with them. He also frequently spoke disparagingly of Laura, saying some horrifying things about her. As a result of Grant's impaired thinking, the woman conducting the assessment recommended that he undergo further psychological evaluation. Grant and Amanda's lack of stable employment had an impact as well. Also, they had a daughter. Following that, both parents were given an equal amount of time to spend with their children. Almost no one believed Grant anymore because there was no evidence of his baseless accusations against Laura. Grant was very enraged. 
A court date was set, but Laura died before she could see it. Grant occasionally allowed Laura to take the kids to a children's center on Wednesdays after work. However, after the results of a psychological evaluation, he stopped giving her that time on Wednesdays on July 13. However, Grant still allowed Laura to meet with the children. Laura experienced a joyous and unexpected event. She finished her chores for the day and had several appointments. Then she called her friend and told her she was on her way to meet the children and that they could meet afterwards. In the evening, she was supposed to call her friend and co-worker Shavon Mathis about their joint venture. Laura, however, never called either of the girls. Siobhan didn't wait for Laura to call and instead tried calling herself but couldn't get through. However, after a few days, she became concerned and drove by Laura's house. That's when she noticed Laura's car wasn't in front of the house. She waited another two days but received no response from Laura Shavon. She then asked the landlord to open the apartment Laura was renting and see what had happened to her. They entered the apartment, but no one was present. Shavon then requested a couple of Laura's diaries, knowing that Laura recorded everything in those diaries for her own safety. On Monday, July 18, Shavon went to the police station to file a missing persons report. She gave the police the diaries and stated that Laura was now fighting for custody of the children and that she was extremely concerned about Laura's safety. The cops read her journal and her concerns about her safety and they became concerned about having the police check the security cameras at Laura's apartment building. Laura was last seen there on Wednesday, July 13th, at Ninium. She was leaving the apartment with all of her possessions. They checked her appointments all day and she had been everywhere, meeting with everyone about everything in her diary that she had completed. She made her final call to Grant at 5 p.m. She was three kilometers from his home. The police contacted Grant over the phone. He spoke with calmness and confidence. When asked when he last saw Laura, he replied that she had come to pick up the children at 6, 40 p.m. She was to take them to the children who had sent her and spend time with them. But first, he wanted to talk about the details of custody. Grant stated that Laura agreed to give him full custody of the children if you paid her $25,000. She then left with the children, returning between 9 and 9, 30 p.m. She left at 10.15 p.m., and it was the last time he saw her grandfather testify that he would deliver the children to Laura on Friday. He arrived at the usual drop-off location, but Laura didn't show up. The police checked the surveillance cameras at the location. Indeed, Grant appears to have arrived with the children, and he left without waiting for Laura. His story seems to make sense. The police have yet to speak with Grant in person. Everything so far has been done over the phone. Grant was avoiding meetings with police officers, which was very suspicious. Laura's bank account and phone had been monitored by police to see if they were being used. However, all was quiet on Wednesday. On July 20, Laura's car was discovered. It was parked outside the apartment complex where Grant and Laura previously lived before Amanda. The interior of the car was spotless, with no fingerprints. The police then decided to check Grant's cell phone, which revealed that he was not in North Carolina. He was in Texas, as he had stated from the beginning. The two investigators decided to make the 18-hour trip to Texas to find out what Grant was up to while they were on his trail. A search warrant was obtained for Grant's Rayleigh apartment on the grounds that he'd been ordered by the court not to leave the state with his children. He had violated this during the disappearance of his ex-wife, whom he is now suing. Bleach stain remover was discovered at the apartment's entrance. The entire apartment smelled of detergent. There were furniture marks on the carpet. In addition, one of the bathrooms was missing an item and smelled like bleach again. The bedding was removed from the mattress, but anything the police could collect as a sample for examination yielded no results. A letter in two different handwritings was also found in the apartment, stating that Laura was giving Grant full custody of the children in exchange for $25,000. One handwriting was Laura's, while the other was Grant's. Everyone who knew Laura agreed that she would never sign something like that in her life. Everyone had witnessed her fight for the children. When the detectives arrived in Texas, Grant, Amanda, and the children had already driven back. Amanda's sister, Karen, lived in Texas. Detectives interviewed her, and she had some fascinating things to say. Amanda and her new husband, Grant, whom Amanda's family had never met, had decided to pay a visit unexpectedly. They brought a truckload of different items such as coolers, furniture, and suitcases to all Amanda's relatives. Grant seemed strange. 
Amanda and Grant asked the relatives strange questions. They inquired whether there were any plots of land nearby with holes. They inquired about the well in the yard, how deep it was. Amanda confided in Karen that she had caused Laura a great deal of pain and didn't know what to do, but she couldn't go into detail. When the detectives asked Karen if she thought Laura's body could be in the truck, she burst into tears. Karen said yes. Then she instructed investigators to check the river near her house. Amanda and Grant made a sudden decision to go boating. It was strange because Karen's house had invited visitors to see Amanda, whom no one had seen in a long time. However, Amanda abandoned all of the guests and went on a boat ride right away. Police began searching Karen's home and property, and divers were dispatched to search the river. Karen showed the police the machete Grant and Amanda had left behind, which he had picked up with a towel and hidden in a wall in the garage. She did this in case it became evidence. She also kept an unwashed towel that Grant had asked her to use to wash something in her truck. Karen's son informed the police, and Amanda also questioned him. They tried to ask him about the local animals, such as whether alligators lived near the river and where they were usually found in large numbers, and whether they could eat an entire person. They also inquired whether sharks lived along the coast. Water lilies hampered the divers' search, but they were able to discover several white objects floating among the lilies. The police began finding the bodies in the water one by one. Initially, it was parts of the torso, legs, and arms. Finally, they discovered the head in Karen's home. They discovered items Amanda and Grant had left behind, including a receipt from the store. They purchased salty acid gloves and a large garbage can at the store. Grant and Amanda arrived at Grant's parents' house in North Carolina around this time, and the police had already obtained a warrant to seize the phones and truck. Grant remained calm and confident as he handed over the items. He was unaware that the police had already discovered the remains. Although the body had not yet been identified, police had enough evidence to charge Grant and Amanda with murder. On July 25, they arrested Grant and Amanda. When questioned, Amanda and Grant's statements shifted and they eventually started pointing at each other. Grant claimed that Amanda accidentally killed Laura and that he was only covering for Amanda because he wanted to protect her and was scared. Amanda claimed to have been a victim of his control, aggression, and manipulation, just like Laura. According to her grant, Laura and Amanda were afraid to tell him and instead obeyed him. At the time, the police needed more evidence to charge and prosecute them properly. They contacted the trash companies and discovered Grant's trash, which had already been removed from his property. They found gloves, women's jeans, women's underwear, masks, a vacuum cleaner, a shower curtain, a bleached towel, and a drop of blood on a glove. DNA testing confirmed that it was Loris blood. However, it was unclear who used the glove. Amanda's blood was also discovered on Grant's boat, after which Amanda went for a ride in Texas. Dental records confirmed the identity of the body discovered in the Texas River. Unfortunately, it was Laura's. It was also discovered that the body had been decomposing in hydrochloric acid for quite some time. The receipt clearly stated that they were purchasing that acid. Later, a surveillance camera in Texas captured Amanda throwing away the acid residue after they had gone on a boat ride. Laura's body was in terrible condition, making it impossible to determine the cause of death. There were obvious deep stab wounds that left marks on the bone. Based on a neck and head analysis, experts believe that death by strangulation is entirely possible. There was also a sharp object wound on the neck. According to the Grant story, when Laura arrived to pick up the children on Wednesday, she and Amanda got into an argument. Amanda accidentally killed Laura while Grant was in another room. He claims he only saw Laura killed after he had entered the room. Despite Grant's claim that he was only covering for Amanda, police officers did not believe him. On the Thursday, after Laura went missing, he drove to Walmart at 2 a.m. I purchased a reciprocating saw, some blades, a tarp, and a gym bag. Amanda stated that when Laura arrived with the children on Wednesday, she was in the bedroom watching cartoons with them. Laura and Grant were having a conversation in the kitchen about child custody. Amanda walked into the kitchen and noticed Laura signing some papers. She became curious and went over to ask what the paper was. When Amanda realized what it was, she became enraged because they didn't have $25,000. Amanda claims Laura approached her before Grant grabbed her, mistaking her for an attacker. Laura fell and hit her head while Amanda ran into the bedroom with the children. Five minutes later, 
Grant entered the bedroom and stated that Laura had suffered a severe head injury and that he needed to call an ambulance. So he instructed Amanda to gather the children and leave the apartment with her eyes closed. She took the kids to a fast food restaurant where a surveillance camera recorded her. When she arrived home, Grant was just sitting on the couch. He claimed he was fine. There was no need for an ambulance, so Laura went home. Amanda discovered the next morning that Grant had not returned home. She tried calling him and Laura, but neither answered. Amanda asked her daughter Shaw to watch the children and let her know when she needed groceries. She received a phone call from Grant, who requested that she purchase bleach and gloves. Grant later suggested Amanda travel to Texas to visit her relatives, but they did not depart on Friday. Amanda claimed that she had no idea Laura had died and that her body was stored in coolers in their truck bed. While visiting Karen, Amanda noticed Grant walking around the yard at night. She went downstairs and asked him what was wrong. He claimed Laura had died. Amanda only found out the truth at that point. According to her, Grant stated that it was her responsibility to assist him in disposing of Laura's body. They then drove to the river, deciding to feed the body's remains to an alligator because the acid hadn't worked. Amanda claims that Grant was paranoid and carried a machete on the way back to North Carolina. However, the police were aware that his machete was hanging on the wall in Karen's garage. Much of Amanda's testimony did not correspond to the facts. On August 26, 2013, Grant was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Amanda was found guilty of second, degree murder and sentenced to 13, 16 years in prison. Amanda filed for divorce in 2014, and in 2017, she was sentenced to 20 years for tampering with evidence and pipes. Amanda and Grant expressed no regret or remorse during the trials. Throughout the hearings, Grant smiled and remained cheerful. Amanda and Grant continued to blame each other for Laura's death, claiming it was an accident. However, it is believed that both of them planned it carefully. Laura was scared of both of them. She reported to the police that she feared for her life and had received dire threats from Grant. Laura would also refuse to enter Grant and Amanda's apartment if Grant intended to kill her there. Many people believe Grant chose to kill Laura because he needed more psychological help, and he knew he was going to lose the child custody battle. Following the trial, Grant's parents received custody of all three children. What do you think this crime was intended for? Unfortunately, this is a common story in life. People who are in love do not realize who they truly are. Perhaps if Laura had taken her time with the wedding or left this horrible man, this would not have happened so quickly. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. How often do you worry about your children's safety? Do you know where and who your children are now? Nowadays, every parent strives to maintain a unique connection with their child. Even if your child is an adult, your heart and mind remain with them. The story I want to tell you today is about the genuine bond between a parent and a child. Unfortunately, there are people on earth who violate that bond. But more about that. The story is set in a small town called Pembroke in Southwest Wales. It took place in the year 2021. That is, not much time has elapsed. On December 17, at around 4 a.m., the emergency services received a call from a terrified local resident. The woman discovered a woman's body and a mill pond, a two-mile-long freshwater reservoir, near the town. After arriving on the scene, paramedics began resuscitation efforts. All signs pointed to the fact that the girl had recently been in the pond and there was still a chance to save her. However, none of the attempts were successful. The doctors pronounced her dead. She was stripped to the waist and lying face down in the water. The possibility of an accident was almost immediately dismissed. Medical experts discovered strangulation marks on her neck, as well as scratches and bruises on her face and hands. That is, the girl reportedly resisted and tried her hardest to save herself. However, experts confirmed that the girl was strangled before being called and violently pushed into the pond. She had no personal items with her. The police discovered a dry lace top on the shore, indicating that it had been removed before the girl entered the water. The rest of the items were discovered with the assistance of a service dog, 
which tracked the trail and led the police to an alley 120 meters from where the body was discovered, where they discovered a jacket and a cell phone. The girl's identity had been established. She turned out to be 18-year-old Lily Sullivan, an innocent child for her mother. But, in the eyes of men, a young, blossom, and beautiful young girl was about to begin her independent life. Lily was the only and most welcome child for her mother. Sullivan, who had previously miscarried 14 times, giving birth to a healthy baby was a miraculous event. They shared a unique bond, a trusting relationship. The mother admitted that she had already accepted the fact that she would never have children, and when Lily was born, she was overjoyed. Her daughter taught her about the true purpose and meaning of life. Lily and her family lived in Pembroke suburbs. Friends and acquaintances described her as a cheerful, sweet girl, a true friend who would always come to the rescue with words and actions. She always saw the good in people, but only in herself, and she was harshly criticized. Lily was a great artist. She was a creative person who was critical of her own work. She also drew tattoo sketches, enjoyed bright makeup, and volunteered for a variety of charities. She was always eager to help others. Lily grew up to be an excellent person. At 17, she began her first year of college, and despite her creative work, Lily began working part-time in the evenings at a supermarket, despite being the only and favorite child. She turned 18 in early December. In the eyes of society, she was a beautiful, self-sufficient young girl who had reached the age of independence, the time when relationships with guys who enjoy going out to party usually begins. After reaching the age of majority, Lily began attending parties at clubs and pubs with her friends. On the evening of December 16, 2021, Lily's mother, Anna Sullivan, drove her daughter and her friends to the castle, a pub hosting a Christmas party. The evening at the pub was going very well. So, after the pub, the girls decided to continue their wonderful evening by dancing in a nightclub. Lily was approached to meet 31-year-old Lewis Haynes, who was spending the night with friends. Lewis was a cricketer who was well known in this part of town, particularly at the nightclub where he'd been partying all night. Lily and Lewis were seen kissing in the club around 11 p.m., which drew the attention of one of Haynes' friends who took Lewis aside and reminded him that he had a girlfriend and a young child waiting for him back home. But his friend's words did not deter Lewis, and he continued to socialize with her Lily, a young girl who had just reached adulthood and a 31-year-old man who, despite his wife and small child, decided to exploit the young girl. Lily called her mother around midnight and asked her to pick her up in a few hours. They agreed to meet in a parking lot near the clubhouse. Lily left the club at 1, 55 am, and Lewis followed under the pretense of seeing her off. Lewis's friend was waiting outside the club. He called out after her. I want to remind you that you have a girlfriend and a young daughter waiting for you at home, and she is only 18. Of course, after hearing these words, Lily made her own decision. But Lewis didn't react and continued to follow the girl. Then Lewis and Lily went to an unlit alley near Pembroke Castle, which overlooked Mill Pond. Lewis tried kissing girl again. But Lily foiled his attempt when she overheard her friend's remark about the girl and the baby. She immediately decided to drive to the parking lot where her mother was waiting for her in the car. Anna Sullivan called her daughter at 2.15 a.m., to inform her that she was waiting at the designated location. Lily said she was a few minutes away and would be there soon. She was still on the phone with her mother when the connection was abruptly cut off. Lily's mother waited for her daughter in the car, but her maternal instincts warned her that something was wrong. At that point, Lewis realized that the night was not going to go as planned and he was not going to get what he wanted in the right way. Kissing her at the club wasn't enough. He desired more. Lewis was unwilling to let her go he grabbed the girl's arms and attempted to forcefully remove her lace top. Then Lily pushed the intruder away, threatening to accuse him of rape if he didn't stop and saying his daughter would be ashamed of such a father. These words infuriated the drunken Lewis because he was in the process of gathering documents for the court to establish custody of his daughter and police attention to his person would jeopardize all plans. He punched Lily several times in the face he was a grown man with incredible physical strength in comparison to the fragile girl. Lewis had no trouble bringing Lily down. He began choking her aggressively, and when she stopped resisting, he pushed her into the pond. Around this time, a neighbor reported hearing a woman scream, who then stopped and attempted to call her daughter 30 times without success. She did not pick up the phone again. In addition, 
police searched for evidence. They saw on one of the alleyway CTV footage how Lily's phone display lit up repeatedly as her mother attempted to contact her. Later, while reviewing CTV footage, investigators noticed Lewis and Lily walking together down the alley, and three hours and eight minutes later, another camera captured Lewis appearing on the bridge alone. The video clearly shows him first walking, and then starting to run. Another camera at the gas station where Anna Sullivan was waiting for her daughter caught the killer just a few minutes later, at three hours and ten minutes. Anna had been attempting to contact Lily for quite some time. She became very anxious and searched for her with her eyes. That's how she encountered the murderer of her beloved daughter. I am passing Anna's car. Lewis Haynes looked her in the eyes and then began behaving inappropriately. He overheard Lily and her mother discussing the location and timing of the meeting and realized he was most likely looking into the eyes of his victim's mother. He started waving his arms and shaking his head at Anna. The stranger's behavior seemed strange. The mother couldn't believe that just a few minutes earlier, this nocturnal stranger had taken the life of her only daughter. Lewis arrived home at around 3.40 a.m. in wet clothes. His arms were deeply scratched. He became hysterical, woke his girlfriend, and begged to be taken to his parents' house. Lewis was so persistent that the girl couldn't help but comply with his request, so he tried to get away as soon as he realized what he had done. The girl wasn't aware of what was happening. On the way, he said, I believe she is dead, which raised more questions. At 6 a.m., December 17, Lewis was arrested by police at his parents' home. Lewis' father contacted the police. He asked himself hysterically as they let him out. What in the hell did I do? Lewis Haynes faced murder charges on December 20, 2021, because of the overwhelming evidence. He admitted to the murder of Lily Sullivan, but denied that he committed the sexually motivated crime. He claimed he killed Lily Sullivan because she threatened to report him to the police for rape if he kept harassing her. Lewis claimed that he had an outburst of aggression. He strangled Lily before pushing her into a pond. When he calmed down and realized what he'd done, he went into the pond to help her. But when he realized Lily wasn't breathing, he fled. The court and state prosecutors didn't believe him. The judge stated that if Lewis entered the water, it was only to ensure her death, not to save her. He had his phone with him, but no emergency calls were placed that night. The cameras also showed that he did not seek assistance from passersby, instead heading straight home. Before the sentencing, Anna, whose meaning of life was last, claimed she made a terrible mistake that night. She should have exited the car and gone to meet Lily after the connection was lost, because then she would have had a chance to save her daughter. She was horrified to learn she could have saved her child. One month before Lily was murdered, Anna Sullivan experienced a heart attack and her daughter saved her life. She recognized the dangerous situation and administered first aid before paramedics arrived. She also stated that after her daughter died, she began to experience panic attacks and stopped fearing death because it was the only way she would be able to see her child again in the afterlife. She described Lewis Haynes as pure evil who, due to his base instincts, destroyed several destinies in a single moment. It's also terrible that Lewis is the father of a daughter. However, because he wanted to satisfy his sexual desire and couldn't control his aggression, he killed an innocent girl. On August 21, 2022, a court sentenced Lewis Haynes to life in prison with the option of parole after 23 years and four months. So in 2044, the murderer could be free again. Unfortunately, this story confirms our fears. We live in the 21st century where we already have phones for fast communication, the internet and other technologies and applications designed to keep users safe. But even that did not help Lily save herself. Such crimes occur on a daily basis in our world and they almost always end tragically. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Imagine waking up one day and discovering that someone you know has vanished without a word. That's what happened to Tina Sandoval in a Colorado town 1995. Her story is reminiscent of a gripping mystery, complete with strange behavior and a failed marriage. In this story, we'll go over her strange disappearance and the shocking truth that surfaced more than 20 years later, leaving everyone stunned. Christina Tina Marie Tournay Sandoval got her start in Windsor, Colorado. 
Michael and Mary Ellen Tornai welcomed their child on March 17, 1972. She was a determined and energetic young woman who excelled in many areas of her life. Tina graduated from Windsor High School where she not only studied, but also competed in track, volleyball, basketball, and knowledge bowl. Her talents extended beyond sports. She played trumpet in the school band and sang in the choir. As the second child among her parents' nine children, she naturally assumed the role of caring for her siblings, instilling in her a strong sense of compassion for others. Tina's nurturing instinct drove her to pursue a career in nursing, and after high school, she earned an associate's degree in nursing from IEFM's community college. During her college years, she met John Sandoval, who wanted to be a radiology technician. Tina's commitment to her education was unwavering. She also furthered her education by earning a B's in nursing from the University of Northern Colorado. To fund her education, she worked as a licensed practical nurse on weekends at Northern Colorado Medical Center. Tina's commitment to excellence was reflected in her academic achievements. She graduated from Ankh in May 1995, ranking in the top fives of her nursing class. Tina started her nursing career in the oncology department of the North Colorado Medical Center. Tina's personal life was marked by her marriage to John Sandoval, which took place on December 31, 1991, in the picture Skuck, Colorado Rocky Mountains. However, their marriage was fraught with difficulties, and Tina filed for divorce less than two years after their wedding. Her determination to move on with her life and a positive outlook on the future prompted her to move into a new apartment and resume dating. Susan Ternai, Tina's sister, became increasingly worried on October 19th. Tina informed Susan of her plans to meet John at his home after her shift that day. Tina found the meeting significant because it revolved around John's need to sign certain documents and pay an IRS debt as part of the final steps in their divorce process. However, the situation was tense because John was opposed to Tina's divorce and did not want her to date anyone else. Furthermore, Tina was concerned about the meeting because of some troubling incidents in the past involving John, making her nervous about her encounter with him. Tina contacted Susan, requesting her presence at the meeting. Unfortunately, Susan had work commitments that day and was unable to accompany her sister. In lieu of her actual presence, Susan asked Tina to call her right after the meeting with John to give her an update on how things went. Susan waited anxiously for Tina's call all day, but it never came. Still at work and growing increasingly concerned, Susan decided to involve their mother, Mary Ternea. Mary went to Tina's apartment to check on her, only to find that she wasn't there. Mary went to John's house where he lived with his aunt because she sensed something was wrong. Unfortunately, John wasn't home at the time. Mary's concern grew when she noticed Tina's jacket in the kitchen, indicating that she had been there at some point. Fearing for her daughter's safety, Mary immediately reported Tina missing to the police that night. The investigation into Tina's disappearance took a troubling turn as the police dug deeper into the case. When they arrived at Tina's apartment, everything appeared to be in order, which matched their expectations. Tina appeared to have returned home after a shift change and then left again. Inside the apartment, her nurse's uniform was discovered, indicating that she had actually been there. However, a troubling mystery loomed because her car was nowhere to be found. It prompted authorities to launch a search of the area around 3 a.m., on October 20, Tina's car was found parked only four blocks from John's house. The situation became more sinister when a police dog tracked Tina's scent from the driver's seat of her car to John's house. John Sandoval was a familiar figure to law enforcement, having previously been convicted of harassment and burglary, which resulted in several interactions with police. When the police arrived at John's house, he attempted to flee by jumping out of a bedroom window. It took physical restraint to subdue and apprehend him. During the arrest, Fresh scratches were discovered on John's torso and neck. John was initially arrested on trespassing and unrelated charges. However, the police knew they needed to question him about Tina's disappearance. At this early stage of the investigation, it was unclear what specific charges would be brought against him in connection with her disappearance. When questioned by the police about Tina, John claimed he had no knowledge of her location. A search of his home and car began, revealing disturbing items. Among the finds were a white five-gallon bucket and a new shovel with mud on the spade. Furthermore, Tina's credit cards were discovered in John's possession, as well as a loaded 9M handgun rope and flashlight found inside his vehicle. Despite the mounting evidence and the search for answers, John refused to cooperate with the investigation. 
Tina's family and colleagues provided the police with critical information about her mental state and the reasons for her divorce filing. They revealed Tina was extremely nervous about her meeting with John on that particular day. Given her disturbing revelations about his behavior, she explained to her co-workers that John had voyeurism, a psychological disorder that caused him to engage in disturbing behavior. According to Tina, if John saw an attractive woman out in public, he would follow her home and conduct a prolonged observation that could last several days. Furthermore, he would leave their house in the middle of the night to engage in voyeuristic activities like peering through the windows of women's homes. On occasion, he would enter these homes and hide in concealed locations, such as cupboards, to keep a close eye on his victims. Tina also revealed that during these intrusions, John would steal women's underwear and take them home, in an especially distressing detail. Tina told her family and colleagues that she was not immune to John's voyeuristic behavior. She confirmed that he had watched her, and she described seeing his car parked outside her new apartment for hours at a time, which heightened her fears and concerns about her safety. Tina had discussed her concerns about John with her family, which she revealed when she informed him of her intention to file for divorce. He responded with a disturbing threat. John had placed a pistol to his own head, resulting in a terrifying and potentially dangerous situation. This disturbing incident fueled Tina's concerns about her husband's potential for harm. She had also told her doctor that she was concerned that John might endanger her safety. Despite these deeply troubling indicators and other circumstantial evidence, the district attorney at the time believed that more concrete evidence was needed to arrest and charge John, and the investigators faced significant obstacles. Tina's location remained unknown. The circumstances surrounding her disappearance were unclear, and no witnesses could shed light on the situation. Given John's employment at a cemetery and his knowledge of burial procedures, authorities conducted a thorough search for Tina in a variety of locations, including reservoirs and woodlands. Law enforcement also conducted a grim search of several graves in the area. The graves were carefully examined to see if they contained Tina's remains. While the investigation was thorough, none of the efforts produced conclusive evidence. The case eventually went cold, leaving numerous unanswered questions. Tina's death certificate was issued in 2002 by the state of Colorado, after a judge determined in December 2001 that there was sufficient evidence to believe she was deceased. Despite the passage of time, the police maintained their belief that John was involved in Tina's disappearance. He had been a suspect since Tina was reported missing, and that had not changed. However, belief alone was insufficient to secure charges, primarily because Tina's body had never been discovered, leaving a critical gap in the evidence needed for a prosecution. In June 2009, a new district attorney appointed to the position decided to re-examine the evidence, which marked a significant turning point in the case. Despite the absence of new evidence, he decided to charge John Sandoval with first-degree murder. This decision was based on the belief that the circumstantial evidence accumulated over time was compelling and could lead to a conviction. Even though Tina's exact fate and the location of her remains were unknown, John was officially charged with first-degree murder. After being charged, John entered a plea of not guilty. The prosecution's case revolved around the claim that wild Tina had never been found. They were convinced she was dead. After leaving work on the morning of October 19, 1995, all of her activities came to an abrupt halt. There had been no activity on her credit cards, bank account, nursing license, earnings, or social security since that date. Tina did not have a passport, and there was no evidence that she had changed her name, which would necessitate a legal petition to the court. Tina was portrayed in court by the prosecution as a responsible and dependable young woman who consistently attended work and paid her bills on time. She had recently signed a lease for a new apartment, indicating that she had no plans to relocate or start over elsewhere. As a result, the prosecution claimed that the only plausible explanation for her unexplained absence was that she had been the victim of foul play, specifically murder, and that all evidence pointed to her husband, John Sandoval, as the most likely perpetrator. The prosecution's case was based primarily on circumstantial evidence. Because there was no body or physical evidence directly linking John to Tina's disappearance, they were prepared to present the testimony of 137 witnesses to substantiate their case, claiming that John not only killed Tina but also disposed of her body. Throughout the trial, 
the jury learned about John's voyeuristic tendencies and pattern of following and stalking women, which added another layer of evidence for the prosecution to consider. The defense claimed that John Sandoval was not involved in Tina's disappearance and questioned whether she was even dead, speculating that she may have left town to start a new life and framing her as a runaway. The jury, however, did not agree with the defense's arguments. After seven hours of deliberation, they convicted John of the crime. As a result, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. However, John's conviction was overturned in March 2016 because of procedural errors discovered by the Colorado Court of Appeals. In the face of a second trial, John agreed to a plea deal. He asked for the deal, which allowed him to plead guilty to a lesser charge of second-degree murder in exchange for revealing the location of Tina's body. Tina's family had long suspected she was dead, and this revelation confirmed their fears. John then led authorities to Greeley's Sunset Memorial Garden Cemetery, specifically the grave of Second World War veteran Arthur Hurt, who was one of three open graves on the day Tina went missing. John had buried Tina's remains about two feet below Arthur's grave, concealed by a comforter covered in a tarp and sealed with duct tape. Unfortunately, cemetery workers mistakenly buried Arthur over Tina's remains after John had hidden her there. As part of the plea agreement, John was sentenced to 25 years in prison plus five years on parole. This sentence was retroactively dated to August 2010, when he was originally convicted of first-degree murder. During the sentencing hearing, John apologized and offered his condolences to Tina's grieving family. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The West family case involves the mysterious death of a glamorous housewife. Have you ever wondered what lies beneath the surface of an apparently perfect family? According to psychologists, the more people try to portray an ideal, happy, and prosperous family life, the more serious the underlying relationship issues become. Typically, such people are preoccupied with societal perceptions, constantly seeking approval and validation. Resentments can build up over time within these perfect family units, often erupting in unexpected and drastic ways. The West family appeared to be a strong, happy, and prosperous family, and they most likely were, until they weren't. The couple had been married for 14 and a half years, had a daughter together, and had never given anyone reason to suspect any problems in their marriage. That was until the early morning of January 13, 2018, when Mrs. West, 42, was discovered dead near her home. This convoluted story generated more questions than answers. The incident appeared to be both a bizarre accident and a deliberate homicide. Despite the fact that the case has been closed and the convicted are serving their sentences, many people have supported the alleged perpetrator over the deceased victim. To understand why, we must delve into the West family's history from the beginning and dispel the long-running rumors about the late housewife's double life, who was Kathleen West. Kathleen Dawn West, A.K. Martin, was born on February 15, 1975, in the small town of Davie, Florida. Nancy and Jonathan Martin's only child grew up in a humble and modest family environment. As a child, she wished for a younger sibling, but her mother's health issues prevented her from realizing her dream. Perhaps this is why Kathleen was so attached to dolls treating them as if they were living beings, singing to and cradling them at school. Kathleen was well known for her beauty and sociability, and she was an avid sports and dance fan. However, during her adolescence, she began to exhibit symptoms of bipolar affective disorder, which included depression and anxiety, as well as periods of hyperthermia, persistently elevated mood, and motor agitation. Unfortunately, her parents did not notice her condition until later, Kathleen had already turned to alcohol to cope with her emotions. In her 20s, the root cause of her problems was only discovered while she was receiving alcoholism treatment. Kathleen was able to overcome her alcoholism. However, managing her bipolar disorder proved more difficult, necessitating several potent medications with complex drug interactions and side effects. Finally, the disorder was brought under control. Although she had to continue taking medication until her untimely death, Kathleen wished for a family marriage and children, 
but her personal life was fraught with difficulties, possibly due to her psychological disorder and alcoholism. Nonetheless, the attractive blonde had many admirers, as she was the life of the party and enjoyed being in the spotlight. Kathleen wanted to be a model when she was younger, so she went to castings and experimented with different looks. Marilyn Monroe, the iconic 50s movie star and style icon, piqued her interest especially. She watched Monroe's films several times, collected posters, and emulated her style and image. It's worth noting that Kathleen bore a striking resemblance to her idol, which she proudly exploited and treasured, even though Kathleen's dream of becoming a famous model never came true. Her photographs were frequently published in local magazines, earning her some recognition, a fan base, and the odd mention on the streets of her hometown. At 28, she finally met William West, the man with whom she planned to start a family. William Jeffrey West, better known by his middle name, was born in 1970 in Alabama to a typical family. He aspired to work in the military or law enforcement from a young age, was a hard worker in school, and was an avid sports fan. He was strong, fit, and very focused. William joined the U.S. military in the early 1990s, starting as a military police officer. His dedication led him to work as a military recruiter, enlisting people in the Army and Navy. Eventually, he became the head of the recruitment division. William dedicated two decades of his life to military service. William chose to further his education while continuing his military career. He holds a bachelor's degree in public relations from the University of South Carolina. He pursued further studies in criminal justice and disaster and emergency management, eventually obtaining a master's degree. William was intelligent, composed, and goal-oriented, albeit modest and introverted. He preferred quiet gatherings to loud parties and generally avoided the spotlight. He married young and was the father of two children. He was regarded as a dedicated family man and a responsible parent. Following his military retirement, William worked as a corporal in a university town's police department. He was tasked with ensuring the safety of the campus community and approached his duties with seriousness and responsibility. Despite receiving a service firearm, he never had to use it during his career. Kathleen and Jeffrey, an odd but happy couple, had their pads crossed in the mid-2000s. Jeffrey was still in the military at the time, and he was married to his first wife. It appeared unlikely that the stern, quiet military man had anything in common with the flamboyant, bold attention, seeking blonde, but they felt an instant mutual attraction. Their five-year age difference, Jeffrey's existing marriage, and Kathleen's periodic struggles with alcohol, which he constantly battled, did not deter their relationship. Jeffrey quickly filed for divorce tea with his new love. They unexpectedly married in a Las Vegas chapel after meeting for less than five months. In 2005, the couple welcomed their only child, a daughter named Lola. They moved to Calera, Alabama, Jeffrey's home state, and settled into a cozy custom-built home. Kathleen personally designed their bedroom. Neighbors praised the West's home, which was decorated with portraits of her idol Marilyn Monroe, and described them as a happy couple. Despite being diametrically opposed, Kathleen always strives to look stunning and attractive. Wearing bold makeup, stylish hairdos, and Barbie-like outfits, she enjoyed catching people's attention and receiving compliments, always appearing cheerful and smiling. Jeffrey, on the other hand, seemed overshadowed by her presence, appearing reserved, serious, and highly disciplined, a reflection of his long military career and the double life of a blonde as homemaker and kitty cat. Despite her best efforts and striking appearance, Kathleen was unable to establish a successful modeling career. After marriage and the birth of her daughter, she concentrated on making a comfortable home and raising her child. However, the mundane life of a homemaker was insufficient. She desired attention and recognition. With the rise of social media in the late 2000s, she started actively posting pictures online. Initially, these were innocent Barbie or Marilyn Monroe-themed photographs. However, they gradually became more provocative and daring. According to close friends, her husband not only supported her new hobby but also frequently served as her personal photographer. It appeared harmless at first, but it eventually turned into a profitable venture for Kathleen thanks to paid subscribers. They purchased a variety of ready-made seafood dishes from a popular local restaurant, a bottle of fine brandy, and absinthe from the supermarket. Kathleen had chosen aromatic candles from a nearby store to set a romantic mood, 
and they appeared happy and carefree, smiling and joking, with no hint of the impending tragedy as captured on surveillance cameras at each location. After returning home with their purchases, the couple ate dinner and drank alcohol. Kathleen, who had previously struggled with alcoholism, was transformed by it into her online alter ego, a kitty cat. She asked Jeff to do a hot photo session, first in lingerie and then without any clothes. Jeff, who was not opposed, took several revealing photos, which were posted on Kathleen's private profile, only for fans by around 10 p.m. However, the romantic evening that was supposed to end in a passionate night quickly turned into nightmares, resulting in a tragic outcome. The body was found on the road early on January 13. Around 5 a.m., a young neighbor of the West was on her way to work. The sun had not yet risen, but it was bright enough outside. As she passed the west side of his house, she noticed something slowing down, but it took her a moment to figure out what it was. She quickly noticed an almost completely naked woman lying motionless on the road. She also thought she saw someone standing on the house's doorstep, who quickly vanished into the shadows when she approached during questioning. She couldn't tell whether this person entered the house or fled down the street, startled and unsure of what to do. The young woman hesitated before approaching the body. She returned home, informed her parents, and they all called emergency services to report the horrific discovery. While waiting for assistance, they reluctantly approached the woman on the ground, whom they recognized as Mrs. West, and checked for a pulse. Unfortunately, there was none. Her body was cold and exhibiting signs of rigor mortis. Kathleen was found face down, mostly on the sidewalk wearing only a bright pink bra top. A pool of blood had formed under her head, and there was an absinthe bottle nearby. Some of its contents spilled on the road, leaving bloodstains on the bottles. Her smashed smartphone lay nearby. Because it was a quiet residential area, there were no other witnesses that night. Thus, the time interval between the last sighting of the West's car around 8.30 p.m., Kathleen's lifeless body was discovered by a neighbor at 5 a.m., and it remains a mystery, likely witnessed only by her husband. What is Mr. West hiding? Detective Michael Melhoff, one of the first to arrive on the scene, proceeded to the house where the woman's body was discovered. A man answered the door, appearing anxious but claiming ignorance of the circumstances. When asked about his wife's whereabouts, he explained that he had just awoken and did not find her in bed. The detective then asked him to step outside, telling him that a woman's body identified by neighbors as Kathleen West had been discovered near the house. The man wearing a jacket pursued the officer and confirmed that the deceased was indeed his wife. However, Jeff's reaction was unusually calm. He didn't rush to the body, crying or screaming. When questioned about his whereabouts and activities that night, Mr. West stated that he had slept soundly because they had been drinking the night before and was asked what he thought had happened. He simply shrugged, implying that it could have been an unfortunate accident. Mr. West also revealed that his wife had bipolar affective disorder, needed medication, and struggled with alcohol, behaving erratically while intoxicated. He mentioned that she used to jump on their backyard trampoline, occasionally missing it and injuring herself. A search of the house yielded no evidence of a struggle or violence. Two glasses and a half-empty brandy bottle sat on the kitchen table, alongside plates of leftover food. Her high heels, captured in her last photos, lay beneath the table, and underwear matching the bra she was wearing when discovered was on the floor. However, several bloodstained napkins in the trash and an open bottle of cleaner raised concerns. That day, Jeffrey was arrested as the primary and sole suspect in the case. Jeffrey noted, in the chronology of events describing his last evening with his wife, that she drank heavily, which he disliked. After the revealing photo shoot, he hoped they would move to the bedroom for a more intimate setting. He stepped away to shower for a few minutes and returned to find his wife still sitting at the table, drinking absinthe straight from the bottle and texting on her phone. Kathleen ignored Jeff's requests to put the gadget away. He attempted to snatch the phone from her hands, resulting in a minor scuffle in which he accidentally elbowed his wife's face, causing a few drops of blood to flow from her nose. According to him, this is the blood found on the discarded napkins by the police. Mr. West eventually took the phone from his wife and, after opening the door, threw it into the darkness. He stated that after this, he turned around and went to bed. He was confident that his spouse would eventually calm down and join him. He was allegedly unaware of how events progressed until the police knocked on his door and inquired about Kathleen. He speculated that his wife had gone outside to find her phone, 
which she rarely left behind and had taken the abs in the bottle with her to finish. He also suggested that she could have fallen, hit her head on the bottle, lost consciousness, and frozen to death, or that she had been attacked. Mr. West couldn't explain why Mrs. West was missing the bottom half of her enticing pink lingerie set, or why she went to look for her phone and bra without putting on any outerwear hanging near the entrance. He explained such behavior in terms of alcohol intoxication and the main theory. The suspect's story appeared suspicious and inconsistent. He claimed to be too intoxicated to recall specific details, leaving the investigation to piece together the timeline of events. The evidence was limited, and there were no witnesses. The autopsy determined that the 42-year-old woman died as a result of blunt force trauma to the head, most likely caused by the absinthe bottle discovered nearby, compounded by hypothermia. At the time of the incident, her blood alcohol level was above 2.5, indicating severe intoxication with impaired coordination and a high risk of losing consciousness. At first glance, everything seemed to be in order. Kathleen, heavily intoxicated, ventured outside to look for her phone, bringing along an unfinished bottle of absinthe. She had most likely lost her balance while reaching for her gadget. Fallen, hit her head on the bottle, lost consciousness, and died as a result of the injury and exposure. The bottle containing blood traces lay near her head, and the smartphone, which was the reason she left the house, was discovered nearby. However, the investigation found this scenario to be overly simplistic and staged, and experts confirmed that the head injury was caused by the bottle beside the body. However, forensic analysis suggested that if she had fallen by herself, the bottle would have rolled away rather than remaining parallel to her head. Both Kathleen and her husband's fingerprints were discovered on the bottle. There were some smudged prints that could not be identified. Investigators arrived at a different conclusion after discovering blood-stained napkins and an open bottle of household cleaner in the house. Their theory, later presented as the primary and only plausible one in court, suggested that the couple fought over Kathleen's obsession with her subscribers. In a fit of rage, Jeff struck her with the bottle, resulting in her death. Panicking, he attempted to stage an accidental fall, cleaning up the blood in the house but failing to properly dispose of the evidence. This theory was partially supported by Jeff's phone's fitness app, which tracked his steps. According to the app, he was active around the house until midnight and then again early in the morning before the police arrived, contradicting his claim of being asleep. The police suspected he was attempting to conceal evidence during these times, possibly with the help of a third party. During questioning, the neighbor who discovered the body stated that she saw a male silhouette on the house's doorstep who quickly left in an unknown direction. She couldn't be certain whether it was Mr. West or someone else. In the dim early morning light, she also couldn't tell if this person had entered the house or not. This information piqued the investigator's interest given the deceased's popularity online. She had a lot of male fans who paid to see the revealing photos of the kitty cat. As a result, a theory emerged positing the existence of an obsessed follower among her subscribers. Perhaps someone wanted to meet Kathleen in person and tracked her down in the hopes of making a more personal connection. The middle-aged homemaker received messages from a variety of men, some with inappropriate proposals, but she kept her distance. No explicit threats or harassment were discovered in the communications. There are a few devoted fans. Living in other states with credible alibis was quickly eliminated as a suspect. Nonetheless, footprints found on the doorstep did not belong to the homeowners. These prints vanished on the lawn, leaving their origin a mystery. Could Mr. West have hurt his wife? His neighbors, friends, and family described the couple as happy and thriving. Jeffrey was aware of his wife's unusual online activities, but regarded them as harmless entertainment. Meanwhile, Kathleen's social circle was unaware of her alter ego, the kitty cat, and the majority of her followers were unaware of her true identity. When asked if he had ever been violent towards his wife, Jeffrey vehemently denied it, saying he loved her too much to ever harm her. However, arguments had become a regular occurrence in their home. A particularly telling text exchange from January 12 was discovered on their phones, in which the couple argued heatedly. Kathleen chastised Jeffrey for not matching her vivacity and temperament, even suggesting that they were incompatible. Jeffrey remained the primary suspect with forensic evidence and gathered information only hinting at his guilt. Notably following his arrest, not only his parents, but also his daughter and in-laws came to his defense firmly convinced of his innocence and claiming he could never harm his wife. 
Trial and Verdict After being arrested, Jeffrey West was unable to afford the $500,000 bail set, forcing him to remain in custody until his trial. This wait lasted nearly three years. He was offered a plea bargain, admitting guilt in his wife's death in exchange for a shorter sentence. However, Jeffrey steadfastly refused, insisting on his innocence. The trial, which began in November 2020, received a lot of media attention, thanks in part to Kathleen's online reputation. This publicity put significant strain on the judges and jurors. By this point, third-party involvement in the events of that fateful night had been ruled out. The prosecution maintained that all evidence pointed to Mr. West. They believed he was jealous and struck his wife with a bottle while under the influence of alcohol, resulting in fatal injuries. In a panic, they suggested that he stage the scene to look like an accident and remove evidence from inside the house. Jeffrey's defense team contended that Kathleen's death was unintentional, citing her extremely high blood alcohol levels as a factor influencing her balance and coordination. Kathleen's mother gave a heartfelt testimony in support of her son-in-law. She described her daughter as eccentric, but insisted that Jeffrey loved her unconditionally and would never hurt her. She also asked the court to consider their granddaughter Lola, who had lost her mother and was about to lose her father. On January 11, 2021, the jury returned a guilty verdict for involuntary manslaughter. Jeffrey received a maximum sentence of 13 years, taking into account time already served. Notably, if he had accepted the initial plea deal, he could have been released sooner. Jeffrey and his lawyer's appeals have all been unsuccessful thus far. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In the quiet town of Aspen, Colorado, a chilling mystery unfolded on a cold winter's day in 2014. A heinous crime committed in secret shocked and stunned the community. An individual known and loved by many died tragically and unexpectedly, forever altering the tranquility of this picturesque mountain town. Nancy Fister's life story begins in Orofino, Idaho, in July 1956, with her birth. She grew up in the picturesque suburb of Basalt, Colorado, and attended Bayside High School. Nancy's family had a unique connection to the development of the Buttermilk Ski Resort. Her father, Art Fister, transformed the family cattle ranch into this well-known ski resort in 1958, making a large fortune in the process. Nancy's mother, Betty, has a remarkable background as well. She was a member of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots during World War IE. She began her college career at Brooklyn's Pratt Institute before dropping out and returning to her roots in Colorado at the age of 20. Back home, she continued to play an important role in managing her family's business, which was well known in the local tourism industry at the age of 29. Despite never being married, Nancy welcomed her daughter Julia into the world. At the age of 39, she gave birth to a son. Nancy Feister's life was defined by her dedication as a single mother raising her two children in the log home her father lovingly built for her in 1991. On the fateful day of February 26, a visit to Nancy and her friend Kathy Carpenter's home took an unexpected and terrifying turn. It had been three days since they had last seen or spoken, and Kathy's concern had grown too strong to ignore. Kathy walked into Nancy's house and called out for her friend, desperate for a response. However, the eerie silence that greeted her sent chills down her spine. Her heart sank as she noticed a chilling detail, a small smear of blood on Nancy's headboard. The room itself was disorganized, with the covers thrown aside as if there had been a fight, but the most disturbing discovery was yet to come. Nancy's bedroom featured a large walk, in closet, and Kathy's concern grew when she discovered the door was locked. Desperate to learn the truth, she retrieved a spare key from the closet and cautiously opened the door. What she sensed was beyond her worst nightmares, a nauseating, unbearable stench. Inside the closet was a lifeless body. Kathy called 911 at 6.15 p.m., her voice trembling as she described the grisly discovery. She believed that the lifeless figure in the closet was Nancy herself. The arrival of the cops only confirmed Kathy's suspicions. Nancy's lifeless body was indeed hidden in the closet shrouded in a heavy-duty trash bag from the neck down, with additional kitchen trash bags covering her head. 
The scene was a horrific display of violence. Nancy had been brutally beaten to death, her head showing signs of multiple blunt force traumas. An electrical extension cord had been cruelly wrapped around her neck, adding a chilling element to the crime. Despite the brutality of Nancy's attack, there was very little blood at the scene, with the exception of a small smear on the headboard. But when the investigators turned the mattress over, they discovered a large pool of blood soaked into the fabric. It soon became clear that whoever had attacked Nancy had taken the chilling step of flipping the mattress to conceal the gruesome aftermath before fleeing. The question that haunted both Kathy and the police was who could commit such a heinous and brutal act against Nancy. It was a question that sent shockwaves through their peaceful community, leaving them to deal with the unsettling realization that a heartless killer lived among them. Kathy Carpenter's revelation added another layer of complexity to an already perplexity to an already perplexing case. She informed the police about recent tensions between Nancy and her tenants, William Trey Styler and his wife, Nancy Styler. This information immediately cast doubt on the Stylers and sparked speculation about their possible involvement in Nancy's brutal murder. The day after Nancy's lifeless body was found, an autopsy was performed by Dr. Steve Ayers, the Pitkin County coroner. His findings shed light on the severity of the crime. Dr. Ayers determined that Nancy died from three or four vicious blows to the head delivered with a hard object with a slightly curved edge. Although he couldn't identify the exact weapon used, he could tell that the business end of the instrument was small, about an inch or two. The exact timeline of Nancy's death remained unclear. Dr. Ayers estimated that the fatal assault occurred between the evening of February 24th and the morning of February 25th. Nancy's injuries were concentrated between her right forehead and right temporal bone, indicating three or four severe blows. In addition, several bruises covered her left upper arm, right neck, and right jaw painting a bleak picture of the brutal violence she endured. Dr. Ayers concluded that Nancy Foster's death was the result of a homicide. The investigation took a significant step forward, escalating the search for truth and justice. The focus was now squarely on uncovering the truth about the Stylers' involvement, as well as any other potential suspects who could hold the key to solving this chilling and deeply unsettling murder mystery. The police investigation took a critical turn when they looked into the complex relationships between Nancy Foster, the victim, and the Stylers. Her tenants made it clear that there was more to the story than what first appeared. Nancy Foster's decision to rent out her luxurious mountain home during her annual warm weather vacations became an important piece of the puzzle. Her ad, on in the Aspen Times, was straightforward, offering a three-bedroom home with three and a half bathrooms, strategically located on the mountainside. The only rule was no cats. This advertisement piqued the interest of Trey and Nancy Styler, who were considering a fresh start in Aspen, away from their troubles in Denver. At first glance, the Stylists seemed to be ideal tenants. Nancy Styler, a world-renowned expert, and Lily Paget, a retired anesthesiologist who was forced to leave his position due to a debilitating neurological disease, appeared to be responsible people who would take good care of the property. However, their seemingly peaceful lives had been upended by a series of setbacks. Lawsuits had depleted their savings, leaving them in financial distress. Trey's illness forced him to resign from his position as chief of staff at a Denver hospital, causing additional hardship. In a desperate attempt to reinvent themselves, they decided to relocate to Aspen, a wealthy and promising destination. Nancy Styler's medical background had led her to consider new possibilities she had taken Botox and laser treatment courses in the hopes of opening her own spa in Aspen. The presence of wealthy residents, celebrities, and tourists in the area made it an appealing prospect. When they came across Nancy Feister's advertisement, it appeared to be the ideal opportunity for them to establish themselves and make connections in their new community. So the stylists became Nancy Fister's tenants. The once promising landlord, tenant relationship had mysteriously deteriorated to the point where Nancy Foster died brutally in her own home. The police were now faced with the daunting task of unraveling the events that had led to this tragic outcome, attempting to determine the motives and circumstances surrounding Nancy Foster's disturbing murder. The police's conversation with Trey and Nancy Styler provided a vivid picture of their deteriorating relationship with Nancy Foster. It was clear that their initial enthusiasm for the tendency had faded, resulting in a deep animosity. Nancy Styler described their initial interactions with Nancy Feister as positive. 
they had quickly responded to her ad in October and were warmly welcomed into her home. Nancy Foster even expressed an interest in investing in their new business venture. However, the situation worsened after they moved in. The stylists claimed that Nancy Foster's behavior changed dramatically, becoming demanding, and in their words, akin to being treated like a slave. As a result, when Nancy Feister left for Australia in November 2013, the stylists were relieved of her absence. During Nancy Foster's absence, during Nancy Foster's absence, she had asked her friend Kathy to collect rent and care for her labradoodle. However, by January 2014, tensions had risen. Nancy Feister began posting complaints on Facebook, alleging that the stylists had stopped paying their rent and owed her money for utilities. Nancy Styler acknowledged receiving several messages and emails from Nancy Fister during this time. In an unexpected turn of events, Nancy Foster informed the Stylers in February 2014 that she was returning three months earlier than planned and demanded that they vacate her home before she arrived. When Nancy Feister returned home, she discovered that some of the stylist's belongings, including spa equipment for their business, were still stored in her garage. When Nancy Foster returned, she wasted no time in addressing the situation. She entrusted Kathy with delivering a note to Trey outlining her claims that they owed her $14,000 for utilities and property damage and demanding payment. Nancy Foster allegedly threatened to seek a restraining order to keep the stylers off her property. Although the stylers questioned the legality of such an action, Nancy Styler's version of events indicates that they went to the house to retrieve their belongings after receiving Nancy Foster's note. Nancy Foster was not present at the time, so they entered the house to collect their belongings, staying until 4 p.m. The next morning, they returned to complete the task, but they still did not encounter Nancy Fister. However, during their visit, they noticed Nancy's dog was left alone in the house. Nancy Styler claimed to be unaware of what had happened to Nancy Feister, as they had not seen her during their visits to the property. The Nancy Foster case, which involved her complicated relationship with the Stylers and her disappearance, added intrigue to an already enigmatic story. Investigators were intent on determining what happened when Nancy confronted the Stylers about the alleged deaths. The police's initial release of Trey and Nancy Styler following a 12-hour interview raised concerns about their involvement in Nancy Foster's murder. Aside from Kathy's report of a dispute, there was no concrete evidence linking them to the crime. However, the discovery of crucial evidence soon after their release would cast new light on the case. The breakthrough came when a man collecting trash just 100 yards from the motel where the stylists were staying stumbled upon Nancy Foster's belongings. I learned about her murder from the news. He recognized the significance of the discovery and immediately notified the police. After investigating, law enforcement discovered the bag mentioned by the informant, which contained some of Nancy Foster's personal belongings. Intriguingly, the Stylers Jaguar vehicle registration was found in the same bag, raising questions about why it was in Nancy's possession, but the discoveries did not end there. The police on Earth have an old hammer that they believe is the murder weapon. Testing revealed that the hammer contained traces of Nancy Fister's blood. Even more damning, Trey Styler DNA was discovered on the plastic bag containing the hammer. Furthermore, a key to Nancy's closet was discovered just a few yards from the Styler's motel room. With this new evidence, the police rearrested Trey and Nancy Styler, charging them with first degree murder. It appeared that the pieces of the puzzle were finally coming together, pointing to their role in Nancy Fister's brutal death. However, a cloud of uncertainty hung over the case, and the police were open to the possibility of other people being involved or the stylers being framed. Some of the evidence appeared to be strategically placed, raising suspicions of a hidden hand manipulating the situation. Furthermore, Trey's fragile physical condition as a result of his neurological ailment raised concerns about his ability to commit such heinous crimes alone. As the investigation progressed, the search for the full truth expanded to include the possibility that other players were involved in this chilling murder mystery. The arrest of Kathy Carpenter, a friend of Nancy Foster, and a local bank teller shocked the Aspen community. The investigation took an unexpected turn. As the police investigation progressed, they discovered a number of facts that raised questions about Kathy's involvement in the case, despite her friendship with Nancy Feister. There were underlying tensions because Kathy felt Nancy treated her more like a personal assistant, even though she had never been compensated for that role. 
The police suspected Kathy had made a connection with Nancy Styler, sharing stories about their common grievances against Nancy Foster. One particularly disturbing discovery was that Kathy went to Nancy's Alpine Bank safety deposit box and removed $6,000 of Nancy's money, as well as two family rings, just one day after discovering her lifeless body. When questioned about this, Kathy stated that Nancy had granted her legal access to the safe deposit box and that she had taken these items with the intent of delivering them to Nancy's daughter, Juliana. Despite the complexities of their relationship, Kathy remained devoted to Nancy and considered her a close friend. She admitted that Nancy could be demanding and frequently gave orders, but she also emphasized the enjoyable times they had together, which fueled the police's suspicions. According to records, Nancy Styler called Kathy three or four times on February 26, shortly before Nancy Foster's lifeless body was discovered. This communication pattern fueled the investigators' belief that the three individuals were somehow connected to Nancy Foster's murder. The twists and turns of Nancy Feister's tragic death continued with a shocking revelation. Just weeks before the trial was scheduled to begin, Trey, a key figure in the investigation, made an unexpected decision. He approached the judge and expressed his willingness to confess to the crime. Trey's confession resulted in a shocking plea deal in which he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and accepted a 20-year prison sentence. Trey offered to reveal the horrific details of what had happened to Nancy Pfister. However, a critical and fateful aspect of this plea agreement was that Nancy Styler, Trey's wife, would be granted unconditional freedom from all charges relating to Nancy Foster's death. Before the judge, Trey said the words that sealed his fate. Your Honor, I am guilty. He went on to give a chilling account of what happened that fateful night. Trey confessed that he initially went to Nancy Fister's house to reason with her. When he left his motel room, his wife was sleeping, unaware of the approaching tragedy. As he entered Nancy Feister's unlocked home, he discovered her sleeping peacefully in her bedroom. The sight of Nancy sleeping peacefully became unbearable to Trey's already troubled mind. His life was unraveling, plagued by financial ruin and Nancy Fister's relentless demands for money, combined with her retention of his spa equipment, left Nancy seemingly unaffected by the chaos, sleeping soundly in her bed. It was a tipping point for Trey, causing him to lose his grip on reality. In a shocking turn of events, Trey described going to the garage and retrieving a trash bag and a hammer. He returned to Nancy's bedroom and brutally bludgeoned her with the hammer, striking her repeatedly until she died, to reduce the evidence of the heinous crime. After Nancy died, he placed the bag over her head and carefully moved her body to a sheet on the floor. She dragged Nancy Feister's lifeless body into the closet, concealing it from the outside world, tying it with an extension cord tray. Trey's 20-year sentence, as stipulated in his plea agreement, marked the start of a dark chapter for him inside the prison walls. Simultaneously, Nancy Styler, now known as Nancy Styler, now known as Nancy Massey, made a dramatic escape from the shadows of her past. She changed her identity, moved to a different state, and filed for divorce from Trey. However, the narrative took another tragic turn. On August 6, 2015, Trey was discovered dead inside his prison cell, and the cause of death was determined to be suicide. Following her death, Nancy Styler Nancy Masson was able to collect a significant sum of $1 million from a life insurance policy. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In September 2017, a chilling and perplexing series of events occurred in a quiet community, leaving its residents in shock and disbelief. What started as a seemingly routine missing person case turned into a harrowing story of love, betrayal, and tragedy. On a sunny Tuesday in September 2017, a young woman named Laura Wallen awoke in her cozy home in Olney, Maryland. She was 31 years old and loved her job as a teacher at Lake High School. She was so good at her job that she was named Teacher of the Year just the previous year. Laura had worked hard to prepare for the new school year. She spent weeks getting her classroom ready for her students. She was looking forward to starting school again. However, something strange occurred on that fateful day. Laura didn't show up for work, which worried everyone. Her family, 
particularly her parents, became concerned after receiving a call from her boss informing them that she had not arrived at school. Laura was never one to miss work, particularly on the first day of school. She was passionate about teaching, and her students adored her, so when the Lauras received that call, they knew something was seriously wrong. They decided to contact the police and report her missing. The police decided to check on Laura and her home. When they arrived, her house appeared normal, with no signs of trouble. It was puzzling. Where might she be? What caused Laura to disappear? Even more concerning was that she was four months pregnant. The police had to find her. They contacted her boyfriend, Tyler Tessier, hoping he could provide some answers. However, Tyler stated that he had no idea where Laura Laura was. A frantic search began. Laura's black Ford Escape was discovered parked at an apartment complex near the high school where she worked. Volunteers gathered in Howard and Montgomery counties, handing out flyers featuring Laura's photo and posting missing posters wherever they could. Tyler and Laura's parents even went on television to ask for assistance and promise a reward. Does anyone know where Laura is? Tyler, who was desperate to find Laura, addressed the news conference. He pleaded with the public to share any information they possessed. He adored Laura and was constantly worried about her. He said, Laura, it doesn't matter what happened as long as you listen. It makes no difference what kind of trouble you're experiencing. There is nothing we can't solve together. So many people miss you. There are so many people out who have not slept and we have not eaten. We are simply looking for you or praying that you are safe. But Tyler was also pleading for help. The police and Laura's family began to suspect that he was hiding something related to Laura's disappearance. The police noticed some inconsistencies in what he was saying, and allowing Tyler to speak at the news conference was a strategy for gathering more information. Laura was still listed as missing at the time. No one knew what happened to her or where she was. But as the investigation progressed, Tyler began to reveal some disturbing information, raising even more questions. He told the cops that Laura had asked him for assistance. According to Tyler, Laura wanted to disappear because she was pregnant with a student's child, and she was terrified and embarrassed. She did not want anyone to find out. However, only two days after that press conference, everything changed. Laura was a missing person until September 13, 2017, when she was murdered. The police received a tip that led them to a remote field in Damascus, Maryland. Tyler was known to frequent the area, and they discovered newly dug ground in a hidden corner of the field. They discovered something horrifying with the help of specially trained dogs. Laura's body was buried in a shallow grave. An autopsy later revealed that she had been shot in the back of the head. This was a heartbreaking and horrific turn of events, and the police were now faced with the difficult task of determining when she died, who murdered her, and why the discovery of Lauren's body marked a dark and tragic chapter in the story and it was clear that there was a lot more to uncover. Laura's family, still reeling from the shock of her disappearance, now had to deal with the devastating reality of her murder. The search for answers has only begun. Tyler was considered a person of interest in the case because he was thought to be the last person to see Laura alive. This suspicion stemmed from inconsistencies in the various accounts he provided about his whereabouts and activities. During the relevant time period, the police had evidence that Laura was alive on September 1, as her family saw her that day. The next day, September 2, Laura went on an outing with Tyler. During this time, Laura texted her sister about the adventure Tyler had taken her on. The message read, Tyler has taken me on a country adventure. I am not sure why, but it is for something waiting in a field. The police discovered an important clue while investigating Laura's financial transactions. They discovered that Laura's debit card was last used at a Safeway grocery store near her only residence on September 2nd, between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. What made this discovery significant was that surveillance footage from the grocery store showed Laura wasn't alone during the transaction. Tyre was alone during the transaction. Tyre was seen with her. This information piqued the police's interest in Tyler as they attempted to piece together the events surrounding Laura's disappearance and subsequent death. But why does Tyler want Laura? The answer lay in their complicated relationship and Tyler's hidden life. Tyler and Laura had had an on and off relationship for a decade. They always found their way back together after breaking up. Their love was turbulent, with highs and lows. But Laura was looking forward to starting a family with Tyler, unaware of the dark secrets he was keeping. Laura was not aware of this. 
During one of the breaks, Tyler had begun dating another woman, a fellow teacher back in 2012. He even moved in with her while still in a relationship with Laura. Neither woman knew about the other, and Tyler was able to keep his double life hidden. When Laura found out she was pregnant with Tyler's child, her father, Mark Wallen, confronted Tyler about his intentions. He was aware of Laura and Tyler's on and off relationship, as well as rumors of another woman. Tyler assured Mark that he would take care of Laura, even showing him an engagement ring and claiming he intended to propose. He also informed Mark that he had not seen the other woman in two years. However, it was later revealed that the ring Tyler had given Mark was used to propose to another woman, not Laura. The other woman had agreed, and their wedding was scheduled just a month after Laura was due to give birth to Tyler's child. Laura and the other woman thought they were in exclusive relationships with Tyler, but the truth was much more complicated. It appeared that Laura discovered Tyler's deception shortly before her death. She text messaged the other woman on August 28, 2017, seeking a meeting to clarify something. She made it clear in her message that she was looking for answers rather than a confrontation. Tyler allegedly began plotting Laura's murder within days of sending that message, according to the police. He appeared to have convinced the other woman that Laura was unstable in stalking him. When the other woman received Laura's text, he informed Tyler, who sent a chilling message, I could actually kill her. Tyler initially denied any involvement with anyone other than Laura when confronted by the police. However, when confronted with evidence to the contrary, he finally admitted to his double life. Tyler was believed by the police to have brought Laura to a remote location with the intention of killing her in order to silence her and protect his secret life. Laura thought she was going to see some land Tyler wanted to buy, but the reality was far more sinister. He chose a field near the farm where he worked, a place he was very familiar with. Laura's sister had asked her to take a picture during the trip, and Laura agreed. The police would later use that image to pinpoint the location where her lifeless body was discovered. Tyler had taken her there twice, once in September 2017 and again the next day. The police believe Tyler shot Laura on September 17, and their actions following the murder were calculated and disturbing. On the same day, he texted a friend and requested a late-night ride to Baltimore. However, the friend declined to advise against such a late-night trip. Tyler's response was chilling. It's probably just attempting to clean up a mess, where the prosecutor's Tyler's actions were clear at all times. A premeditated murder. They believe that his meticulous planning and choice of location indicated that he had intended to kill Laura in order to protect his secrets from Tyre with the goal of providing closure and justice to Laura's family, but the truth would remain elusive. The shocking and tragic story of Laura Wallen and Tyler Tessier was far from over. As the case nears its climax in court, a sudden and unexpected turn of events would stun everyone, and the pursuit of justice would take a new direction. Detectives believed that after Tyler shot Laura, he used text messages to conceal evidence and cast doubt on the paternity of Laura's baby. He used Laura's phone to send a message to her sister stating, I'm about 95 sure, Tyler is not the father. I will try to contact Antoine. Laura's sister found the text confusing. She had a close relationship with Laura and was aware that if Laura had any doubts about the baby's paternity, he would not discuss it via text message. She told the cops that Laura had dated someone named Antoine about two years before her death but had no contact with him since then. Tyler was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, obstruction of justice, tampering with evidence, and false statements. He faced only one murder charge because Maryland law requires that the child be viable outside the womb before additional charges can be filed. When questioned by the police, Tyler initially denied any involvement or knowledge of Laura's situation. However, he later provided several conflicting accounts of the events. He initially claimed that, during a heated argument in September, Laura became enraged and attacked him with scissors, causing her to fall and seemingly die after colliding with a porch post. Tyler buried her in a field, believing she had died. When questioned about the gunshot wound found during the autopsy, he stated that he was concerned that he had buried her alive and then returned to shoot her to ensure she was dead and would not suffer. Tyler later changed his story, telling the police that African-American men had entered Laura's home and kidnapped her. He claims they compelled them to drive to Damascus where Laura was shot. When asked why he wasn't shot, Tyler explained that he begged the men to let him go. The prosecution was confident in their case, claiming Tyler was responsible for Laura's death. 
They contended that Tyler, who had been living a double life for years, was concerned that his secret was about to be revealed because Laura had discovered the truth. Tyler allegedly planned Laura's murder after she contacted the other woman he was involved with. Tyler was supposed to spend the weekend of September 2 with the other woman in Pennsylvania, ostensibly to look for bridesmaid dresses. Instead, he claimed he couldn't go because of a knee injury sustained while walking her dog, which proved to be a lie. He arranged to meet Laura and transport her to a remote field in Damascus, Montgomery County. The prosecution contended that Laura's murder was premeditated, as evidenced by the isolated location where she was killed and buried. They wanted to take the jury to this remote location to show the extent of its seclusion and the planning required. This visit would necessitate four-wheel drive to navigate off, road terrain, ascend a curved hill, and descend to the corner of a grassy field demonstrating the location's remoteness and hidden nature, supporting their claim of premeditation. They also planned to show the jury an animal processing facility near the field. Prosecutors believe Tyler used a skid loader on the property to dig a shallow grave for Laura's body. Laura's front license plate and cell phone were found in a dumpster on the property. The prosecution was concerned that photographs alone would not accurately depict the field's hidden maker, implying that someone familiar with the area had chosen. They had an aerial image of the site with a tree line and a photograph of Laura in a truck at the same location. Laura had sent her sister a photo of herself from that location. Furthermore, phone records for Tyler and Laura showed them at the location where Laura was later discovered, and the prosecution planned to tell the jury that after burying Laura, Tyler drove her car to a Columbia apartment complex, where it was later discovered. They planned to call witnesses, including one of Tyler's friends who claimed Tyler asked for a ride from the apartment complex and requested the opportunity to present their candidate to present their case to a jury on September 28. At 5 a.m., Tyler's lifeless body was discovered in his jail cell only hours before his trial was scheduled to begin. He hanged himself inside the Montgomery County Correctional Facility in Rockville, Maryland, leaving five suicide notes on the top of his bunk bed. This tragic turn of events meant that the prosecution would be denied the opportunity to outline and prove their case to a jury. Tyler's death brought an abrupt and unexpected conclusion to a case that had sparked widespread interest due to its complex and disturbing circumstances. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Have you ever wondered how often people are forced to do terrible things out of love? In most cases, completely innocent people who have no idea they have become victims in such stories suffer. The story begins with the protagonist, a lovely girl named Kendra Hatcher, who, without realizing it, becomes a victim in a love triangle. How did it all start? Who is Kendra Hatcher? We'll find out today. It occurred from September to 2015. On Wednesday, Kendra Hatcher, 35, drove into the parking garage of a Gales Park 17 home. She lived in a house where everyone, including Kendra, felt completely safe because there was a 24-hour concierge on duty. And it was a lively and luxurious apartment building with a saltwater pool, a fitness studio, and a gourmet coffee bar in the uptown neighborhood of Dallas, Texas, USA. But let's go through everything in order. Kendra Hatcher, 35, a pediatric dentist from Springfield, Illinois, was born on February 3, 1980. She came from a good family that could afford many things for her, including a good education, a good university, and a job. She grew up in Pleasant Plains, Illinois, and attended dental school before moving to Dallas for work. She had recently taken a job at Smile Zone. It seemed like an ideal fit for her during her spare time. Kendra led Bible study classes and not just any Bible study classes, and not just any Bible study. She was a devout Christian who wanted to use her dental skills to benefit others. She took part in volunteer programs such as building churches overseas and providing free dental care to children in Ecuador. Kendra's professional and personal lives were both very active. On May 24, 2015, she started dating a doctor named Ricky Paniagua. Ricky was finishing his dermatology residency at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Tendra and Ricky met on the dating app Tinder and had their first date on May 24. They were inseparable from the very first date. They shared similar values and desired the same things in life. Although their relationship had only lasted a few months, they were already discussing the possibility of marriage. 
Unfortunately, Kendra had no idea what lay ahead. Kendra drove into the parking garage to park her car after work one evening in September. She arrived at 7.42 p.m. She did this every day, but she was looking forward to the upcoming weekend because she had planned to spend Labor Day in Mexico with Ricky, but Kendra was not going to make it there. A few minutes later, she pulled into the parking lot. Two men walking nearby overheard screams and gunshots. After the shots were fired, a Jeep Cherokee pulled out of the parking garage. Hashim said, who lives in the apartment complex, overheard the screams and called 911. The police arrived and discovered Kendra's body in the garage. She'd been shot. It was initially thought to be a robbery. Kendra's expensive purse went missing. Bullet fragments and a gun magazine were discovered on the ground near her body. However, after further investigation and examination of the scene, police determined that the manner of the shooting did not indicate a robbery. Rather, it resembled a shooting. The gunshot residue discovered indicated that Kendra's hands were up and behind her head at the time of the shooting. The entry point was at the top of her head, and the bullet exited through the chin. But who could have intended to kill Kendra as a result of the shooting? Everyone was in deep despair. How could this have occurred? She had never disagreed with anyone. Everyone had no idea what could have happened. There were numerous questions, but no answers yet. The police started their investigation. Police recovered surveillance footage from Gallus Park 17. The video shows a Jeep Grand Cherokee driving into the parking lot at 7.15 p.m. At 7.42 p.m. At 7.42 p.m., Kendra returns home and pulls into the same garage. The footage shows a man walking to Kendra Scott, R, and then returning to the Jeep. Police believe this is the man who shot Kendra. The video showed that there was another person involved. The driver of the Jeep was a woman, and she drove out of the parking lot as soon as the man returned to the Jeep, but they could not be identified. So police released images of the Jeep and its driver to the media and asked the public for assistance. The appeal worked. Police were contacted by a man named Chosi Louis Ortiz, who claimed ownership of the Jeep but was not involved in the shooting or driving at the time. Jose stated that on September morning, two of his friends, Brenda Delgado and Crystal Cortez, approached him and asked to borrow his Jeep. They explained that Crystal was having car problems, so they left the car at Jose's house for him to fix, and he loaned them his Jeep. They were supposed to return the Jeep to him that evening after work. Instead, Brenda requested that he meet her at Chili's that evening, and he agreed that Crystal was not at the restaurant, nor was his Jeep. Jose told police that he was at the restaurant with Brenda when the shooting occurred. Later that evening, the Jeep was returned to Jose's residence. Jose didn't expect his Jeep to be used as a getaway vehicle. He said he became aware of it when he saw the police address and recognized his Jeep. When he asked Brenda about it, she said it wasn't his Jeep. But Crystal used it to get dangerous substances for someone. And something went wrong. Jose told the police that Brenda convinced him not to say anything because it was his Jeep and he could get in trouble with the cops, jeopardizing his citizenship. It appeared to him that she was attempting to manipulate him. According to Josie, Brenda offered to pay to have his Jeep repainted a different color. After speaking with Brenda, Jose called the police. The police officers approached Brenda and asked if she knew who Kendra was. Brenda said she had no idea who Kendra was and had never seen her. At 7, 42 p.m., on September 2, the police asked where she was, and Brenda said she was at Chili's with Jose, showing them the dinner receipts. Nonetheless, the police realized Brenda was involved in the crime. The first suspect in the case stepped forward. The cops questioned her about Joe's Jeep. Brenda said she gave Crystal the Jeep. When the police questioned Crystal, another suspect came forward. Crystal turned out to be a 23-year-old single mother. They asked if she was the woman on videotape driving the Jeep. She confirmed her identity and explained that an armed carjacker forced her to drive to the parking lot that evening. She stated that her nine-year-old son was with her, but the videotape shows that the child was not in the car. When the police informed her of this, she altered her story. She claimed there was no carjacking and that she voluntarily drove the man to the garage, but she assumed it was only for the robbery. She insisted that she knew nothing about the shooting. The police officers questioned her about why she had agreed to drive there, even though she suspected it was a robbery, and she admitted that Brenda had asked her to do so. The cops asked her what Brenda wanted from Kendra, which revealed new information. Kendra was dating Brenda's ex-boyfriend. It is about Ricky. 
Brenda and Ricky had dated from 2012 to early 2015. When they broke up, he began dating Kendra, which upset Brenda. However, Ricky was unaware of her unhappiness. In February 2015, he ended the relationship and began dating other women. When he met Kendra in May, he realized things were serious, and as a courtesy, he sent Brenda an email informing her that he was in a serious relationship. He didn't tell her Kendra's name, and Brenda seemed fine with it, saying she hoped to stay on good terms with Ricky as the interrogations continued and evidence piled up. Crystal sought a plea bargain and agreed to testify in exchange for a lesser sentence. She told the police that Brenda wanted to kill Kendra and that the murder was her idea. Crystal claims that within two weeks of meeting Brenda, they began planning to kill Kendra. Brenda was not simply upset that her relationship with Ricky had ended, according to the police. She was obsessed with him and desperately wanted him back. She pretended to Ricky that she was content with their friendship, but her life began to unravel. She was ready to hit rock bottom, so she began missing work. Brenda decided to make it her full-time job to bring Ricky back. She stalked Kendra and Ricky on social media, hacking Ricky's email and discovering their plans and travel arrangements. She started to hate Kendra even more. She believed Kendra had taken her place. In other words, she determined to get rid of Kendra Hatcher. Brenda asked Crystal if she knew of anyone who could help, and Crystal agreed to assist. They started devising a plan to kill Kendra. They met multiple times and devised various plans. Initially, they intended to inject Kendra with an illegal substance or sedative before discussing shooting her. Brenda asked Crystal if she could find someone to do it or if she knew anyone, as she was from a low-income neighborhood. They drove around the neighborhood asking people if they could help. Later, they met Christopher Love. He agreed to assist, and they started talking about different ways to kill Kendra. They decided that shooting her would be the most effective way to kill her because it was quick. Crystal told the cops that Brenda had agreed to give her $500, and she agreed to give Christopher both the money and the illegal substances. Crystal told police that they decided to kill Kendra on September 2 because they knew she and Ricky had plans for Labor Day weekend and would leave Dallas for a vacation in Mexico on September 3. Brenda felt they should have finished it sooner. Brenda was aware of all their plans and activities after learning that they intended to relocate to San Francisco upon their return. Brenda told Crystal that because she had downloaded Ricky's iPhone account to another phone and used it for snooping, she wanted the murder to appear to be a botched robbery. To determine where to commit the murder, Brenda and Crystal decided to follow Kendra to see how she got around on her typical day. They followed her to work. They sat outside the Salvation Army store and used binoculars to observe her movements while she was working. Brenda didn't realize Ricky's obsession with her head had turned her into a terrifying person, and Crystal didn't discourage her friend, instead assisting her for money. After work, they followed her and discovered the best way to get into the parking lot. They realized they could easily get in by parking in the visitor spot first and then following another car into the garage. They followed the same procedure for several days to ensure that nothing changed. They were confident that they knew exactly what Kendra would be doing from September 1 to the day before. Brenda, Crystal, and Christopher completed one last check and clocked in. They took gloves, syringes, disinfectant spray, and wipes from Kendra's workstation. The murder was planned to be committed by Crystal and Christopher alone the following day, September 2. Brenda and Crystal picked up the Jeep from Josie's early in the morning before meeting Christopher at Jack in the Box. Brenda was dropped off at the Carrollton Library while Crystal and Christopher went to Kendra's apartment complex alone. They waited across the street for about 30 minutes before driving to Kendra's place of employment. Crystal left to get her son and nephew from school and dropped them off at her grandmother's house. She drove back to Kendra's workplace and followed her as she left. They lost her in traffic, but returned first, so they pulled into the garage and waited for her there. When Kendra arrived, Christopher got out of the car. He was wearing gloves, approached Kendra with a gun, and shot her as she exited the car. Crystal stated that she heard the shot rather than seeing it. They left and Crystal collected her son after dropping Christopher off at home. Later, she met Brenda at Josie's house, where she returned his Jeep. Under the terms of the agreement Crystal made would be the prosecution's star witness. There'd be two trials. Christopher and Brenda were charged with capital murder and tried independently. Crystal received a 35-year prison sentence in exchange for her testimony and guilty plea to murder charges. 
The police discovered a gun in the side compartment of Christopher's car. The gun had been used to shoot Kendra. Because of this, Christopher was prepared to speak. He told the police that Brenda had promised to pay him in illegal substances and money, and that she had hired him to shoot Kendra. Christopher was found guilty and sentenced to death. Brenda had been on the run for nearly seven months before being brought to trial. She was even listed as one of the FBI's 10 most wanted people. She was arrested in April 2016 in Torreon, Coahuila, Mexico. Mexico agreed to extradite her on the condition that she not face the death penalty. When she was extradited back to the United States, she was officially charged with capital murder. Brenda's family and Ricky initially refused to believe she was involved in the crime. They recognized her as a loving woman of good character, with a good family and Christian values. Ricky told the police that they remained friends after their relationship with her ended. He even texted her the night Kendra was shot, letting her know she offered to help in any way she could. Brenda didn't plead guilty or not guilty, and her defense claimed she wasn't with Kendra at all and had an alibi and receipts proving she was at Chili's restaurant at the time of the crime. However, the prosecution claimed that Kendra was killed as part of a contract killing scheme orchestrated by Brenda. Brenda did not have to be present during the shooting to be convicted of the crime, and she could still be found guilty because she planned and organized the entire event, and she hired Crystal and Christopher to commit the murder. Brenda's motive for wanting Kendra dead was revealed in court. She saw her as a hindrance to getting what she desired. She wanted to get back to Ricky. Brenda became increasingly obsessed with Kendra and Ricky in the months before her death, according to the court. Several people who knew Brenda testified in court about her obsession. Brenda's cousin, Moses Martinez, testified that she was depressed after ending her relationship with Ricky. He testified that she promised him a reward if he hit Kendra with a baseball bat. He refused to do so. Brenda's friend Jennifer Escobar testified that Brenda was obsessed with Ricky and was angry when he ended their relationship. She testified in court that Brenda read all of his emails and tracked his movements on her phone. She told the jury that Brenda kept a copy of his house key and had access to his bank accounts. Jennifer testified that Brenda asked her to eliminate Kendra Hatcher. She told the court that Brenda wanted her to either give her a lethal injection or hit her with a bat and leave her in a coma. Jennifer also confirmed to the court that Brenda offered her $2,000, a car, and illegal substances if she agreed to do it. Jennifer discussed the offer with her parents and then declined. The prosecution believes Brenda asked several people to assist her before finding one who agreed. They believe she used crystals to her advantage. A crystal was a single mother earning $11 per hour, and she admired Brenda, a woman with her own apartment and money, and aspired to be like her. The court learned that she gave Crystal $500, and police discovered an Atman withdrawal receipt in her belongings. She had also paid Christopher who received the money as well as $600 to $300 in illegal substances. Brenda was at Chili's restaurant the night Kendra was shot and left immediately. However, the jury was shown video footage from a surveillance camera installed at Josie's neighbor's house on the night of the murder. It also revealed that Brenda had gone to Josie's house after leaving Chili's. She was there with Crystal, and they exchanged their Jeep for a car. Cell phone data revealed that she was with Crystal and Christopher prior to the murder and Brenda and Crystal communicated 99 times between August 22 and September. After only 30 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Brenda guilty. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Brenda was imprisoned and will not be released again. As a result, five people's lives were destroyed. First and foremost, Kendra, who had no idea Ricky would never get over it. Crystal, a single mother with a nine-year-old son, and Brenda's obsession have all had serious consequences. Unfortunately, a strong emotion like love can have such devastating consequences. It's times like these when you need to pause and let go. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On the fateful night of February 24, 2006, Imetse Sanguien, a 24-year-old criminal justice student at John Jay College in Manhattan, went out to celebrate with a friend. They had no idea that this night would end in tragedy and shake the very foundation of New York City. Imetse Sanguien's life was defined by a unique blend of cultural backgrounds 
and an unwavering desire to make a difference in the world, Simundo Gilan and Morin St. Hilaire gave birth in Boston, Massachusetts, on March 1, 1981. She inherited a unique surname that combines her parents' last names. Her mother was of French-Canadian descent, which added to the diversity of her family tree, and her father, Simundo Gilan, was a Venezuelan immigrant. Ameti tragically lost her father when she was nine years old, leaving a lasting impact on her childhood. Her mother, widowed by this loss, eventually remarried, causing additional changes in their family dynamic, and her educational journey was nothing short of remarkable. After graduating from Boston Latin School in 1999, she decided to attend George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Following in her father's footsteps, she earned a degree in criminal justice, demonstrating her dedication to understanding and addressing legal issues. In 2003, she proudly graduated magna cum laude, signaling the start of an ambitious quest for knowledge. Her academic journey did not end there. Imet St. Guilain continued her education at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where she pursued a master's degree. Initially, she intended to study forensic psychology, but she made a critical decision to shift her focus to criminal justice. Her dedication was evident, as she consistently ranked in the top five of her class and was set to graduate in May 2006, with an exciting future ahead. Unfortunately, a man's life was cut short in a horrific and chilling manner. She is in the process of celebrating her upcoming birthday with her mother and sister in Florida. She returned to New York on a fateful day in February of 2006. The events that night would send shockwaves through her family and the entire country. On February 24, 2006, Imete Sanguilin met with her best friend, Claire Higgins, to continue celebrating her upcoming birthday. Their night out took them to a nightclub until the early hours of the morning, when a disagreement led to Higgins leaving via phone call at 3.50 a.m. During the meeting, Higgins was assured that she would be returning home soon. Unfortunately, this would be Claire's last contact with her friend. Imeti Sanguilen was last seen at 4 a.m. at the Falls Bar. 17 agonizing hours later, police in Brooklyn received an anonymous call that led them to a grisly discovery. A lifeless body, identified as St. Julian's, was discovered on Fountain Avenue at Spring Creek Park. The horrific details surrounding her murder painted a bleak picture. She was discovered naked, wrapped in a comforter. Her broken fingernails a testament to her desperate struggle against her attacker. Her fingers and toes were bound. A sock had been stuffed down her throat and her head was encased in packing tape. Even her hair had been brutally cut. An autopsy revealed a horrific sequence of events with men suffering a brutal beating, sexual assault, and disfigurement at the hands of her attacker. The investigation into Imete Sanguilen's murder quickly became a harrowing and high-profile case that drew the attention of not only New York City, but the entire country and was handled with utmost seriousness and determination. The Special Victims Squad and the Brooklyn North Homicide Squad of the New York City Police Department worked together to investigate the chilling circumstances surrounding her death. The investigation into Imete Sanguilen's tragic death took a complicated turn as police dug deeper into the events of that fateful night at the bar. The accounts provided by the employees and the bar manager, Daniel Dorian, added layers of mystery to the unfolding plot. The bouncer's testimony revealed that she was visibly intoxicated and there were discussions about removing her from the premises. Daniel Dorian, the bar manager with a notable family history in the New York nightlife scene, had explicitly stated that he could be kicked out of the bar by 4 a.m when it closes. When questioned, Daniel initially claimed to not know Emet, Emet he. However, he later admitted to ordering his two bouncers, Tim and Daryl, as well as Little John, to accompany her out at the designated time. What raised eyebrows in this scenario was Daniel Dorian's failure to thoroughly vet his employees. It was discovered that Tim and Daryl were on probation and parole, and thus should not have been allowed to work at the bar, especially after curfew. The police then focused their attention on the two bouncers, beginning with Tim. He explained that he left the bar at 4.15 a.m. to catch the ferry to Staten Island, leaving Daryl and Ma in conversation. Daryl, on the other hand, told the police that he had a disagreement with Emet about racism and crimes against black men. He falsely claimed to be a U.S. Marshal. During their confrontation, Daryl claimed that he had escorted him out of the bar around 4 a.m., but he had no idea how she had gotten home. 
As the investigation progressed, police began tracking Daryl's movements between 4 a.m. and 8, 26 p.m., when I met his body was discovered. His alibi, which involved visiting his mother in a nursing home, was questioned as yet another possible falsehood. This prompted the police to obtain a warrant for Daryl Eve's DNA, as well as permission to search his home and car in order to discover the truth about that night's tragic events. The investigation took a significant step forward when law enforcement discovered that Daryl Littlejohn's DNA was on file from a previous bank robbery conviction. A chilling breakthrough occurred when the blood found on the plastic ties used to bind him at was discovered to be a match to Daryl's DNA. This crucial piece of evidence connected him directly to the crime scene, raising suspicions about his involvement in the heinous murder. With this damning evidence in hand, Daryl Littlejohn was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. The case against him was about to begin in court, with justice being sought for Emet Saint. Gulen's tragic and untimely death. The prosecution's case against Daryl Little John painted a chilling picture of a man with a troubling history of impersonating law enforcement officers and engaging in predatory behavior. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence presented to the court was Shanai Woodard's abduction in 2005. Shanai Woodard was walking home when she came across Daryl, who was dressed in a law enforcement uniform, complete with dark blue police pants, a jacket, a cap belt, handcuffs, and a gun. His shirt even appeared to include a police logo and the words fugitive agent. This guy was convincing enough to deter Shanai, who was then subjected to a harrowing ordeal. Daryl requested her identification, handcuffed her hands behind her back, and forced her into a blue van. Shanai Woodard's instincts told her that something was very wrong, and she bravely freed herself from the moving vehicle before seeking assistance. Daryl was later arrested in connection with Imeti's case, and Sean recognized him prompting a search of his van. Surprisingly, DNA evidence from both Shauna and Daryl was discovered in the van, as well as on the handcuffs recovered during a search warrant. Another alarming incident occurred in the same month as the Shauna I.I.'s attack. A 22-year-old woman had a terrifying encounter with Daryl as she exited the Queen's subway station. She assumed Daryl was a police officer based on his clothing, replicating his previous impersonation. Daryl demanded identification again, handcuffed her hands behind her back, and forced her into a vehicle that drove her to Jamaica on Queens Boulevard. The woman's ordeal continued as Daryl wrapped a jacket around her head, taped a black knit cap to her face, and slept. She was sexually assaulted, which was a horrifying and deeply traumatic event. The grim reality was that, like the Shania abduction, this crime went unsolved until I met a St. Willen's murder. Only after the investigation into the Ameti case revealed these horrifying details did a pattern of escalating predatory behavior become clear. The prosecution argued that each of these attacks had a common thread. Daryl Little John's abduction of women walking alone, often under the guise of a law enforcement officer. What distinguished Ameti's case was the tragic outcome, as the prosecution contended that she was murdered because she had the potential to identify her abductor and embed his knowledge of where Daryl worked and her ability to identify him represented a dangerous liability for Daryl, leading to the heinous act that ultimately took her life. This disturbing pattern of behavior painted a bleak picture of Daryl Little John as a serial abductor and sexual predator, leaving the jury to grapple with the horrific details of these crimes while seeking justice for Saint. Galen and the other victims the prosecution's case against Daryl Little John painted a bleak and disturbing picture of what happened after he was tasked with accompanying Emmett Saint. Guillen from the bar. According to the prosecution, Daryl kidnapped her during a storm and took her to his basement home in Queens, where she suffered a horrific and traumatic ordeal. It was claimed that he sexually assaulted her, bound her wrists and ankles, and used tape to tightly cover her face and head during the terrifying attack while she fought for her life resulting in broken fingers and bloodied hands. The prosecution believed that the blood found on the ties used to bind him at his wrists was caused by a nosebleed Daryl experienced during the struggle. Additionally, scratches on Daryl's neck during his police questioning were viewed as potential evidence of a violent confrontation. The prosecution also presented compelling cell phone evidence against Daryl, who left his phone near the scene where Emeti's lifeless body was discovered. The tracking of his cell phone revealed a brief movement from his queen's home to the vicinity of Emmet's body. Mamadou, a security guard en route to his construction site on Fountain Avenue, made an important observation. 
he saw a light-colored Ford van with tinted windows on Saturday evening. Just after 7 p.m., the van had no license plates and its headlights were off. Chi claimed he couldn't see anyone inside the van because of the dark tinted windows, but he did notice what appeared to be the glow of a cell phone held to a person's ear. This description fit Daryl Van, adding to the mounting evidence against him. An anonymous 911 call a call was placed at 8.43 p.m. That night, suspicions grew more intense. Fiber analysis presented in court revealed that the bedspread and tape used to wrap Emmett's body, as well as the van, contained fibers similar to carpet fibers, rabbit hair, and mink fur found in Daryl's home. The defense vehemently maintained Daryl's innocence, claiming that he was set up. Attorney Joyce David claimed that Daryl was chosen because of his extensive criminal history. The defense argued that the true perpetrator was Daniel Dorian, the manager of the false bar. They argued that Daniel, a member of a wealthy and influential family, may have had his powerful family cover up the crime. In a pivotal moment during the trial, Daniel Dorian took the stand and admitted that he had initially been less than forthcoming with investigators about kicking Imede out of the bar due to concerns about the negative publicity it would generate. He vehemently denied any involvement with a mass murderer and claimed innocence. The trial produced two opposing narratives. One from the prosecution painting Daryl Little John as a violent sexual predator responsible for Imeta's tragic death, and another from the defense pointing fingers at Daniel Dorian as a potential suspect. Ultimately, it was up to the jury to weigh the evidence and consider the arguments presented by both sides. After less than seven hours of deliberation, the jury returned their verdict, finding Daryl Little John guilty of the charges against him. This marks the conclusion of a lengthy and emotionally charged trial. Daryl was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole, ensuring that he would never again be a threat to society. In addition, he received a 25-year to life sentence for kidnapping Shania Woodard. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On an ordinary November day in 2003, a chilling mystery began to play out in the peaceful town of Grand Forks, North Dakota. Druce Joden, a vibrant young woman known for her compassion and community service, went missing after leaving Victoria's Secret. What followed was a harrowing journey through cryptic phone calls, shocking revelations, and a never-ending pursuit of truth and justice. Drew, a vibrant and ambitious 22-year-old, had deep roots in the town. She worked part-time at Victoria's Secret while attending the University of North Dakota and majoring in visual arts. Drew, however, was much more than her academics and work. She was a unique combination of creativity and compassion. Her passion for art knew no bounds, and she expressed herself in a variety of ways, from sketching to painting to capturing the world's beauty with her lens. However, it was her unwavering commitment to assisting others that truly distinguished her. Drew affectionately known as Doodles in her younger years, had a heart as big as her dreams. She was an athlete who enjoyed volleyball and golf, but her volunteer work exemplified her exceptional spirit. She devoted her time to underprivileged children, organizing bowling parties and teaching them the joys of reading. She also focused her efforts on fundraising for organizations such as the American Diabetes Association, leaving an indelible impression on her community. On Saturday, November 22, Drew finished her shift at Victoria's Secret at 4 p.m. Her vibrant spirit has not diminished. Little did she know that her workplace, a stepping stone to her dreams, would soon become the setting for an unfolding mystery. Drew had her sights set on an upcoming adventure, a trip to Australia in the spring of 2000, and each paycheck brought her closer to achieving her goal. As the clock struck 5 p.m., Drew exited the mall carrying a purse she'd found, and began walking towards her car. It appeared to be a normal end to the day, but fate had other plans. Unbeknownst to her, the next few moments would be shrouded in mystery, triggering a chain of events that would captivate an entire community. As Drew approached her car, she had no idea that her life was about to take a terrifying turn into the unknown. She was scheduled to work that evening, but when she didn't show up, her friends and colleagues became concerned. It was unusual for Drew to miss work without notice, and her absence raised concerns. Drew's boyfriend, Chris Lange, 
was one of the first to notice that something was wrong. He stated to the police that he had not seen her that afternoon, but he did receive a phone call from her shortly after she left the mall at 5 p.m. The conversation ended abruptly, leaving him with a strange feeling. In the background, he heard Drew say the words, Okay, I understand. Then the call was abruptly disconnected. At the time, he dismissed it as a dropped call. But as the evening turned into night, and there was still no sign of Drew, worry turned to fear at 7, 42 p.m. The same night, Chris received another call from her phone. This time, he only heard static and the sound of someone fumbling with the phone's buttons. It was far from reassuring. The alarms rang louder, and the police took action. They started searching the parking lot where Drew's car was still parked outside the mall. What they discovered sent chills down their spines. A knife sheath was discovered beside her car. The ominous prospect of an abduction loomed large. Desperation grew, and the police contacted Drew's phone service provider in the hopes of getting a lead. The information they received was both perplexing and disturbing. Drew's phone had pinged off a cell tower near Crookston, Minnesota, indicating she had been transported across state lines. Drew's normal day had turned into a perplexing and ominous mystery. The search for Drew, led by volunteers and law enforcement, demonstrated the community's unwavering determination. The fields and forests were scoured. Every lead was diligently pursued. However, the young woman remained elusive. Three days after her disappearance, a chilling discovery shook the investigation to its core. One of Drew's shoes was discovered along a bypass road near Crookston, Minnesota. The fact that she was so close to where her phone had last pinged added to her sense of unease. It was a cruel reminder that Drew had been in this area, and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance became increasingly mysterious. The atmosphere in Grand Forks became heavier with each passing day. Hope was still present, but it was fragile, like a flickering candle in the growing darkness. Drew's family, friends, and the entire community held on to the hope that she would be found safe and sound. However, it was during this period that the investigation took a dark and disturbing turn. The police received a tip from a concerned citizen who directed them to a man named Alfonso Rodriguez Jr., who lived in the area and was in Grand Forks on the day Drew went missing. Alfonso Rodriguez Jr.'s background sent shockwaves throughout law enforcement. He had been released from prison only six months before and was living with his mother in Crookston. Even more concerning was his classification as a level three sex offender, the most dangerous category, with a chilling history of 23 years in prison for multiple rapes and an attempted rape. The police immediately contacted Alfonso. He admitted to being in Grand Forks on November 22nd and even claimed to have visited the same mall where Drew worked. However, when pressed, his story began to unravel. When questioned about the movie Once Upon a Time in Mexico, which he claimed to have seen in the mall theater, the theater records and local listings contradicted his account. There had been no screenings of the film in Grand Forks that day. Suspicion grew, but the evidence discovered in his possession sent shockwaves through the investigation. When the police searched his 2002 Mercury Sable, they discovered a knife concealed in the trunk. Even more incriminating, they discovered blood traces on the car's rear window, and DNA testing proved conclusive. It was a match to Drew's DNA. The evidence against Alfonso was overwhelming, but the most haunting truth remained. The location of Drew Jodan. Despite the chilling evidence against Alfonso Rodriguez, Jr., Nigma Alfonso was arrested and continued to deny responsibility for Drew's disappearance. Several months later, on April 17, 2004, a tragic event occurred when Drew's lifeless body was discovered in a drainage ditch near Crookston. The bleak scene revealed Drew partially naked from the waist down, her hands cruelly bound behind her back, and her lifeless body lying face down. The area where her body was discovered had previously been searched, but it remained hidden under the snow until the thaw revealed the horrific truth. Disturbingly, there were signs of brutality or rope, as well as remnants of a plastic grocery bag around her neck. The autopsy performed on Drew's body sought to determine the exact cause of her death. The findings suggested that she died as a result of asphyxiation or suffocation caused by the slash wound to her neck or exposure to the harsh elements. The fact that Alfonso was accused of transporting Drew across state lines prior to her tragic death added to the gravity of the crime. As a result, he faced federal charges, allowing the prosecution to consider seeking the death penalty, 
which they made abundantly clear. Throughout the trial, the prosecution maintained that there was no room for doubt. Drew was kidnapped outside the mall, transported across state lines, and eventually murdered. They also expressed their belief that she had been violated. The jury was presented with compelling evidence, including a knife found in Alfonso's car and a knife sheath discovered near Drew's vehicle. DNA analysis linked Alfonso to the crime, as did the recovery of hair and fiber samples from Drew's body and belongings. Dr. Michael McGee, the medical examiner, was an important figure in the courtroom drama. He testified about Drew's injuries and the circumstances of her death. He identified significant cuts on her neck as the likely cause of her death. Though he couldn't rule out suffocation or exposure, Dr. McGee's expert opinion, based on his extensive experience and thousands of autopsies, suggested that Drew died violently during the assault. The condition of her clothing, particularly a torn pink sweater and displaced peacoat, indicated a struggle. The defense's perspective differed significantly from the prosecution's. Alfonso had offered to plead guilty in order to avoid the death penalty, but this was declined. The main point of contention was whether Drew was raped, as well as the critical question of where she died. The latter would decide whether to impose the death penalty. The defense claimed that there was insufficient evidence to support a rape allegation and that Drew died from suffocation mere minutes after being abducted. Alfonso was eventually found guilty in federal court of kidnapping, which resulted in Drew's death. After considering both sides' arguments, the jury unanimously recommended the death penalty, marking a historic decision for North Dakota, which had not seen a death sentence in nearly a century. Because the death penalty is illegal in the state, it is only considered in federal cases. The sentencing was a difficult moment for Judge Ralph R. Erickson, who acknowledged the gravity of the situation, saying it was the worst day of his life. Alfonso and his attorneys immediately requested a new trial, which was denied. They appealed and asked for a stay of execution until the appeal was heard. In 2020, one Ralph R. Erickson, the same judge who sentenced Rodriguez to death, overturned his sentence and ordered a new sentencing phase due to misleading testimony from a medical examiner and limitations on mental health evidence. Michael McGee, the Ramsey County medical examiner, testified in court in an untrustworthy, misleading, and inaccurate manner, and Rodriguez's attorneys did him a disservice by limiting Rodriguez's mental health evaluation, which could have resulted in their client using the insanity defense. On March 14, 2023, Prosecutors announced that they would no longer seek the death penalty for Rodriguez, who had been sentenced to life without parole on May 18, 2023. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Donna Ellen Brown was born November 10, 1963, in Florida. Donna was the eldest of three girls. She was attractive, intelligent, and successful in her job as an operating room technician. She met nuclear engineer Mark Winger, and the two married in a traditional Jewish ceremony in 1989. Donna and Mark appear to be the picture, perfect couple. They were successful and had a nice house in a nice neighborhood. However, not every story ends perfectly from the start. On Tuesday, August 29, 1995, at 4.27 p.m., Mark Winger called 911 to report that a man was harming his wife, Mark, who lived in Springfield, Illinois. His 31-year-old wife, Donna Winger, called the dispatcher to report that he had shot the man. When the cops arrived, Donna was in critical condition after being hit in the head with a hammer seven times. A 27-year-old man named Roger Harrington was found beside Donna in critical condition, having sustained two gunshot wounds to the head. Both victims were immediately transported to the hospital, where Roger died shortly after arrival and Darla died a few minutes later without regaining consciousness. The police secured the residence and discovered no evidence of forced entry. Mark, visibly distressed, told the police that he shot the man after witnessing the attack on his wife. Mark described how he was in the basement on the treadmill when he heard noises upstairs, prompting him to investigate. He found their adopted baby Bailey on the bed in the master bedroom, but no sign of Donna. When Mark heard more noises downstairs, he grabbed his handgun from the bedroom nightstand and headed for the dining room. Mark saw a man in the hallway wielding a hammer, 
and assaulting Donna. Mark shot the man, and as he attempted to rise, he fired a second shot. The police discovered the bloodied hammer used in the assault, which belonged to both Donna and Mark. The house also contained a .45 caliber semi-automatic handgun, which Mark confirmed was the weapon used. When Mark asked about the identity of the man who had attacked his wife, the police confirmed that it was Roger. Mark then said, that's the man who has been harassing my wife this week. According to Mark, Donna had traveled to Florida to visit her parents six days before. Her mother dropped her off at the airport, and a driver named Roger, hired through a limousine company in St. Louis, Missouri, drove her back to Springfield. According to Mark Donna, Roger was excessively talking and flirtatious during the two-hour drive, expressing a preference for older women and inviting them to intimate parties. The conversation took a dark turn when he revealed hearing a disturbing voice named Dom instructing him to harm others. Mark called the cops, saying the guy scared her. She stated that he was extremely frightening. He threatened to kill people, set car bombs, and mutilate them. Dawn has returned to Springfield. She informed her family about the unsettling encounter, expressing fear and discomfort as a result of the disturbing conversation and erratic driving. Mark told the police that, despite safely returning home, the situation persisted. Donna received several strange phone calls, and based on the timing, she suspected Roger was the caller. The police found a note in the house that described Donna's unsettling car ride. Mark also told the police that he reported the incident to Roger's employer, which resulted in Roger's suspension, which Mark believed could have exacerbated the situation. The police discovered Roger's car parked outside the Winger house, facing the wrong direction. They discovered various weapons inside, including a knife and a tire iron. Authorities concluded that Mark acted in self-defense and they chose not to press charges due to the traumatic circumstances. The case was closed with an acknowledgement that Mark had already experienced significant distress. Mark appeared deeply affected by the events. Mark and Donna had moved to Springfield shortly after their wedding, where they discovered happiness. Donna worked as an operating room technician at Memorial Medical Center, and Mark was an engineer with the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety. Despite facing challenges, such as Donna's initial distress at learning she couldn't conceive, their lives took a positive turn when a doctor informed them of a teenager willing to place her baby for adoption. On June 1, 1995, Donna and Mark happily welcomed Bailey, their adopted daughter. Following Donna's tragic death, Bailey, now responsible for the infant, chose to remain in the same house. To help with childcare, he hired a nanny, Rebecca Simic. Rebecca unexpectedly became pregnant a few months into her job and gave birth to a daughter named Anna. Mark and Rebecca married just over a year after Donna died. Mark decided to sell the house and sever ties with Donna's family. The new family, Mark, Rebecca Bailey and Anna, relocated to a different town. They gradually expanded their family by adding two more children, Maggie and Ben. Donna's close friend Donna Schultz told the police in 1999 that she had an affair with Mark while Donna was still alive and that Mark made troubling statements that she remembered. Donna Mark believes it would be easier for us to be together if Don had just died. All you'd have to do is enter and find the body. Donna also provided disturbing information that raised concerns with the authorities. When Mark learned about Donna's unsettling experience during the car ride back to Springfield, he allegedly told her that he needed the driver in his home. This revelation prompted the police to reopen Donna's case. However, they were disappointed to find that some evidence had gone missing. Mark filed a civil lawsuit against BART Transportation, seeking accountability for Diana's death as a result of Roger's actions. Roger's attorney requested access to the civil suit's evidence and files because he worked for BART Transportation at the time Diana died. Despite this, the police were able to save some files and access photos taken on the day of the incident. Donna and Roger are shown on the ground before being transported to the hospital. However, the positions of the bodies appeared to contradict Mark's earlier account given to the police years ago. Mark told the police that he saw Roger kneeling beside Donna's head, assaulting her with a hammer, which prompted him to open fire. Mark claimed Roger fell backward and in an attempt to get up, Mark shot him again. According to Mark's description, Roger's feet should have been near Donna's head facing the opposite direction. However, after reviewing the photos taken by the police upon their arrival, it appeared that Roger and Donna were both on the ground facing the same direction. 
This inconsistency prompted the police for the first time to suspect Mark of being involved in his wife's murder. The question of why Roger was at their house that day remained unanswered. Simultaneously, during the civil suit involving Mark, a possible explanation emerged. Bar Transportation hired a blood spatter expert who concluded that the blood spatter expert, who concluded that the blood spatter patterns indicated Mark's involvement in the deaths of Donna and Roger. As the police dug deeper into the case, they discovered more incriminating evidence. Susan Collins, Roger's roommate, informed law enforcement that she overheard Roger arranging a meeting with someone on the day he was killed. Furthermore, a note written on a bank deposit slip inside Roger's car was discarded, which contained Marx's name, address, and a time. Susan informed the police that Roger had mentioned agreeing to meet with Mark to resolve issues raised by Marx's complaints about Roger's driving and the concerning conversation he had with Donna. Roger left the house around 3.30 p.m. And the note indicated a meeting time of 4.30 p.m., which corresponded to the prosecution's belief that Mark had asked him to come to the house at that time. On August 23, 2001, Mark was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. The prosecution claimed that Mark was responsible for Donna and Roger's deaths. They claimed that Mark wanted to remove Donna from his life, but did not want to risk losing custody of their adopted daughter Bailey, so he avoided divorce. Mark allegedly saw an opportunity when he learned about Donna's problems with Roger, seeing it as an ideal opportunity to eliminate Donna and frame an innocent man. The prosecution proposed that Mark contact Roger, whom he had never met before that day, and invite him to the house. When Roger arrived, Mark allegedly led him inside and fatally shot him. This narrative was supported by the fact that there was no forced entry at the residence. The prosecution also claimed that Donna, who was in the master bedroom with Bailey when she heard the gunshot, went downstairs and was beaten to death with a hammer by Mark before dialing 911. The prosecution used a note found in Roger's car, which contained Mark's name and address, to prove that Mark had lured Roger to the house. The jury discovered that despite having weapons in his car, Roger did not bring them into the house and instead used Donna's hammer to attack. This raised questions about Roger's intentions, assuming he had gone there with the intent of assaulting Donna. The court was also made aware of inconsistencies between the location Mark claimed Roger was in when he shot him and photos taken on the same day, which contradicted Mark's account. Dean's testimony was crucial in shedding light on Mark's alleged statements, expressing a desire for Donna's death. The court learned that on August 25, 1995, four days before the murders, Mark inquired with his co-worker Candace Bolden about the fate of his adopted daughter if Donna died. Later that day, Mark complained to Ray Duffy, the president of the transportation company where Roger worked, about Donna's ride. Mark called back a few days later, asking for the driver's full name and expressing a desire to speak with him directly about the situation. During the trial, the court was informed of Donna and Roger's severe injuries. When the cops arrived at the house, Donna was found face down on the floor with Roger on his back. Donna died from brain trauma caused by multiple blunt force injuries to the head, consistent with hammer strikes. Roger died from brain trauma caused by gunshot wounds to the top left side of his head and above his left eyebrow, as well as contusions on his chest from hammer strikes. The defense argued that Roger's erratic decisions that day, such as his weapon choice and unusual parking, demonstrated mental instability. His behavior during the car ride with Donna supported the claim they made. Concerning the position of the bodies in the photos, the defense argued that while Donna and Roger were critical when paramedics arrived, they were not dead and they may have moved in an attempt to save their lives. However, the paramedics denied moving them before the photographs were taken, and Mark did not testify at the trial. Regarding Deanne's testimony, the defense claimed she was motivated by personal feelings of rejection. While Mark admitted to having an affair with Donna, he married the nanny he hired shortly after Donna died. The defense claimed Donna harbored resentment for not being chosen by Mark to marry. Despite the defense's arguments, the jury convicted Mark of two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced him to life without the possibility of parole. While still serving time for his first-degree murder convictions, Mark became involved in a failed murder, for hire plot, in 2005. He allegedly attempted to orchestrate attacks on Deanne for testifying against him, as well as on Jeffrey Gilman, a childhood friend for failing to post his $1 million bail. 
investigators discovered 19 handwritten pages that detailed Mark's desires for Donna. He allegedly wanted her kidnapped and forced to write a statement recounting her testimony, claiming Mark's innocence before plotting her death. Mark claimed in court that these notes were simply a fantasy he never intended to carry out. Despite Marx's assertion, he was found guilty of soliciting murder and sentenced to an additional 35 years in prison. Donna's mother, Sarah Jane, and stepfather, Ira Drescher, responded strongly to the evidence against Mark, emphasizing the brutality of Donna's murder. What makes it difficult to understand is how he murdered Donna in such a vicious and violent manner. Throughout the legal proceedings, Mark has maintained his innocence. Donna, who testified against him, was granted immunity and received no charges as a result. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Blessy Goninko, a 56-year-old woman finished her work day on Saturday, May 24, 2014, and was on her way home. She lived in North Shore, Auckland, New Zealand with her husband of 30 years, Antonio Goding. Their relationship can be traced back to their childhood in Cebu City, Philippines, where they both attended the same school. They dated, married, and raised three children, B, Vincent, and John. In 2004, the family of five moved to New Zealand. Blessy grew to love Auckland because it allowed her to indulge in her favorite activities, such as exploration, walking, and discovering new places. She worked at a job she enjoyed and had formed strong bonds with local friends. The Godinko family embraced life in Auckland, as evidenced by their shared experiences and joys. Just a few days before May 20, Blessy spent her birthday with her children, having lunch at a pub in Green Hive and a family dinner at Urban Turbine in Winyard Quarter. Unfortunately, Antonio was unable to join them because he was on a work trip abroad. Returning on June 15, Blessy could not wait to see him again. They were a close-knit family who were happiest when they were together. On May 24, Blessy Godinko completed her work at Tower Insurance at 7 p.m. Despite her regular working hours until 5 p.m., she willingly took on a few extra hours of overtime without prearranged transportation because her co-worker, Bahula Shah, who usually gave her a ride, had left earlier. Blessy chose to take the Birkenhead Transport 973 bus from Lower Albert Street to Birkdale Road. The bus stop was about 700 meters from her house, and the short walk should have taken her only five minutes. However, Blessing was unable to arrive at her destination that evening. Blessy's daughter noticed her absence when she returned home from work at 3.15 a.m. The following day, Concerned B contacted her two brothers to inquire about their mother's whereabouts, but both were unaware. At 6 a.m., I used my iPhone app to find Blessy's phone on a grass verge in Salisbury Road, just 100 yards from their house. Blessy's shoes and the Tupperware container she used for her daily lunch at work were also found near the verge. When the police arrived, they initially suspected a hit and run. The scattered nature of Blessing's belongings on the verge raised the possibility that she had been struck by a vehicle and was now disoriented and lost. However, it became clear that something more sinister had occurred. A young girl living on the same street reported hearing the woman's scream at the time. Blessy alighted from the bus closest to her home. Witnesses saw a BMW overtake the bus carrying Blessy, prompting police to investigate 28-year-old Tony Douglas Robertson. When questioned, Robertson claimed ignorance of Blessy and the events surrounding her disappearance. Notably, the police were already familiar with Robertson, who had previously been convicted of sex offenses and abductions. He had been released from prison five months prior and was subject to an extended supervision order that included 24-hour GPS tracking. Robertson's movements were tracked using the ankle bracelet GPS tracking device, which revealed his presence on the street where blessings vanished around the same time. Investigations also revealed that he spent time on May 24th at Escale Cemetery before returning the next day. This prompted the police to conduct a search of the cemetery, where Blessy's body was discovered two days later with the help of a police dog. Her remains were hidden under pine scrub surrounded by foliage and debris and wrapped in a sheet. Tragically, Blessy had been raped and fatally stabbed. Following the discovery, police arrested Tony Robertson and charged him with rape and murder. Despite the evidence, he pleaded not guilty. The prosecution claimed that Tony, 
A stranger to Blessy saw her walking home as he drove down Burkdale Street. According to their case, he intentionally struck her with his vehicle, causing her leg to break into pieces. Tony allegedly picked up Blessy, put her in the back of his car, and drove to his Burkdale apartment shortly before 8 p.m. to avoid setting off any alarms, impose a curfew. The witness testimony is intended to support this narrative. One witness stated that they saw Blessy alight from the bus at Brookdale and walk away quickly. They also saw a white sedan-like vehicle overtake the bus and speed down Sales Bar Road. The court heard from an 11-year-old girl who lived on Salisbury Road. She stated that, on the night of May 24, while cooking dumplings with her sister, she heard the sound of a car and a high-pitched scream around 7.30 p.m. Her testimony described how she was driving up the hill from Eskdale when it came to a stop. Then I heard a high-pitched scream from a lady, followed by silence. The girl went on to say that the car then drove off towards Brookdale Road. Inside the courtroom, the prosecution claimed that when Tony returned to his apartment, he parked his car in the garage beneath it and proceeded to commit heinous acts against Blessy. According to their case, Tony raped Blessy, strangled her and brutally stabbed her in a frenzied and violent manner before striking her in the throat. The prosecution also claimed that early the next morning, Tony wrapped Blessy's lifeless body in a bedsheet, placed it back in his car, and drove to Eskdale Cemetery to bury her. They speculated that the timing was deliberate, allowing Tony to avoid violating his curfew. A forensic scientist testified that luminol testing conducted in the area where Blessy's body was discovered revealed a blue path, indicating that a blood-stained object was most likely dragged through the grass. The evidence suggested that Blessy's body had been transported through different parts of the cemetery before being placed on the ground and dragged to the spot where it was discovered. Dr. Carl Y. Grin, a pathologist, presented details about the injuries in court. He testified that Blessy had multiple deep stab wounds, one of which was so violent that it embedded links from her necklace. Dr. A. Grin also stated that when Blessy was stabbed in the throat, her windpipe was damaged. He emphasized that all of Blessy's injuries occurred while she was alive, as evidenced by the blood in her lungs. Pathologist Dr. Carl Walgren testified that Blessy suffered numerous injuries, making it difficult to pinpoint a single cause of death. He suggested that her death was caused by a combination of factors, including strangling blunt force trauma from being hit by a car, stab wounds, and incised wounds. Dr. Walgren expressed difficulty attributing death to a single injury, but believed that the stabbing hastened her death. Blessy was found to have suffered a variety of blunt force trauma injuries, including broken ribs, legs, teeth, and abrasions consistent with postmortem dragging. Dr. Walgren proposed that Blessy was strangled first to subdue her, followed by stabbings and incised wounds. Evidence of manual strangulation was found, including bruising on her neck, a fractured thyroid, and broken capillaries in her eyes. According to Dr. Y, a grin blessing could have survived being hit by a car with prompt medical attention. However, she sustained additional injuries, including sharp force injuries that resulted in significant bleeding. When asked about defensive wounds, Dr. Wagner stated that there did not appear to be any explanation to the jury that such an absence is not uncommon in cases where the victim succumbs to violence. Dr. Walgren also informed the court that DNA tests on Blessy's body revealed the presence of Tony's seminal fluid. This testimony provided critical forensic evidence for the prosecution's case. The court was informed that Tony, who was wearing a GPS anklet at the time, had visited Eskdale Cemetery hours before the murder. The prosecution claimed that Tony was scouting for a location to hide a body, which indicated premeditation. They claimed that he planned the murder in advance, choosing the burial site before deciding on his victim. The DP's data also revealed Tony returning to the cemetery early the following morning, leading the prosecution to believe he dumped Blessy's body at that time. Crown Prosecutor Michael Walker emphasized the significance of these visits claiming that they demonstrated the defendant's intent to kill someone and that the trip to the cemetery was to determine where to dispose of the body. The court heard that blood was found in Tony's car and a knife and some of Blessy's belongings were discovered buried in the back of his property. The knife contained traces of Blessy's blood. Tony's BMU was damaged and evidence of this was presented in court. Detective Constable Shane Page testified that the vehicle had recently sustained damage. The majority of the rear passenger seatbelt was missing, 
When I dismantled the seat belt as the anchorage point, I discovered that about a meter, or 940 mm, was missing. It'd been cut. The detective also testified about additional damage inside Tony's car, such as cuts and scratches on the leather seats in the back. He discovered a significant amount of replaced foam in the back seat, as well as blood on the passenger seat and in the trunk. The autoglazer told the court that, on May 26, he was summoned to Tony's home to repair a broken BMW windshield. He found it strange that the windscreen had already been removed from the car and he discovered blood inside. When asked about the cause of the damage, Tony claimed it occurred while he was joking with friends. According to Tony, a friend slipped on the bonnet and crashed through the window. A sergeant from the serious crash unit testified that he thought Blessy was intentionally struck. He speculated that she was struck while walking on the pavement citing the discovery of a tire imprint on the verge near where her belongings were discovered. In the defense's case, Tony admitted to causing Blessy's death, but claimed it was unintentional and not planned. According to his defense, Tony claimed that he panicked after accidentally hitting Blessy and then inflicted the injuries on her body to make the incident appear random. He claimed that all injuries were inflicted post-mortem. During the trial, Tony fired his legal team and decided to defend himself. Tony told the court that he denied the prosecution's version of events and stated that he panicked following the accidental collision. He claimed that putting Blessy in his car and driving home was only to comply with his curfew. I put a strain on my car to meet my curfew of 8 p.m. and remained there until 6 a.m. Tony contended that the prosecution was incorrect and claimed premeditation, citing the lack of witnesses to the car accident. He explained his presence at the cemetery on May 24 and 25 by claiming he was attempting to purchase illegal substances, Tony argued that the DNA evidence was microscopic, making it difficult for scientists to isolate and test. The defense presented opposing views on Bless's injuries from another pathologist, Dr. Chapman, who disagreed with Dr. Wagner's findings. Dr. Chapman's report read in court suggested that Blessed's neck injuries, particularly the fractured thyroid, could have been caused by another blow to the area. The report stated that the bruising on Blessy's neck did not appear to be caused by her fingertips. Dr. Chapman's differing views, particularly on the likelihood of Blessing, inhaling her own blood, supported Tony's claim that he caused the stab wounds post-mortem to simulate a random attack. During his testimony, Tony stated that when he placed Blessy in his car, he assumed she was already dead. He claimed that he staged the scene to appear like a random attack because he was under the influence of methamphetamine at the time. Tony also denied the rape allegations, claiming that the DNA evidence found on Blessy's body, specifically his seminal fluid, was contaminated and caused by police malpractice. However, the jury rejected Tony's version of events and found him guilty of rape and murder. Tony was sentenced to life in prison, with a 24-year minimum non-parole period and preventive detention for the rape. In New Zealand, preventive detention is an open-ended detention, is an open-ended jail term that can be extended indefinitely or recalled at any time. Tony appealed the verdict, claiming that Blessy's death was an accident and that the jury should have been given the option of convicting him of manslaughter. The appeal was denied, and a subsequent Supreme Court attempt was also unsuccessful, as it was determined that Tony had not presented any evidence during the trial to suggest that a charge of manslaughter could be considered. He was denied further leave to appeal Tony's criminal history, which was revealed after his sentencing, providing a stark context for his actions. Tony was granted name suppression during the trial, which concealed his previous convictions for child sexual offenses. The details of his criminal history were kept from the jury. In 2005, when Tony was only 18, he committed a heinous crime. Tonga kidnapped and molested a five-year-old girl. Local officers suspected Tony's involvement and tracked him down with the girl, where they discovered the distressing scene with the child's pants down. Tony was convicted of seven charges, including indecent assault and attempting to abduct two other children. He was sentenced to eight years in prison for these offenses. Tony was released in December 2013, just five months before Blessy's tragic murder, and he violated his release conditions twice in a short period. As a result, he was deemed a danger, prompting an extended supervision order that required a decade of monitoring and a 24-hour GP's tracking system. The judge overseeing this case, Cleet Justice Edwin Wiley, expressed serious concerns about Tony's proclivity for violence. I'm satisfied that Mr. Robertson poses a significant risk. 
I believe he will commit indecency against a child under the age of 12 and abduct a child for sexual purposes. The evidence leads to the conclusion that he is impulsive and unable to control his anger and aggressions. Mr. Robertson has a preference for, and proclivity for, sexual offenses. He has expressed no remorse. Indeed, he still denies it. The tragic circumstances surrounding Tony's release from the monitoring order, as well as the subsequent violent attack on Blessy Goding Cack on Blessy Goding, caused her family great pain and anger. The fact that Tony, despite being monitored with a GPS anklet, was able to commit such a heinous crime exacerbated Blessy's family's grief, as they believed the system had failed them. A government report was conducted to look into how the police and corrections departments handled Tony's case. However, the report found no fault with their actions and concluded that Tony was solely responsible for the blessing. Despite the lack of blame placed on the authorities, the report made 27 recommendations to improve the management of high-risk offenders. Blessy's husband, Antonio, expressed disappointment and devastation with the inquiry's findings, claiming that corrections lacked the capacity to manage high-risk sex offenders and that, in his opinion, the offenders controlled the system. The Minister of Corrections stated that Tony had served his full eight-year prison sentence for the previous offense and had been denied parole several times due to his lack of remorse. Residents of Birkdale, Auckland, were not notified of his release into their community. In a statement released by New Zealand police, Antonio expressed his family's profound loss. Blessy is the light of our home, and without her, we would be lost in the dark. Right now, we're just trying to pretend everything is fine. But deep down, we are heartbroken. We've been robbed. She has left too soon. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On the evening of January 31, 2019, 21-year-old Libby Squire a philosophy student at the University of Hull in East Yorkshire in England, reluctantly joined her friends for a night out at home. She didn't want to disappoint her friends, even though she had an early morning lecture the next day. Libby stayed in shared housing near the university. Libby spoke with her boyfriend James Pye throughout the evening. The last text message he received from her was at 10.30 p.m. The following day, February 1, James Libby's friends and family tried but failed to reach her. They went to her house only to find that she wasn't there. Law enforcement interviewed Libby's friends and discovered that she had not been with them when they left the club that night. According to her friends, Libby was turned away from the Welly nightclub in Hall because security suspected she was intoxicated. To ensure her safety, her friends called a cab to take her back to her Wellesley Avenue home. Following the investigation, police conducted a search of the area, which resulted in the discovery of Libby's house keys in a neighbor's garden. Authorities collected CCTV footage from the area and interviewed numerous witnesses. They determined that Libby had arrived home in the cab, but when she exited, she walked down the street without entering her house. Based on CTV footage and witness statements, the police were pursuing a specific lead in Libby's disappearance, and they were confident they had identified the person responsible. Despite their knowledge of the individual involved, they had no idea where Libby was. Seven weeks after her disappearance, 26-year-old Powell Relawis discovered her body in the Humber estuary between Spurn Point and Grimsby and was later arrested. He was questioned a few days after Libby was reported missing, but was released. Powell, originally from Poland, lived in North Yorkshire with his wife and two young children and worked as a butcher for Caro Foods in Malt. He told police that he saw Libby crying in the street and offered to drive her home. He claimed to have dropped her off near some playing fields because she was ill. This was the last time he saw her. He told the cops I had nothing to hide. Just check the cameras. The police examined the surveillance footage and charged him with rape and murder. Powell pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. According to the prosecution, Libby arrived home that fateful night in a very vulnerable state. The weather was bitterly cold, and she found herself alone and intoxicated, having accidentally dropped her house keys in her neighbor's garden. The prosecutor emphasized to the court that Libby was most likely experiencing hypothermia and distress at the time. She was in tears after losing her house keys, and she kept falling to the ground while attempting to walk. Libby was confronted by several witnesses who saw her in distress that night. During the trial, jurors heard from several witnesses who saw or interacted with Libby after the cab dropped her off outside her home. 
The court was informed that a student named George Thompson saw Libby exit the cab and described how she fell flat on her face, remained on the ground for about 10 seconds, and struggled to walk, stumbling everywhere. Libby's neighboring students had a right, and Emma Hall Shaw encountered her after she exited the cab. They heard her crying and sobbing outside her house and invited her to come inside. However, Libby chose not to testify against Roland Jacobs, and Alan Jones revealed that they stopped their car on their way home from a darts match when they noticed Libby on the ground. They approached her, concerned about her well-being, and offered to help. Roland mentioned that Libby mumbled, making it difficult to understand her words. She once asked him to lie down with her, and when she asked for a hug, he refused, prompting her to use offensive language. Despite spending about 10 minutes attempting to help her, they felt powerless and eventually left. Lorna Allen described seeing Libby lying on the floor, crying and screaming near a bus stop just before midnight on January 31. Lorna described Libby as slurring her words, talking to herself and appearing very intoxicated. During the trial, the court was told that while Libby was wandering the streets in distress, Powell was driving around the area looking for an opportunity. The prosecution claimed that Powell saw Libby just after midnight. The jury was shown CTV footage obtained by the police, which showed Powell's silver Vauxhall Astra driving around in circular patterns at times. The prosecution claimed Powell was driving around that night looking for a victim to spy on and satisfy himself. The jury learned about Powell's history, which included several sexually motivated burglaries in the months preceding Libby's disappearance, during which he kept stolen items as trophies. When police arrested him for Libby's murder, they discovered underwear and intimate toys stolen from women. They discovered a bag in his car containing these items as well as photographs of young women. When questioned about the bag, Powell initially claimed ignorance before admitting that he had forgotten about it and had no idea where it came from or how long it had been there. According to court testimony, in the year leading up to Libby's disappearance, Powell exposed himself to women in public and peered through windows. The jury was told that a female student had a terrifying experience when she saw a man's face peering through her window while she was dressing. The man's face was only inches from the window, which terrified her. She recognized this individual as having power. Another woman said she saw Powell at her window, observing her during an intimate moment with her boyfriend. When her housemates returned later that night, they discovered a used contraceptive hanging on the front door, along with women's underwear in the letterbox. Another victim discovered an unwrapped contraceptive and a pair of women's underwear alongside her child's toy. During the trial, forensic scientist Nikolai Taylor testified that Powell's DNA and bodily fluids were found on the woman's underwear, she told the jury that this finding implied intimate contact with the underwear, possibly indicating that Powell had warned them. According to the prosecution's evidence, Libby entered Powell's car after midnight and was driven to the Oak Road playing fields. While CTV footage captured Libby getting into the car, no additional footage was available once she arrived at the playing fields. The prosecution claimed that Powell sexually assaulted Libby before either killing her or leaving her to die in the cold waters of the river hall. They believe that Libby's body then drifted out to sea from that location. To bolster their claim that Libby was sexually assaulted on the playing fields, the prosecution summoned Sam and offered him as a witness. Sam, who lives near the playing fields, testified that he heard a woman's desperate screams coming from the direction of the river. According to court documents, a man was later seen emerging from the darkness and fleeing the scene. The prosecution claimed that the woman screaming was Libby and the man running away was Power. Notably, Libby was not seen on any additional CTV footage after the playing fields. The prosecution also claimed that Powell had visible scratches on his face, which were inflicted by Libby while she fought for her life. The prosecution summarized their case, telling the jury that the evidence supported the conclusion that Libby was raped by a man whose sole motivation for coming into contact with her that night was to take her away from safety to a remote area well known to him and subject her to his uncontrollable sexual urges. The prosecution faces difficulties in ascertaining the exact cause of Libby's death, as emphasized during the trial. Dr. Matthew Lyle, the medical examiner, testified that the cause of Libby's death could not be determined conclusively. Her body had been submerged in water for nearly two months making it impossible to tell whether she was still alive or dead when she entered the water due to decomposition. Notably, an obvious bruise was found on the inside of her right thigh. Further examination revealed lacerations inside her upper lip, 
indicating blunt trauma. Small hemorrhages were discovered around her mouth, which the court was told could indicate squeezing or compression of the neck or mouth cover. However, it was also stated that these lacerations could have occurred in the water or in life near the time of death. Dr. Lyle stated that there could have been additional injuries to her body, but we can't see them. The court heard testimony about three potential causes of death for Libby, hypothermia, drowning, and asphyxia. In terms of hypothermia, doctor, Lysel explained to the court that in a community setting, death by hyperthermia can occur if an individual is inadequately clothed, their clothing becomes wet, or they consume alcohol. Toxicology tests revealed that Libby had 198 drinks per 100 and may have been ill of blood, exceeding the legal driving limit of 80 mugging. Dr. Lyle was unable to definitively attribute Libby's death to hypothermia, but he could not rule it out. Dr. Liesel stated that establishing drowning as a cause of death can be difficult, especially in cases where it is not witnessed firsthand. The classic signs of drowning include froth or foam coming from the mouth, well-expanded lungs that obscure the heart, and a crackly quality to the lungs. Dr. Lyle described Libby's lungs as having a slightly crackly feel, but not being wet or very expanded. Furthermore, no froth appeared from the mouth. As a result, Dr. Lyle could not definitively state that drowning was the cause of Libby's death. Certain findings emerged from an examination of Libby's injuries in light of the possibility of asphyxia as the cause of death. There was no evidence of bleeding in the brain or skull, and the facial bones, including the horseshoe-shaped bone behind the tongue, were still intact. Injuries such as abrasions on Libby's forehead, nose, and eyelids was determined to be consistent with post-mortem body movement and water. Dr. Liesel testified that there were no tiny pinpricks of bleeding in the eyes or inner surface of the lips, which could indicate physical interruptions such as asphyxiation or strangulation. However, their absence did not rule out asphyxiation because such indicators tend to fade quickly, particularly after death. In conclusion, hypothermia, drowning, and asphyxia were all considered possible causes of death, but the true cause remained unknown. Swabs from inside Libby's body also contained seminal fluid cells that matched Powell's DNA profile, according to the court. During the trial, the court heard testimony from individuals close to Powell, who provided potentially incriminating information. Powell's friends stated that Powell told him about offering a ride home to a girl at the bus stop who claimed to have made advances on him. Powell's colleague also testified that Powell offered to drive a girl home, but she began acting strangely and undressing in his car. Powell allegedly instructed her to leave. Another piece of evidence came from Paul's neighbor, who spoke on behalf of the prosecution. He claimed to have seen Powell cleaning the mouths of his car on the afternoon of February 1, describing it as unusual for such a cold day. Professor Charles Deacon provided expert testimony that night stating that Libby's ability to defend herself would have been limited. He explained to the jury that Libby's alcohol consumption would have caused numb hands and impaired coordination, making her unsteady on her feet and prone to fatigue. Furthermore, her judgment, balance, and ability to flee potential threats would have been severely hampered, leaving her vulnerable. During the closing arguments, the prosecutor urged the jury to consider Libby's state that night, intoxicated and cold visibly distressed and in need of assistance. Witnesses reported seeing her cry, lie on the ground, and shiver. The prosecutor asked the jury to consider what might have happened after Libby entered Powell's car. Was it plausible that, in her vulnerable state, she would willingly leave the warmth of the car to lie in the cold snow and engage in consensual activity with Powell? The prosecutor emphasized to the jury that we propose a nonsense proposition, which strengthened the case. The prosecutor reminded the jury of Powell's background, emphasizing that he was not a saint, but rather a person seeking to satisfy his own sexual desires. The defense argued that Powell encountered Libby that night, offered her a ride home, and engaged in consensual activity with her. They claimed he stopped at the playing fields because she was feeling ill. As he left, she was still alive. The defense raised the possibility that Libby committed suicide. Powell testified during the trial, According to his account, he offered Libby a ride home after seeing her crying on the street, out of compassion for her. Powell stated that he found her crying and shouting on Beverly Road's pavement and wanted to help her. He claimed that their sexual encounter was consensual, 
The jury was shown CTV footage of Libby and Powell walking along Beverly Road before driving to the Oak Road playing fields. Powell admitted to driving around that night, hoping to find a woman for her. He also confessed to stealing women's underwear and intimate toys, as well as spying on people through windows. Powell explained that he initially withheld this information because he was concerned it would cause problems in his marriage. According to Paul's testimony, Libby's behavior appeared unusual, and he suspected she had ingested something or had something put in her drink. When he offered her a ride home, she extended her hand, and they walked to the car. Powell noticed that she seemed more at ease inside the warm car. However, while driving, he claimed that Libby made gestures indicating her desire to vomit, prompting him to pull over near the Oak Road playing fields. Powell described how, when the car came to a stop, Libby attempted to exit but fell kneeling in the snow and cried. According to his testimony, when he drove away, Libby was walking on the sidewalk and he never saw her again. Powell returned home, took a bath, and then watched a movie, concerned for Libby's well-being. He returned to the playing fields to ensure she wasn't lying somewhere, but he discovered nothing. The court learned during the trial that Libby had previously struggled with mental illness. Lisa Squire, Libby's mother, read a statement in court detailing her daughter's history of mental health issues, including an eating disorder and depression. Lisa, on the other hand, stated that her daughter has been afraid of water since she was a child, avoiding swimming pools even on vacation, and is generally afraid of darkness. Lisa didn't believe her daughter would commit suicide. The court was shown excerpts from Libby's medical records that confirmed her depression and anxiety issues. It was also revealed that Libby had researched various methods of suicide and had considered suicide, including the possibility of throwing herself in a river. Even Powell's own legal team described his previous behavior as gross and terrifying. However, the defense claimed there was no evidence of a violent attack on Libby. Powell's attorney claimed that while Powell took advantage of Libby and engaged in deception, he did not commit rape or murder. The defense suggested that Libby could have committed suicide by falling into the river. In his closing statement, the attorney urged the jury to consider whether Powell's lies could have an innocent explanation, stating that even those who are not guilty may lie. He acknowledged that Powell should not have left Libby alone that night given her condition, but speculated that Powell may have lied about meeting her to protect his family. The attorney's closing argument sought to cast doubt on the prosecution's case, emphasizing the lack of conclusive evidence linking Powell to the alleged crimes. The jury was asked to deliberate, but they were unable to reach a unanimous conclusion. So Judge Mrs. Justice Lambert informed the jury of seven women and five men that she would accept a majority verdict of 10 to 2 or 11 to 1. They unanimously convicted Powell of rape and later found him guilty of murder by a majority of 11 to 1. Lisa Squire, Libby's mother, said there are no words to describe the agony of living without her. Not only have I lost my firstborn child, with whom I shared a special bond, but I've also lost the opportunity to be a grandmother to her children. Knowing that in Libby's final hour, she needed me, and I wasn't there for her will haunt me for the rest of my life. Because of what happened to Libby that night, I now exist in two worlds. Lee, there is one world in which I am a mother, wife, and employee, but there is also a dark and lonely one. In this world, I wish to die so that I could be with my girl one more time. Russ Libby's father also testified in court, expressing his difficulty viewing photos of his daughter after her death. During the sentencing, the judge addressed Powell, emphasizing how, leading up to Libby's murder, his criminal actions grew in audacity and confidence that he would not be apprehended. The judge noted Powell's blatant staring at women, even after they had noticed it. The judge was certain that Powell's intention was to hide Libby's body with the hope that it would be carried out to sea and never discovered. Powell received a minimum sentence of 27 years for murder and an additional 18 years for rape. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On Saturday, June 28, 2014, Erin Corwin, 19, informed her husband, Jonathan John Corwin, that she planned to hike some trails in Joshua Tree National Park. Her mother, Laura Evelyn, was due to visit the following week, and Erin expressed a desire to go on some walks together. Erin and John had been married for over a year and had known each other since fifth grade when they met in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. When Erin turned 16, 
John asked her parents and Bill for permission to date her, and they agreed. John appeared to be a good match for their daughter, with gentlemanly characteristics. The couple married in November 2012 and moved to California in September 2013. John lives at the 29 Palms Marine Base, where he served as a Marine. Two other young couples, Connor and Isley Malachi, live next door to John and Aaron, sharing a downstairs apartment with their son Brian. While Chris and Nicole Lee Lee lived next door with their daughter Liberty, Aaron and John had a difficult start to 2014 as Aaron miscarried. Seeking solace, she volunteered at the White Rock Horse Rescue Ranch where she cared for horses and made friends. Aaron discovered she was pregnant again in April 2014, which excited John on the morning of June 28. When Aaron left early, John expected her to return later in the day. However, as the day went on without her, he contacted her best friend to inquire about her whereabouts, but she had no idea. Concerned, John reported Aaron missing to the police on the morning of June 29, claiming she had left around 6 or 7 a.m. on June 28 to explore some trails. He mentioned that she had expressed love before leaving, and he returned to sleep after seeing her off. Aaron has not communicated since then. When John informed Aaron's parents about her disappearance, their first concern was that she might be lost in the vast desert. Without provisions, you will face harsh conditions. Military troops joined the search, conducting a massive operation across 300 rugged acres of desert. The San Bernardino Sheriff Search and Rescue Team worked with Nancy's agents to navigate the treacherous terrain, which included over 1,000 abandoned mines. Questions arose about John's decision to wait 24 hours before reporting Aaron missing. He then underwent a polygraph test, which he passed, allowing the police to rule him out as a suspect. Aaron's car was discovered 20 to 30 miles east of the military base, parked quite far from the Joshua Tree National Park entrance. Authorities were perplexed as to why Aaron did not park closer if she intended to explore the nearby trails. Notably, shoe prints were discovered leading from the driver's side of Aaron's vehicle to a location where investigators suspected another car had been parked. The question arose, had Aaron gotten into another vehicle? According to John's information, Aaron intended to go alone that day and had not mentioned meeting anyone else. Lor, Aaron's mother, contacted one of her best friends, Jessica, who revealed that Aaron had planned a special date at Joshua Tree National Park on June 28. Aaron was secretly having an extramarital affair, which shocked her. It seemed at odds with Aaron's apparent devotion to John, as she had written him love letters and poems. Jessica informed the authorities that Aaron intended to meet Chris Lee, a Marine living next to John, and that Aaron lived with his wife Nicole and their six-year-old daughter. When police approached Chris and asked about Aaron's whereabouts, he initially claimed he didn't know her well and that they had only exchanged brief greetings. Chris claims that on the day Aaron went missing, he was coyote hunting near Gold Crown Road and had no contact with her. The police then brought Chris to the station for further questioning. Following a series of questions, Chris admitted to having a close relationship with Aaron, acknowledging that they were romantically involved. However, he claimed that their physical interactions were limited to kissing and no sexual intercourse occurred. Despite his familiarity with Aaron, Chris insisted that he was unaware of her current location. Chris was released from police custody without being charged. The search for Aaron persisted. But, given the large number of mines in Joshua Tree National Park and its surroundings, Hope faded. Aaron's remains were discovered on August 16th, nearly two months after she disappeared. A caver alerted by a strong gasoline odor investigated one of the mines and discovered Aaron's body within. A tire, a homemade torch, and a bottle of Sprite sat beside her. The autopsy determined that Aaron's death was a homicide, with strangulation as the cause. She was choked to death with a homemade garret and her body was dropped 250 feet down the rows of the Peruman shaft while the garret remained around her neck. Police discovered a propane tank inside the mine, indicating an attempt to burn her body. Because of Aaron's advanced state of decomposition, it was impossible to say for certain whether she was pregnant. The garret found around Aaron's neck was made from two rebar handles and paracord. The autopsy revealed several skull fractures one of which happened shortly before or during her death. In addition, fractures to her left collarbone and left rib were discovered shortly before or during her death. The remaining skull fractures were caused post-mortem, 
most likely during the process of dragging or throwing her into the mine. DNA testing on the items discovered alongside Aaron's body in the shaft produced significant results. Chris's DNA was discovered on the shirt tied around the torch, and the Sprite bottle, which still had the lid on, contained both Chris's and Aaron's DNA. Chris was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. With the added circumstance of lying in wait, Chris pleaded not guilty to the charges following his arrest. The prosecution claimed that Aaron and Chris were having an affair, and when Aaron discovered she was pregnant, she confided in Chris. According to police, Chris, unwilling to jeopardize his relationship with his wife, considered a drastic solution to the problem, murder Aaron. The prosecution claimed that Chris meticulously claimed that Chris meticulously planned the murder over several weeks, researching effective methods for disposing of a body. He had a plan in place. He allegedly enticed Aaron to the desert and killed her with a garret he had brought with him. They claimed that the murder was premeditated. During Chris's arrest, officers discovered two spools of paracord and a blue climbing rope in his car. The paracord matched the cord around Aaron's neck. Aaron had told her friend Jessica that Chris was the baby's father and that she loved him more than John. She even expressed a desire to move to Alaska, Chris' hometown, to be with him. The court heard that their affair became public in April 2014, when their neighbor Islington saw them kissing. Nicole informed John, who confronted Chris, explicitly stating that he did not want to see him near Aaron again. During the trial, Islington testified for the prosecution, stating that Chris frequently discussed murder, mentioning it more than I can count. She remembered him talking about hiding a body in the desert corner. Ling's husband also testified that Chris had discussed murder with him. Just a few weeks before Aaron disappeared, Chris allegedly told Connor that if you put a body in a fire with tires, it will disintegrate and that they would be unable to find anything. Another Marine, Andrew Johnson, testified about his conversation with Chris in June 2014. Chris reportedly inquired about nearby chloride plants, specifically how a body could be destroyed using chemicals found there. Chris also inquired about the presence of security cameras in those locations. Andrew stated that he did not find the conversation unusual at the time because his experiences in Afghanistan had desensitized him, and he knew Chris felt the same way. The court learned that a propane tank and a tire were discovered inside the mine shaft, next to Aaron's body. The prosecution informed the court that Chris borrowed a propane tank from a horse ranch, and a fellow Marine discovered one in Chris's car on the morning of June 28. When questioned, Chris allegedly told the Marine he planned to blow up a mine shaft. The jury was presented with compelling evidence about the DNA found on the shirt and Sprite bottle, as well as incriminating Google searches like how to dispose of a body. The prosecution urges the jury to consider these elements and convict Chris, claiming that the evidence strongly points to him as the sole person responsible for Aaron's death. They urge the jury to investigate Chris's actions, including previous conversations, research, and the weapons he brought to determine whether the murder was premeditated. In a significant turn, Chris may have recognized the weight of the evidence against him and initially pleaded not guilty. He later recanted during the trial and admitted to Aaron's murder. However, he claimed that the action was impulsive rather than planned. This admission complicated the trial, forcing the jury to consider the degree of premeditation in Chris's actions leading up to Aaron's tragic death. The defense presented its case by admitting Chris was responsible for Aaron's death. In contrast to his previous denials, Chris now admits to having a sexual relationship with Aaron. The defense told the jury that Chris, wanting to save his marriage, but unwilling to let go of Aaron, planned to meet her on June 28 to discuss their situation. According to Chris, the original plan was for Aaron and others to go hunting, but when the others were unable to attend, the meeting became an opportunity for a private conversation. Chris claimed that on that day, he planned to blow up a mine shaft with tires. In preparation, he brought gasoline and diesel fuel to the desert, as well as a propane tank. He described how he threw these materials into his mind, realizing he had used up all of the gasoline for God to apply to apply to the torch. When he realized he couldn't carry out the plant explosion, he also discarded the torch in his mind. This according to Chris, these items were discovered inside the mine shaft. The defense called only one witness, Chris, who claimed that Aaron occasionally babysat his daughter. According to Chris, during their time in the desert together, Aaron discussed their future as a family and expressed a desire to care for his daughter. 
Chris described an incident in which his wife Nicole expressed concern for their daughter's well-being, implying that Aaron may be engaging in inappropriate behavior. In response to these concerns, Chris claimed that he confronted Aaron while they were in the desert and asked her directly, have you ever touched Liberty? Have you molested my daughter? According to Chris's testimony, Aaron's admission to touching his daughter elicited a strong emotional response. He described feeling an overwhelming surge of hatred and rage, as if someone had rammed a red-hot knife into his heart. During this intense emotional turmoil, Chris claimed to have picked up a garret from his car. I felt so much hatred and rage. I grabbed it, stood up and noticed she had turned around at some point. I couldn't think clearly. I just felt a lot of hatred, and I came up behind her, put it around her neck, and my training kicked in. Then I turned around and began pulling, but I couldn't pull hard enough because I was so angry. Chris went on to explain, I just continued choking her. I'm not sure how long it was. It could have been five minutes or ten minutes. It seemed like forever, and I just kept choking her. After Aaron stopped moving, Chris admitted to using the garret to drag her body to the mineshaft's edge and push her inside. The defense asks the jury to find him, not guilty of first, degree murder based on his claim that he did not intend to kill Aaron and only killed her in the heat of the moment. The prosecution strongly contested Chris's defense, claiming that it was a fabrication. The emphasis emphasizes that no one had previously expressed concern about Aaron's behavior. The alleged abuse was not reported to police, and Chris and his wife did not seek medical attention for their daughter as a result of the alleged abuse. The prosecution claimed that Chris made up this story during the trial in order to get a lesser charge of involuntary manslaughter with the expectation of a shorter prison sentence due to the overwhelming evidence against him. The prosecutor pointed out that Chris only admitted his involvement in front of the jury, implying a calculated move for attention. The prosecutor addressed Chris directly, saying, you chose to do it in front of the jury. It's about you. You sought attention. Ultimately, the jury did not believe Chris's defense. They quickly returned a guilty verdict for first-degree murder with a special circumstance. Chris was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole after a 15-minute trial. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On May 28, 2008, a seemingly ordinary Wednesday, Moira Jones' life took an unexpected and tragic turn. Moira, a vibrant 40-year-old woman, went out on the town that evening with her boyfriend of four years, Paul Thompson. Moira chose Glasgow, Scotland, and the United Kingdom as her home. Her flat overlooks a lovely park in Glasgow South. In 2003, she left her previous life in London to work as an executive at Britvic, Glasgow quickly captured her heart, and she formed strong bonds with the city and its residents. Moira's fondness for Glasgow stemmed from the residents' warmth and friendliness, as well as their infectious sense of humor. The city, with its abundance of outdoor opportunities, proved to be an ideal place for someone who cherished the open air, trails, hills, glens, and beaches of Moira, providing her with numerous opportunities to explore and enjoy her love of the outdoors. Moira had intended to stay at Paul's house that fateful evening. She arrived with an overnight bag ready for a shared night. However, their argument changed her mind. Determined to sleep in her own flat, determined to sleep in her own flat, she set out for home, not realizing it would be a journey she would never complete. On the morning of May 29, 2008, a grim discovery was made in Glasgow's Queen's Park. A park ranger discovered a lifeless woman's body concealed behind a privet hedge. The tragic scene was nothing short of terrifying. The woman lay face down in the bushes, her lower body exposed, wearing only a pair of socks. Her jacket and bra had been torn, and her trousers were discarded between her legs. Moira's name and personal information were discovered nearby, leading the police to her apartment. To their dismay, there was no sign of Moira at home. They were concerned that the lifeless body they discovered could be hers. The authorities took immediate action and contacted Moira's parents, Beatrice, Beatrice, Bea, and Hubert Hugh Jones, who lived in Weston, Staffordshire. The agonizing message they delivered was that they believed Moira's body had been discovered, but they couldn't be certain. They needed the bereaved parents to identify their daughter with heavy hearts and unfathomable grief. 
Beatrice Bia and Hubert Hugh Jones made the somber trip to Glasgow. Their worst fears were confirmed when they saw the lifeless body. It was Moira, their beloved daughter. The unimaginable had become a harsh and cruel reality. Moira not only died tragically, but she also suffered the most horrifying fate. She was raped and beaten to death. Moira's younger brother, Grant, who lives all the way in Perth, Australia, received heartbreaking news of his sister's tragic death. He boarded the next available flight back to the United Kingdom, driven by a desire to be with his family during this extremely difficult time. As the investigation into Moira Jones's murder continued, the police faced a perplexing challenge. They had positively identified Moira, but her assailant remained unknown, elusive and unidentified. DNA evidence found on the lawyer's body had definitively ruled out her boyfriend, Paul, as a suspect. Nonetheless, the DNA profile obtained from the crime scene did not match anyone in the United Kingdom's extensive database. In their search for answers, the police cast a wide net, investigating the activities of 22 registered sex offenders living in the area and conducting interviews. They also spoke with people who had committed crimes near the park and underage drinkers who were known to frequent the area. Unfortunately, none of these conversations resulted in significant progress in the case. However, the investigators were able to piece together a timeline of events and obtain crucial CTV footage showing a man in Moira's company. This unidentified man became the focus of the investigation and police were eager to find and question him. The investigation's turning point occurred during door-to-door, -door, to door inquiries. When the police spoke with a woman named Lucy Pechlova, her information would prove to be the key to unraveling the mystery surrounding Moira Jones' tragic death. Lucy's account to the police revealed the presence of a man named Marek Harkar, a six foot three inch, old former Slovakian soldier. Lucy and Marek previously worked together in Liverpool in 2007. Marek arrived in Glasgow on May 18, 2008. When he needed a place to stay, Lucy offered him her bed on Queen's Drive. Marek's visit to Lucy's house, however, was not productive. Although he was supposed to be job hunting, he instead drank heavily and watched explicit videos. Merrick left the bedside around 10 p.m. On May 28, allegedly drunk, and informed Lucy that he was going out to find a lady of easy virtue. Mark returned to the bedside around 3.15 a.m. According to Lucy, he looked different the next morning and appeared to be afraid of something. Surprisingly, Merrick left the bedside on June 1, abandoning all of his belongings without warning. Later investigations revealed that Mark flew to the Zischirk Republic and then traveled by bus to Slovakia. Lucy handed over Marek's possessions to the police, who conducted DNA testing and discovered a crucial link to the crime, marking a significant breakthrough in the case. A Marek's black leather jacket was discovered to contain traces of Morris blood, providing compelling evidence with significant implications for the ongoing investigation. Marek Harker's arrest and extradition to the United Kingdom marks a significant development in the Moiré Jones case. He faced a number of serious charges, including murder, rape, and robbery, and his trial began on March 12, 2009, in Glasgow. Throughout the proceedings, Merrick maintained a not guilty plea to all charges. The court heard that Marek arrived in the United Kingdom in 2007. Morris had been in Glasgow for only 10 days when he was tragically murdered. The prosecution's case centered on Merrick as the perpetrator. They presented a compelling story, alleging that on the night of May 28, Moira was on her way home from her boyfriend's house, but Marek had completely different plans. He had been drinking heavily, including beer and vodka, and was overheard saying he was going out to find a woman. Moira returned to her flat, where she had originally planned to spend the night, carrying a large black overnight bag and parking her car about 60 yards away near Queens Park, according to the prosecution. It was approximately 11.30 p.m., the prosecution claimed that at this point, Marek approached Moira and forced her to walk along a path with him. CTV footage obtained from a passing first bus captured two people crossing Langside Road and walking along the perimeter of Queens Park, providing crucial evidence. The jury noticed a stark difference in height and stature between the two figures in the footage. Moira, who stood only five feet, four inches tall and weighed less than nine stone, appeared much smaller than the man accompanying her. The prosecution claimed that the towering figure was Marek, who, at six feet three inches and a kickboxing enthusiast, had a significant physical advantage over Mara. 
The prosecution also outlined the written Marek, allegedly forced Moirado to accompany a witness who reported seeing a man and a woman near a holly bush near the tennis courts, where six buttons from the wire top and a cigarette buttock bearing Marek's DNA were found. Furthermore, CTV footage captured a man exiting the park near Queens Park Baptist Church on Balvicker Drive at 2.15a. The prosecution claimed that this individual was Merrick, who had been alone at the time. The prosecution's case painted a bleak and distressing picture of the events at Queens Park. According to their account, Mark Harker forced Moira into the park, assaulted her violently and sexually, and stole some of her belongings. The autopsy findings revealed the horrific extent of Moira's injuries and shed light on the harrowing attack she had to endure. Moira's autopsy results indicated that she did not die from her injuries before 2 a.m., implying that she may have survived her ordeal for about two and a half hours. Moira had sustained 65 distinct blunt force trauma injuries as a result of punches, kicks, and stomps, according to the examination. These injuries were the result of severe and sustained blunt force trauma. A forensic pathologist identified 65 external injuries, including a broken nose and two black eyes. Moira suffered brain damage, fractures to her right cheekbone and larynx, and bruised ribs. She had extensive bruising on her head and face, and one of her front teeth had been knocked out. Bruising spread to her chest, back legs, and buttocks. Dr. Black's compelling testimony, which revealed the tragic details surrounding Moira Jones' death, captivated the courtroom. Dr. Black, an expert witness, revealed that Moira's head and neck injuries were the primary factors contributing to her tragic death. In a chilling revelation, she suggested that small hemorrhages in Moira's eyes indicated a possible asphyxiation factor in her death. The presence of bruises on the backs of her hands and arms raised additional concerns, which Dr. Black described as common defensive injuries. Dr. Black's expert testimony also highlighted the distressing aspect of the case. There was no evidence of a weapon being used in the attack, Instead, she believed the injuries were caused by physical blows to the fists or feet. Moira speculated that the extensive bruising on her neck was caused by an arm, leg, or knee compressing more of his neck while she was on the ground. As Dr. Black described additional distressing findings, the courtroom atmosphere became increasingly somber. Moira's brain was bleeding between layers, and there was a moderate amount of blood in her windpipe, indicating the gruesome ordeal she had been through. It was later discovered that she had swallowed some of the blood during the attack. Dr. Black also revealed that Moira had consumed other items during the assault, including bark fragments, grassy fragments, plant cuticle fragments, and leaf skeleton fragments. The implications were chilling, implying that Moira had been forced to consume these items while alive. The final damning piece of evidence was the DNA discovery. A vaginal swab yielded a semen sample from the boy's body, and DNA found on more of his clothes and body matched Merrick's DNA, with the jury being told that there was a billion to one chance that it belonged to someone other than Merrick. The courtroom was packed with witnesses, each contributing their own piece to the chilling puzzle of Moira Jones' murder. Several residents near Queens Park reported hearing disturbing noises on the night of May 28. One woman who lives in a flat overlooking the park recalled a chilling incident in which a loud scream pierced the night only to be abruptly silenced. Other couples strolling through the park reported hearing Moira's obvious distress. Even a cab driver turned to his partner and said, if there was a murder, we just heard about it. It was a shocking revelation that, despite the busy street and the large number of people who heard a woman screaming and in distress, no one intervened or called the police, allowing the tragic events to unfold in silence. In addition, a neighbor who lived near the bedside where Merrick stayed provided compelling testimony. He described how Mara approached him on the night of May 28, frantically saying, I'm looking for a woman. In her closing statements, the prosecutor urged the jury to convict her based on the evidence presented. The prosecutor painted a chilling picture of the heinous murder witnessed by Moira Jones, pleading with the jury to base their decision on evidence, rather than the overwhelming emotional horror of the event. On the other side of the courtroom, the defense vehemently claimed that the police had charged the wrong man. They claimed that three other men were involved in the murder, despite Merrick's innocence, and that one of these men, Jason Mulrin, a convicted sex offender, was at Lucy's bedside during the crime. They pointed out similarities between his previous criminal acts and Moira's attack, emphasizing his lack of an alibi on the night Moira was killed. 
The defense also claimed that Jason confessed to the murder to his ex-girlfriend, who became so concerned that she reported it to the police. However, when Jason testified in court, he categorically denied any involvement in Moira's rape or death, contradicting the defense's allegations. The defense urged the jury to find Marek not guilty and to consider the possibility that another man was responsible for the murder. They also emphasized the importance of skepticism when evaluating the prosecution's DNA evidence, reminding the jury that scientists can only provide probabilities and that DNA should be viewed as one piece of evidence among many. Marek Harkar's fate now lay in the hands of the jury, which had the difficult task of determining the truth in this complex and chilling case. The trial lasted 20 days and kept the courtroom in suspense. However, the jury delivered its verdict quickly, finding Marek guilty of all charges in less than two hours. The judge imposed a harsh sentence, sentencing Marek to life in prison with a minimum of 25 years. In the aftermath of Moira's tragic murder, her family turned their grief into a noble cause. They founded the Moira Fund, a charity that helps families in the United Kingdom who have been bereaved by murder. The charity provides grants to cover a variety of expenses, including funeral costs and transportation to court, assisting those in need during their darkest hours. Moira's memory continues to provide comfort and support to others who have experienced similar tragedies. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On a fateful November morning, a chilling and mysterious crime took place in the quiet suburbs. An apartment complex was on fire, and a 911 call would set off a terrifying chain of events. Today was a tragic day. Nobody suspected that this fire was anything more than an unfortunate accident. It concealed a sinister story of murder, betrayal, and meticulously planned cruelty. The tragic events of November 28, 2014, in Fort Worth, Texas, provide a chilling picture of a heinous crime. Ashley Ann Harris, a 31-year-old apartment complex resident, was the target of a brutal and deliberate attack. The sequence of events on that fateful day raised disturbing questions about the motivation behind this heinous act. The incident began with a 911 call from a concerned resident of the same apartment complex. They reported a fire in one of the units, which prompted emergency personnel to rush to the scene. They had no idea that this would escalate into a murder investigation. Ashley and Harris were the tenants of the apartment that caught fire. At first, no one could tell whether Ashley was inside the burning apartment or not. Firefighters bravely battled the blade and eventually brought it under control. Only after the fire was extinguished did the horrifying truth become apparent. Ashley Harris had been inside her apartment the entire time, and her body led police to believe that the fire was not an accident. Ashley's lifeless body was covered in a pool of blood, indicating that she had been brutally beaten. Her hands and ankles were bound with duct tape, leaving her defenseless. The signs of violence did not end there. Her body was covered in burn marks, and she had gone through the agony of strangulation. To make matters even worse, there were knife wounds in the throat. As investigators dug deeper into the case, it became clear that this was no ordinary tragic accident or random act of violence. It was a meticulously planned and horrifically carried out murder. The evidence indicated that someone intentionally set fire to the apartment after committing this heinous crime. The perpetrator had poured rubbing alcohol throughout Ashley's apartment, including her bed, in an attempt to erase any evidence of their actions. The fire, however, had failed to conceal the gruesome truth. One perplexing aspect of this case was the apparent lack of any motivation. Ashley's keys were the only thing missing from her apartment, leaving investigators perplexed. What could motivate someone to commit such a heinous and merciless attack on an innocent woman? The investigation into Ashley and Harrison murders would undoubtedly be difficult and heartbreaking, as law enforcement sought answers, justice, and closure for her bereaved family members. The police went on a search for answers. Their journey started with interviews with Ashley's neighbors. Among them was Stephen Lee, a man who lived in the next apartment. He described a peculiar sighting at around 6.30 a.m. The fateful morning, while having a cigarette on his balcony, he noticed an unfamiliar car parked nearby. The vehicle in question was a sleek black Infiniti Gay 35, a rarity in their quiet neighborhood. 
This observation would prove to be a critical clue in the ongoing mystery. However, Stephen Lee's account was not the only piece of the puzzle. Another neighbor, Patrick Sweet, lived directly below Ashley's apartment. He made a chilling revelation to the police. At around 7.30 a.m., Patrick was startled out of his morning routine by a blood-curdling scream from above. Alarmed and disturbed, he heard a series of unsettling noises, including what appeared to be a heavy thud and frantic gasping breaths. Fear gripped him, but the blaring alarm of his carbon monoxide detector jolted him into action. He realized there was a fire going on, so he called 911 right away to solve the mystery surrounding Ashley's death. The police meticulously tracked her movements on the day in question. Ashley worked as an assistant manager at an American Eagle store inside the Hulan Mall. Their investigation revealed that on Thanksgiving Day, she dined with her close friend Alexis Torres and a group of acquaintances in one of their complex's apartments. Ashley left for work after finishing his meal. The Black Friday sales frenzy made for a long and demanding night. During Ashley's work shift, Alexis graciously took on the responsibility of caring for his beloved dog, Nala Ashley. Ashley returned home in the early hours of the morning. Around 3.15 a.m., Alexis paid a brief visit before leaving after 4 a.m. It was at this point that the timeline became crucial to the investigation. Ashley's untimely death was believed to have occurred between 4.15 a.m and 7.30 a.m. Given the urgency of the situation, authorities were eager to find and speak with the owner of the mysterious Black Infinity D-35. I hope to shed light on what occurred during those fateful hours. The search for answers had only just begun, and the peace of the small towns was at stake. When the police learned about the Black Infinity D-35, they decided to question Alexis Ashley's friend, who claimed she didn't know who owned the vehicle. However, a tip from Ashley's boss, Christopher Chris Gravy, piqued their curiosity. He told the cops he knew someone who drove such a car, a woman named Carter Carol Carol Cervantes. Carter had previously worked at the same American Eagle store as Ashley, but was let go in August. With this lead in hand, the police began surveillance on Carter's home. Their patience paid off the following Saturday at 8 a.m. When they saw Carter leave her apartment and get into her Infinite 35, accompanied by a man, the man then drove her to Hewlin Mall, where he dropped her off at the entrance before parking. The police approached him for questioning and discovered that he was Clarence David Mallory Carter's boyfriend and a former employee of the same American Eagle store. Clarence was arrested after failing to produce his driver's license upon request. Officers at the police station noticed unusual details about him. He was wearing a brand new ski mask with no visible wear and the plastic price tag fastener was still attached. Furthermore, there appeared to be a recent injury to his lower lip, which was visibly swollen. Despite their arrest, Clarence and Carter were not found inside the mall. Despite being seen entering, she was later located at her apartment complex, where she appeared to be doing laundry. Taken in for questioning, she initially claimed not to have left the apartment complex that day. Surveillance footage, however, contradicted her statement by clearly showing her leaving the mall and heading home. The police suspected that she had seen them talking to Clarence in the mall parking lot and then decided to walk the two miles home. Notably, they found superficial scratches on her arms. As the pieces of this puzzling story fell into place, the police faced the daunting task of determining whether Carter and Clarence were involved in Ashley's tragic death. And if so, determining the motive for the tragic events that had occurred the ongoing investigation into Ashley's tragic death took a chilling turn as new evidence surfaced, painting a disturbing picture of the events leading up to the crime. The discovery of Ashley's missing keys was a watershed moment in the investigation as it was revealed that these keys also provided access to the American Eagle store where she worked. This revelation led the police to believe that Carter and Clarence had planned to kill Ashley because they knew her keys could open the store's safe. Their sinister plan appeared to involve stealing tens or thousands of dollars, most likely from Black Friday sales. On a fateful Saturday morning, they carried out their plan with Ashley's keys. However, when they arrived at the store, they discovered an unexpected obstacle. The locks had already been changed. The wording of the robbery attempt, as well as the search of Carter and Clarence's apartment turned up additional incriminating evidence. They discovered a plastic tub filled with bungee cords and a rope. A kitchen drawer contained a lock, a TAS air box, and discarded duct tape strands. They also discovered a damaged deadbolt lock on other locks, which appeared to have been used for practice. 
Each is labeled as a lock-picking practice lock with the Black Infinity D-35. A vehicle central to the investigation also harbored sinister secrets. Inside the car, police discovered a plastic bag hidden within a black trash bag, as well as a sharpening stone, most likely used for a knife, a 9mm cartridge, a cell phone, a walkie, talkie, and a buck knife with a sheath. Notably, they discovered a toboggan with a hole cut in it, an unopened tarp, and a kitchen knife. Perhaps most concerning was the discovery of a loaded Glock 19 with a bullet in the chamber concealed beneath the driver's seat. These compelling pieces of evidence painted a troubling picture of Carter and Clearance's roles in Ashley's murder. Both individuals were charged with capital murder, and the state chose not to pursue the death penalty, instead seeking life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for both defendants. Despite the overwhelming evidence against them, Carter and Clarence maintained their pleas of not guilty, setting the stage for a tense legal battle that would determine their fate. The legal proceedings in the cases of Carter Cervantes and David Mallory were conducted separately, but the prosecution presented a largely consistent narrative for each defendant. However, since Carter's case was heard first, the emphasis was on establishing her as the alleged mastermind behind the crime. In the eyes of the prosecution, Carter and Clarence had multiple reasons for wanting to harm Ashley. For starters, they assumed the pair wanted Ashley's keys, which would grant them access to the store safe and the large sum of money they assumed was inside, especially after the lucrative Black Friday sales. Furthermore, the prosecution claimed that Carter and Clarence sought vengeance on Ashley. They blamed her for their job terminations, adding to the personal animosity in the situation. The court proceedings delved into the backgrounds of the parties involved. In June 2014, Ashley had been appointed to manage the store temporarily while Chris was on medical leave. Her supervisor, Carter, and the store's assistant manager had all played important roles in the operation. Significantly, she had also hired her boyfriend to work with her at the same establishment. On August 24, 2014, a sum of $18,000 mysteriously vanished from the safe at the American Eagle store. Carter became suspicious when Ashley, who was in charge of locking up the store that night, discovered that the back door had been left unlocked. Clarence was identified as the person who accessed the safe and stole the money, according to surveillance footage. This discovery sparked a series of events that would eventually lead to a tragic outcome. Chris Ashley's supervisor found out after the theft that Carter had hired Clarence. Surprisingly, Clarence had previous experience with the American Eagle brand, having worked at an Amarillo location. However, his record in the American Eagle system was marked as non-rehirable, indicating that he should not be employed at any of the brand's locations. Chris made a startling discovery. Carter had manipulated the clearance personnel file by changing his social security number and name in the system to avoid detection and red flags. This revelation indicated a disturbing level of collusion between Carter and Clarence. As tensions rose, it became clear that Carter and Clarence had planned to kidnap Ashley and take her keys. Their cell phones held incriminating evidence, including photos of Ashley's apartment, apartment door, and vehicle. Furthermore, police found latitude and longitude coordinates on their cell phones. Detective Sedillo's testimony added to the chilling story. He revealed that one of the clearance text messages contained coordinates that, when entered into Google Earth, led to a location near Looters, Texas. Detective Sedillo made a chilling discovery at this location a six-foot-long, two-and-a-half-foot-wide, three-foot-deep hole. The prosecution claimed that the initial plan was to kidnap Ashley, threaten her with a pistol, and then kill her in a different location. However, their intentions changed when Ashley refused to allow them into her apartment, resulting in her tragic death on the premises. More unsettling evidence emerged. When police searched clearances in Cadillac, they discovered two shovels, a box of plastic sheeting, and a box of craftsman sockets, indicating a sinister and premeditated intent. These revelations painted a disturbing picture of a well-planned crime, with Carter and Clarence allegedly motivated by both financial gain and vengeance. The prosecution called witnesses to shed more light on the tragic events leading up to Ashley's death. One such witness was Jeff Kaiser, Ashley's close neighbor and friend, Jeff described the terrifying morning when he was jolted awake by the blaring sound of fire alarms. When he realized Ashley's apartment was in danger and saw her car still parked outside, he sprang into action. 
He rushed upstairs without hesitation and bravely kicked down Ashley's apartment door. When Jeff entered, he was met with a scene of chaos. The apartment was filled with smoke and water poured from the sprinkler system, creating a dangerous and disorienting environment. Despite the perilous conditions, Jeff attempted to crawl toward the kitchen to reach Ashley. However, the thick smoke quickly overwhelmed him, forcing him to retreat for some fresh air. Undeterred, he made two more valiant attempts, but the smoke was too dense to navigate. Fortunately, firefighters had arrived on the scene to take over the rescue efforts, and an arson investigator provided crucial information about the cause of the fire. He testified that he identified several points of origin for the fire, including the bed, Ashley's body, and the closet. A particularly disturbing discovery was that the smoke detector had been purposefully removed and was hidden beneath the mattress. These findings suggested a sinister and deliberate act aimed at concealing the fire and complicating Ashley's chances of survival. The courtroom drama continues with a string of compelling events and testimonies. The prosecution presented surveillance footage from the front of the American Eagle store, which showed a mysterious figure attempting to manipulate the gate lock around 2 a.m. On November 29, the person's face was concealed, but the prosecution claimed it was Carter. It was clear they were attempting to unlock and raise the gate, but their efforts were futile because the locks had been changed. This suggested that Carter's intentions were related to the store or the crime. The court heard that Carter and Clarence returned to the mall at 8 a.m. On the same day, they were unknowingly under police surveillance. This raised questions about their actions and intentions, especially given their previous unsuccessful attempt to enter the store. Clarence was arrested in the mall's parking lot and during his interaction with police. He claimed Carter had entered the mall to get some documents. However, when the police searched the mall, Carter was nowhere to be found. She was eventually found at her apartment complex, raising questions about her whereabouts and movements. Dr. Richard Fries, a deputy medical examiner with the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office, provided crucial information about Ashley's injuries. The autopsy revealed a harrowing picture of her physical injuries. Ashley suffered numerous injuries, including lacerations to her scalp, cheeks, and the left side of her face. Her right side was marked by a patterned bruise, and there were other bruises between her eyes and around her left eye. She had scrapes and laceration marks on her lip, as well as a chin scrape. Perhaps most disturbingly, there was a star-shaped laceration with a bruise behind her left ear, which the medical examiner determined was caused by a pistol blow. The testimony painted a bleak picture of Ashley's ordeal, implying that she had been brutally beaten. Ashley sustained several injuries, including a knife wound to her neck, as well as bruises and abrasions on her neck, chest, and right arm. Dr. Fries, a witness in the case, testified that Ashley's facial injuries were caused by multiple blows. He also mentioned the presence of Paddock A and Ashley as eyes implying asphyxia or strangulation. He concluded that Ashley died from asphyxiation and blunt force trauma to the head and neck, ruling her death a homicide. The courtroom drama surrounding Carter's trial was both captivating and heartbreaking. Her defense strategy was based on the claim that she had no role in Ashley's tragic death. In a courageous move, she took the stand to testify in her own defense, revealing the layers of fear and manipulation that had shrouded her life. Carter's testimony painted a disturbing picture of her relationship with Clarence, describing him as controlling and menacing. She revealed that he had chilling control over her daily life, even dictating when she could eat and drink. The courtroom hung on her every word as she admitted to attempting to rob the American Eagle store, but she insisted that the crime was coerced by clearances and menacing threats. She described a terrifying moment in which he brandished a gun and ordered her to commit the theft, to add to her anguish. He claimed that there was a lurking danger outside her parents' house, threatening their lives if she refused to steal the money. Carter's story became darker when she described a horrific incident in which she claimed to have been raped by two unknown men. Clarence, she claimed, allowed these assailants into her apartment and she was subjected to unspeakable brutality. Carter maintained her innocence on the night Ashley was murdered. She testified that she was in her bed, sound asleep, and had no knowledge of Clarence's whereabouts at the time. She vehemently denied any involvement in Ashley's death and insisted that she had no role in the tragic event. Despite Carter's compelling testimony, the jury remained skeptical in a remarkably swift decision. They arrived at a guilty verdict after only two hours. Carter was sentenced to life without parole. The case did not end there. 
Clarence will appear in court, maintaining his innocence in Ashley's murder. His claims, however, were met with similar silence. The jury, clearly unconvinced by his claims, found him guilty as charged. Like Carter, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Where is the line that cannot be crossed again? How does an ordinary woman go from being a loving wife and mother to a cruel murderer capable of dividing a country into two opposing groups? And how did her name become a hot topic among locals and make newspaper headlines for years? Roxana Valdez could respond to this question. Murderers do not stand out in a crowd, are unrecognizable at dinner, and may even live under the same roof without revealing their true identity. They are indistinguishable from those who have never crossed the line. Thus, no one could have predicted what Roxana did on the spring evening of April 5, 2014. And when they found out, they couldn't believe it. But let us start at the beginning. Roxanne died, and little is known about her. Despite the efforts of numerous Chilean reporters who competed to tell her story, they were unable to find much information about her. Her criminal record provided little information beyond the fact that she was born in 1957 in a small village in Chile's Punta Arenas province. That was it. Perhaps the lack of information was due to journalistic ethics, as the locals, known for their fiery tempers and unique customs, may have retaliated against Roxana and his relatives for her crime, potentially turning their lives into a living hell. Valdez married a man whose name, for unknown reasons, is either unknown to the press or not disclosed. She had a son with him, but it's clear that her marriage was not the dream every girl hopes for as the couple split up in 2011. As a single mother in a small village with few jobs, Roxana faced significant challenges. In such communities, the primary occupation was growing and selling fruits and vegetables, and even local educational institutions emphasized agriculture Roxana found work at the Don Gregorio boarding school, where students were trained to become agricultural technicians. She worked as a night supervisor at the school, ensuring that students slept and did not engage in disruptive activities. Her responsibilities did not include the actual care of the children. Roxana's son also attended this boarding school because she worked in the fields during the day and was unable to give him the attention he required. Claudio Munoz Ramirez, who worked at the same boarding school as Roxana, was the head of grounds maintenance. His duties often required him to work at night, which is how he met Roxana. Despite being 14 years younger than her, they had a lot to talk about. Roxana would spend entire nights discussing school issues and her own failed marriage to Claudio. They also shared similar experiences in their personal lives. Claudio had two daughters that he adored, but he felt disconnected from their mother and considered divorce several times. However, he stayed in the marriage because of a promise he made to her late father. Claudio appears to have forgotten his promise and began spending his free time with Roxana, away from his family. Finally, he made a decisive move. He did not explain himself to his wife. Claudio gathered his belongings and left the house. He clearly went to Roxana, who gladly accepted him into her life. Their relationship developed quickly and effectively. Roxana invited a man she barely knew into her home, with whom she had only shared nighttime conversations. She seemed to overlook the fact that there were children nearby who required constant attention amid these enjoyable and heartfelt conversations. Roxana failed to notice his true personality. He was actually quite temperamental and sometimes even cruel. However, it was probably too early to say who was more cruel of the two. Claudio's first serious outburst of aggression occurred inside the boarding school. On a scheduled community cleanup day, students were given different areas to clean up. Brooms, buckets, dustpans, and rags were distributed to ensure a thorough cleaning. As is often the case, some students protested and refused to protest it and refused to participate. Claudio, who was in charge of cleanliness but had no teaching experience, became enraged by these students and threatened to beat anyone who refused to participate in the absence of teachers at night. It is unclear whether he would have carried out this threat, but the students eventually began cleaning and later complained to the principal about Claudio's threats of physical violence. The principal was displeased and requested Claudio's voluntary resignation. 
It's worth noting that the Don Gregorio boarding school was practically the only place in the area that provided stable and reasonably paid employment. Claudio spent some time looking for work, fields, and fruit, but it became clear that his efforts had been in vain. He and Roxana decided to seek a better life elsewhere, leaving her son at the boarding school to complete his education. They thought it was too risky to go on this adventure with him. To avoid relying on employers after being burned once, the couple decided to start their own small business, a fruit kiosk, and relocated to a favorable location, the Commune of Molina, a few hours' drive from Chile's capital. This region is well known for its vineyards, which produce renowned wine brands that are exported around the world. Roxana and Claudio bought a kiosk near their new home, found suppliers for vegetables and fruits, and began their small family business. Claudio oversaw the purchase and transportation of products from suppliers to the kiosk. While Roxana was in charge of sales throughout the day, hiring an employee was not feasible due to the additional costs. Furthermore, they feared that an employee would fail to closely monitor the perishable goods, resulting in additional losses. Claudia was visibly upset and even angry when he learned that Roxana was expecting their first child together. Perhaps it was a moment for serious thought. But Roxana, perhaps blinded by her new relationship and their thriving business, did not oppose her husband's viewpoint. She agreed that once the child was born, they would quickly turn it over to her relatives for upbringing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there was no child to give away. Cloudy's behavior has dramatically changed since then. He frequently yelled at his wife and occasionally resorted to physical violence. Neighbors from nearby houses, irritated by their noisy new neighbors, frequently called the Chilean police, the Carabineros to intervene and settle domestic disputes. When the Carib and Arrows arrived in response to a call, they saw Roxana in tears and nearly half-naked running out of the house, followed by Claudio. Roxana confessed to the officers that she had been the victim of systematic domestic violence, which had resulted in a miscarriage. She even required psychological assistance following the incident. However, as time passed, the grievances faded and the troubled couple resumed their normal lives together. Following the incident, Claudio should have faced criminal charges, but a compassionate Roxana decided to give him another chance after obtaining a promise that it would be a one-time occurrence. Claudio promised never to repeat such behavior. His previous actions with his ex-wife, however, suggested that his words may not be taken seriously. Unfortunately, history repeats itself. Claudio temporarily stopped physically abusing Roxana, but he developed the habit of leaving the house at night to binge drink in local bars. He spent a significant portion of their family budget not only on alcohol but also on local women of questionable character. Roxana tolerated her husband's behavior, believing that Claudio would calm down once they had a child together. In a sense, she was correct. After Roxana gave birth to a healthy child in 2013, Claudio stopped carousing and fully immersed himself in their business, which needed to expand. They purchased another kiosk in the surrounding area, as well as a vehicle for product transportation. Roxana also invested in firearms for protection because they lived and worked in dangerous areas. The family's wealth rose dramatically, but only on paper. Claudio reverted to his old ways, squandering money on drinking and committing domestic violence against Roxana. In her testimony, Roxanne described the escalating abuse in her relationship with Claudio. Claudia's drinking was infrequent at first, but it quickly became more frequent. He would return home and accuse Roxana of imagined infidelities, resulting in physical and sexual abuse. Despite her pregnancy, Claudia's actions appeared deliberate, culminating in a miscarriage in August 2012 that sent Roxana into a deep depression. Claudio went out to a local bar one night and did not return home until the following morning, as is his usual routine. Roxana was used to his behavior but still worried about him. Claudio had stolen 5 million Chilean pesos, approximately $6,000, from Roxana's sale of her mother's house to spend on alcohol and brothels. This betrayal shocked Roxana because the money was for their joint business and was hidden in their daughter's room. Claudio eventually returned home late that evening. Roxana confronted him over the missing money. Claudio, uninterested in discussing the matter, hit her and admitted to squandering all of the money. This was the final straw for Roxana. Without saying anything, she went into their bedroom, retrieved a revolver meant for protection against local criminals, and shot Claudio in the chest. He died instantly, stunned by her drastic action. Roxana, equally shocked by her own actions, 
attempted to stop the bleeding from the fatal gunshot wound, but it was too late. The close, range shot with a .38 caliber bullet was fatal. Roxanne's desperate act was a tragic culmination of ongoing domestic turmoil. Roxanne's testimony reveals her deep regret and awareness of the immorality of her actions. She admits that when she reached for the revolver, her intention was not to intimidate Claudio, but to kill him. She recalls Claudio abusing and assaulting her numerous times, as well as her failure to report him to authorities or retract her complaint due to fear. She dreaded being alone even before they had a child together. After shooting Claudio, Roxana's immediate concern was the potential impact on their daughter, particularly if Roxana was imprisoned and the child was placed in an institution. That night, Roxana determined that the best way to handle the situation was to dispose of the body and report Claudio missing. He was aware that the police knew about his frequent disappearances during drinking binges. Disposing of the body was a difficult task for Roxana, a delicate woman who decided to remove it piece by piece. She began by severing the limbs and head with kitchen knives designed for cutting meat. This process required five knives because they kept doubling. Then she boiled the dismembered parts in the largest pots she had, all while playing with her young daughter, who was completely unaware of her mother's actions and her father's fate. Roxanne's calculated approach to disposing of the body while maintaining a sense of normalcy for her daughter exemplifies the complexities and desperation of her situation. The day following cooking and cooling of the body parts, Roxana organized them into plastic containers by hand, leg, head, and torso. The containers were then placed in garbage bags. She loaded the bags into her car and drove to St. Lucia, where she scattered them on a vacant lot. Before leaving, she thoroughly cleaned her home with bleach. Despite finding a suitable location, she lacked the courage to dispose of the bags from her car once she arrived in St. Lucia. Roxana's testimony revealed her internal conflict. It's strange that I had the courage to commit such a heinous crime and dismember a human body like it was a piglet, but I couldn't bring myself to get rid of the evidence. I was nervous the entire drive, fearing that police would stop and search my car at any turn. This fear caused panic, despite the fact that I had a backup plan in place, which involved my daughter pretending to rush her to the hospital if she was stopped. I even considered pinching her to make her cry more loudly. Unable to discard the remains, Roxana returned home with them and hid the bags in the garage. She cleaned the interior of her car with bleach again and went to see Claudia's relatives, claiming that he had stolen a large sum of money and hadn't been home in days. They simply shrugged in response. She then went to see her mother and brother. Her mother was extremely concerned about Roxanne's behavior. She was not eating, had a glassy-eyed expression, and kept asking the same questions. The only question she promptly answered was about Claudio's absence, stating that he had gone to buy goods for their store, but was delayed due to a flat tire. Returning home, alone with her thoughts and the hidden evidence, Roxana broke down and called her brother for assistance. When he arrived, she confessed all and showed him the containers. Her brother was understandably shocked. Roxana called her brother to vent and share the nightmare years she had with Claudio, but most importantly, she needed his assistance in disposing of the containers containing the body. However, her brother refused, fearing police involvement and being charged as an accomplice. He urged her to confess to the Caribou Narrows, with Chilean police insisting he would do it if she refused. She was disappointed but realized she had no other option. Roxana complied. That night, Roxana went to the 4th police station and announced her intention to make a significant statement. Officers who knew her assumed she wanted to report her troublesome husband. However, they were taken aback by her confession. Roxana was immediately arrested. The news quickly spread throughout the area, attracting a large number of journalists to the station. They waited eagerly to photograph Roxana as she lay down, hoping to capture a few images, and if they were lucky, ask her some questions in front of the officers. As the journalists waited, Roxana was eventually brought out handcuffed and in distress, she stated, I'm afraid he'll kill me one day before being led into a police car. The case appeared straightforward. Roxana had confessed, provided evidence, and voluntarily surrendered. However, Prosecutor Monica Balesteros requested a more thorough investigation. She was skeptical of Roxanne's easy confession and requested an extended arrest to conduct a forensic examination. Balesteros wants to prove that Claudio was still alive during the dismemberment, 
which would significantly increase Roxana's sentence. The judge authorized a 60-day detention for further investigation. Meanwhile, Roxanne's attorney, Carolina Gutierrez, claimed that Roxana acted out of extreme emotional distress, which was likely exacerbated by postpartum depression and chronic domestic abuse. She highlighted Roxanne's cooperation and voluntary confession as mitigating factors. However, the prosecution's theory that Claudio was alive during dismemberment crumbled when forensic results revealed that Claudio died from a gunshot wound to the chest. The bullet from the .38 caliber revolver ruptured the heart and damaged vital organs, disproving the prosecution's initial hypothesis. Given the developments, the aggravating circumstances were dismissed. Another lawyer, Juan Pablo Cardenas, who sought to make a name for himself in this high-profile case, stated that the firearm used in the murder was legally registered. He also mentioned that Roxanne's first report of domestic violence to the police was filed only 20 days after the couple began living together. Following a medical examination, psychologist Rodrigo Valenzuela presented documents to the court indicating that Roxana was severely mentally unstable at the time of the crime. This meant she wasn't fully aware of her actions, and her emotional instability was linked to the deaths of two children, one in August 2012 and the other only three weeks before the crime. Furthermore, a forensic examination requested by the prosecutor revealed that Claudio had a high blood alcohol level of 3 grams per liter at the time of his death on April 17, 2015. Following a year of various examinations, investigations, and evidence gathering, Roxanne's trial began. The media frequently sensationalizes tragedies and dubbed the case the Molina Cooks case, alluding to Roxanne's dismemberment and boiling of her former husband. Some unscrupulous journalists seeking to draw attention to their publications, even made up stories that Roxana had eaten a portion of the remains, despite the fact that this was purely a product of their imaginations. Roxana refused to make any statements during the trial, citing her awareness of the media portrayal and her deep distress over it. The prosecutors attempted to persuade the judge that Roxana committed a serious crime under Chilean law and patricide standards. However, they were unable to prove that the murder was premeditated, the defense attorney argued that his client acted in self-defense, protecting herself from a brute who had brutally mistreated her for years. The court hearing lasted several weeks, and the entire Chilean population followed the case closely. Prosecutor Monica sought a 15-year prison sentence for the accused. However, after carefully listening to the defense and the jury's opinions, the judge sentenced Roxana to six years in a lenient correctional facility. Claudia's relatives, who had already protested when they heard the prosecutor's request for only 15 years, were utterly disappointed by the final court decision. They attempted to deny any family violence and claimed that Claudio, as a businessman and financially independent, could not have stolen $6,000 from Roxana. They also claimed that Claudio had admitted to them that Roxana frequently took out the revolver from the closet and told her husband that she would kill him someday. In an interview with the press, Claudio's sister attempted to blame Chile as a state, claiming that there is no justice and that the judicial system is completely corrupt. Given that such brutal criminals receive such short sentences, equivalent to minor robberies, even Gazelle Claudio, his first wife, defended her ex-husband, assuring everyone that there could not have been any violence on Claudio's part. She had lived with him for years, and he had never dared to touch her. Meanwhile, Roxana frequently instigates arguments out of jealousy and possessiveness. Regarding Roxanne's subsequent imprisonment, she served only two-thirds of her sentence in the colony before being transferred to a semi-open education center in Tulsa due to good behavior. Roxana was able to communicate with her daughter and was eventually released early. The press, of course, became interested in this case again, and the public was outraged that the cook from Molina was released so early. However, there were those who, while considering Roxana a murderer, justified her actions by viewing her as a victim in the overall situation. The case is still being debated in the country today. Overall, this story highlights the serious consequences that can occur if domestic violence is not addressed early on. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Domestic violence was not uncommon at all times, and victims frequently choose to silently tolerate this attitude toward themselves and the domestic tyrant. 
believing his impunity allows him to cross any boundaries. The worst thing about such situations is that children may become victims. The case of young T.L.A. Palmer made headlines across Australia a few years ago due to its extraordinary cruelty and monstrous coincidence of circumstances. When a child from one dysfunctional family moved to another, the situation became even more terrible and cruel. The girl's birth mother, in an effort to protect her only daughter from her tyrant husband, gave her to another family with the best intentions. However, as it turned out, she placed T.L.A. in the hands of death itself. The case in question is quite complex and ambiguous. There were several criminals, all from the same family. At the same time, the investigation determined that nearly all of them were victims of domestic tyranny. And now I'll tell you everything in order. T.L.A. Lissa, Rose Palmer, a girl from a dysfunctional family, was born in a small Australian town, Logan City, Queensland, in April 2003. Unfortunately, the girl grew up in less than ideal conditions. The family's head abused hot drinks, and the man was hot-tempered and aggressive. He repeatedly beat his wife in front of the child and, on occasion, the daughter herself. The girl was constantly stressed and lived in a state of fear and depression. It is not surprising that she began to flee from home on a regular basis in order to avoid hearing the endless scandals of her parents and coming under the hot hand of the father. We can only speculate as to why the girl's mother, Cynthia Palmer, did not leave the man who abused her and her daughter. However, the young woman decided to give her only child to another family, believing that this would be better. Cynthia later stated that it was a forced measure and that she was deeply sorry for it However, she was unable to do so at the time because she was held hostage by the circumstances. However, the dysfunctional family's neighbors have a different story. According to some reports, Cynthia is an alcoholic. She attempted treatment, but overcoming addiction was not easy. And after another escape from home, when she was discovered wandering the streets on the other side of the city, the Palmer family became very interested in child protection services Representatives from the service came to the family home and offered assistance, and Cynthia did not refuse to have her daughter temporarily placed in a foster home, given the environment in which the girl was raised. It's no surprise that she grew up to be a difficult teenager with a difficult personality. As a result, finding her a foster family proved difficult. She was always running away, loitering and begging on the streets. She disobeyed her guardians and did everything her own way. T.L.A. did not stay with her first two families for long because her foster parents simply couldn't handle her. She didn't commit any serious crimes, but she was frequently accused of lying. The girl desired the comfort of home, but had no idea what it should be, and any disagreement with the household inevitably resulted in the child's escape from the Thorburn family in early 2015. Kylie appeared to have found her ideal foster family, who were eager to welcome her. Rick and Julia Thorburn, along with their spouses, made up the Thorburn family. We were raising two sons, Josh, who was 19 years old at the time, and Trent, who was barely 18. The family lived in a spacious two-story home with a swimming pool, located in a small country town in Brisbane suburbs. They had their own horse farm, and Julen started a private kindergarten at home that was very popular, and local parents trusted the Thorburns with their children. The family was considered well, off and prosperous, respected in their home state, and trustworthy. Furthermore, they had demonstrated a willingness to accept a troubled teenager into their care, which was unusual. Tiale was placed in a new home in January after Child Protective Services determined that this was the best option for her. At first, everything went as usual. The girl rebelled, refused to live with her guardians, and ran away several times. But each time, the Child Welfare Service found her and returned her. But as the months passed, Kylie appeared to calm down, accept her new family, and get along with them. In reality, however, the outward well-being was hit by a real drama that quickly turned tragic, Ty Lai's mysterious disappearance. The girl attended a local school, which was a few kilometers from her guardian's home, so Kylie's foster father drove her to school every day, and after school she made a lot of new friends who described her as a kind, cheerful, and happy girl. She continued to dream of returning home and maintained contact with her biological mother and grandmother. Tiali occasionally complained of discomfort and even fear without specifying what she was afraid of. On October 30, 2015, Rick drove to school as usual and then returned home to do chores. 
but he soon received a phone call informing him that his adopted daughter had not shown up for class. No one was particularly concerned because the girl had previously run away, but she usually returned in the evening or the next day. The guardians reported the incident to the police and the search for TLI began almost immediately. All members of the family willingly cooperated with the investigation and claimed that there had been no conflicts between them that could have resulted in a runaway for a long time. Instead, the girl was in good spirits and appeared to be quite happy. According to the family's head, he drove his daughter to school as usual, then returned home and cared for the horses until he received a call from a teacher reporting the girl's disappearance. His wife and sons confirmed these statements. The next day, the door burns set up a social media page dedicated to the search for TLA. They posted information about her photos, the time and circumstances of her disappearance, and a description of what she was wearing that day. The couple asked anyone with information about TLA's whereabouts to contact them or the police, but no one called. Police also searched the family's home in the state but discovered nothing suspicious. Although the foster parents' behavior appeared to be calm, they had essentially nothing to charge. Soon, many concerned people joined the search operation, genuinely concerned about the girl's fate. They combed the area using flyers with her photos and interviewed local residents in the hopes of gathering some useful information, a discovery on the riverbank. After a week of unsuccessful searches, the fishermen contact the police and report a terrible fine. According to the men, they went to the Pimpama River in the morning of November 5. However, after barely casting their fishing rods, they noticed something unusual in the swampy shallow water as they came closer. The fishermen were horrified when they realized their discovery was nothing but human remains. The police officers who responded to the call reported that the body was that of a short man, but it was so disfigured that it was impossible to determine the deceased's gender. He had no clothes on, and no personal belongings could be found nearby. The body had numerous injuries that were initially thought to be caused by wild animals in the area. Furthermore, it decomposed rapidly due to heat, moisture, and a large number of insects drawn to the distinctive odor. The gruesome discovery was sent for examination, and it was determined that it was a girl aged between 12 and 16 years old. The police then gathered information on all missing young people recently, and the corpse was quickly identified. It was Tyle Palmer, whom the entire city had been searching for for nearly a week. The cause of death was impossible to determine because the body had been in the water for so long. However, Experts speculated that Tyle died from asphyxiation after discovering that her hyoid bone had been crushed. The most horrifying aspect, however, was that the injuries, which were initially thought to be animal bites, could have been caused by a person prior to Tyle's death. Tyle's death was clearly criminal in nature, so a criminal case was opened and a murder investigation was initiated. However, the investigation was moving very slowly because no serious leads have been found yet. This meant that the process could take months, if not years, and result in another unsolved crime. The case quickly became public, and nearly a quarter of the city's population came to say goodbye to the deceased girl. People brought flowers, soft toys, and balloons to the memorial service. On November 14, young Tiali's body was cremated. Tiale's birth mother gave a series of interviews to reporters in which he openly accused Child Protective Services of criminal negligence that resulted in the tragic store fires. The Foster family willingly cooperated with the investigation from the start, but their behavior raised some concerns. Rick was supposedly the last person to see the girl alive, but no one could confirm that he actually drove his foster daughter to school on October 30. Spouse and sons claimed to have seen Tiale enter the car. Surveillance cameras along the school route also captured the car driving in that direction. However, no footage of Tiale leaving her guardian's car could be found anywhere. No teachers or classmates saw the girl that day, either at school or on the school grounds. Tiale appeared to have vanished. Investigators had growing doubts that Palmer was even in the car. Family members occasionally aired in their testimony about the events of that day but insisted that everything was as it had always been, and there was nothing to suggest trouble with the children's secrets. As part of the investigation, dozens of children and teenagers were interviewed, including the deceased's classmates and friends. Everyone spoke highly of her, but they did mention that Taya Lee of her, but they did mention that Taya Lai had recently been concerned about something but was unable or unwilling to discuss it. 
Tiale requested temporary shelter from a classmate a few days prior to the tragedy. She claimed she was in trouble and that the guardians would kill her. These statements were not taken seriously, and, despite feeling sorry for her, the friend was unable to invite someone to her house for a sleepover without parental permission. The other girl mentioned that Palmer had told her her secret. Trent, the youngest of the Thorburn brothers, was her 18-year-old love interest. Furthermore, she boasted that they were romantically involved and would be together in the future. The latter revelation sounded strange because Tia Le was only 12 years old, and a relationship with an older brother, even an adopted one, seemed unlikely, like a childhood fantasy. Nonetheless, the information she received was definitely something she needed to look into. The Thorburn family members categorically denied all suspicions. They referred to their deceased adopted daughter as a liar who wanted to draw attention to herself, and they suggested that the girl's school friends may have made up something or fantasized. There was no solid evidence to suggest that the Guardians had committed a crime against Hailey, so they remained at large and went about their business as usual. Their private kindergarten continued to accept children, the farm thrived, and they did not have to deal with the pain of loss. For several months, the investigation was essentially on the same ground. Local residents with prior convictions were questioned, and those suspected of crimes were investigated. However, the search returned no results, and no new leads appeared. Even the announced high reward for any information about the case did not expedite the process. A parallel search was carried out in the area where TLA's body was discovered. And a month later, under a layer of silt, a backpack and a shoe presumably belonging to the deceased were discovered 150 meters away from where the body was. These items were obviously intended to be discarded so that they would never be discovered. The entire story drew a large public response. The search and investigation results were broadcast on television and published in the press, and city residents organized pickets to demand that the killer or killers be found and punished. The biological mother of the deceased Tia Le organized some of the tickets. Eventually, the police appealed to potential accomplices of the perpetrator, promising them protection and immunity if they identified the perpetrator or provided any significant information. However, this appeal also went unanswered. In six months, no new clues or avenues of investigation have emerged, despite an anonymous call and a wiretap at the Thorburn residence. It wasn't until the summer of 2016 that police received an anonymous call that altered the course of the investigation. The anonymous caller claimed that the Thorburns were looking for a troubled teen for a reason. They were motivated by a mercantilist interest, as custody of troubled children is compensated with increased allowance. Anonymous also stated that their youngest son most likely had an intimate relationship with TLE, which he had mentioned in passing prior to the tragedy. Of course, this information could have been false. However, detectives remembered that they had previously heard from the deceased's high school friend that TLA and her name brother may have had an affair. The investigators decided not only to take a closer look at Trent, but also to examine him thoroughly. The interrogations yielded no results because the guy and his family members insisted on their nine involvement, claiming that the girl fled and then got into trouble. The family's social media pages were quietly examined, and one of the chat rooms and trans profile revealed an unusual correspondence. Approximately a month and a half before the tragedy, he told his cousin that he had an intimate relationship with a girl much younger than him, but he did not reveal her name. Of course, the dialogue on social media could not become incontrovertible evidence, but it did allow the police to obtain permission to install listening devices in the Torburn house, albeit without their knowledge. The wiretaps yielded shocking results within the first few days. On the recordings, family members could be heard meticulously rehearsing their versions of events, ensuring that their stories matched in every detail. The family had taught his household what to say and how to behave and from the mother's mouth came such phrases as dad made this decision to save, we'll have to live with it. Never, ever tell anyone or anything, regardless of what happens. Rick threatened his family members several times, and while it was clear that they were afraid of him because they knew his father could turn words into action at any time, there was still insufficient direct evidence. However, the Thorburn blue card, which granted them permission to work with children, was revoked almost immediately forcing the private kindergarten to close. The wiretap quickly confirmed that the youngest of the brothers had been intimate with Tiale. In fact, 
It had been happening on a regular basis for several months before he informed his mother in October that Tyle was pregnant. If Trent's suspicions had been correct, he would have been sentenced to prison for having an affair with Tyle. Julia told her husband everything, and Rick decided to take action. Julia and her sons arrived in Brisbane early on the day of the tragedy, ostensibly for business. It was supposed to serve as an alibi for them, so Rick stayed at home with his adopted daughter. When the mother and heirs returned home in the evening, it was already known that the girl had gone missing, and the family's head claimed to have solved the problem without providing any details, including arrest and investigation. Based on the information obtained, all members of the family decided to re-interview, and the police decided to search Rick's car, in which he allegedly drove his adopted daughter to school on the day she vanished. And it turned out that the car was sold almost immediately following the tragedy. The vehicle was located, and a thorough inspection revealed old washed out traces of blood in the trunk. DNA analysis revealed that the blood belonged to Tialai, who had been murdered. After that, any remaining doubts were dispelled and the Thor Burns were taken into custody. They were questioned separately, with Trent being the first to speak. It turned out that he had duped Tiale into seducing him by telling her about his feelings and promising that they would always be together. She fell completely in love with him, believed him, and even boasted to her school friends that she was in a real relationship. However, when she became suspicious of the pregnancy, she realized that the foster father could literally kill her and began to ask her classmates to take her in, at least for a while. Rick fought the longest, but was put under pressure by evidence and testimony from his family members. He confessed to killing his foster daughter, claiming he was only trying to protect his family. He had strangled her severely and disfigured her body in the hopes that no one would ever identify him. Rick didn't consider the possibility of DNA testing when the head of the family was formally charged with first-degree murder. He collapsed and was rushed to the hospital with a heart attack. Their doctors concluded that he had caused the attack himself by taking a large dose of powerful drugs. They fought for his life for several days so that the perpetrator could face trial and receive a just punishment. The entire country followed each family member's trial and sentencing, as well as the investigation and trial. Because the Tiale Palmer case became one of the most publicized and cruel in the last decade, each member of the Thorburn family was found guilty but many believe their sentences were too lenient. For example, Josh, the eldest son, was sentenced to just three months in prison for perjury and attempting to obstruct the investigation. The court considered his genuine remorse and the fact that he was a key witness against his father and younger brother during the trial. Julia Thorburn was sentenced to one and a half years in prison for perjury and harboring her husband and son. At trial, she admitted that she was terrified of her husband and believed he could murder her and her son. The youngest of the brothers was sentenced to four years in prison, which many children believe is too light a punishment for seducing Tai Lai. Perjury and obstruction of the investigation. In fact, the young man served just over a year before being released early. The head of the family who treated Tai Lai the most brutally was sentenced to life in prison. He pleaded guilty to all counts and expressed deep regret for his actions. Rick repeatedly stated that he was motivated by the desire to protect his family, but he does not understand how he could commit such a crime. Following the final verdict, Tiali's birth mother gave an interview in which she stated that none of the punishments for her daughter's killers were harsh enough. However, the day of the verdict signals the end of her quest for justice. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Beautiful, wealthy, famous, and successful women can be deeply unhappy in their personal lives. The Turkish arabesque performer Belgian Cyril Miser, also known as Bergen, was tortured by her husband for many years. She is a well-known figure in Turkey and around the world. He beat her, disfigured her face with acid, and eventually shot her. Our heroine today is Edith Rosario Bermeo Cisneros, an Ecuadorian performer, television actress, music producer, and lingerie designer also known as Sharon La Hechiquera, or simply Sharon, through her own hard work, perseverance, and talent. She has risen to heights beyond imagination, becoming one of Ecuador's and Latin America's top stars. Karen wished for simple female happiness, family comfort, and a peaceful harbor to which she could return every evening and simply be herself. But the man she loved, 
her husband and the father of her child, saw in her only an endless source of funds for his trouble, free and carefree existence. This man was ultimately responsible for the death of the nation's favorite in 2015. However, despite widespread publicity, the final point in this high-profile case has yet to be resolved. Sharon lacks a biography from her early years. The future star was born on March 28, 1974, in Santiago de Guayaquil, a large metropolis. Located on the Gaias River in Ecuador's province, the girl's full name was given at birth. Sounds like Edith Rosario Bermeo Cisneros. She grew up in a simple, modest family with two other children. Soon after her daughter's birth, the entire family relocated to Duran, where the future queen of techno, Cumbia, spent her childhood and youth. Edith was a bright, active, and artistic girl from a young age. At home, she was affectionately known as Charo or Cherito, and this nickname later became part of her stage name. Edith grew up watching the popular American comedy television show B with another name, My Wife Bewitched Me. Her idol and object of imitation was the show's main star, cult actress Elizabeth Montgomery. Then the same girl changed her name to Charo, Enchantress, and aspired to replicate her favorite actress's success. She has always been interested in music and enjoys singing. She had a good musical ear and decent vocal data, but calling them outstanding was difficult. Nonetheless, the girl won over everyone with her natural charm, artistry, and ability to reincarnate. At the age of eight, she won the City Children's Festival by performing Foxing Taiko compositions in Los Angeles. By the time she graduated from high school, she had won numerous awards in local and regional music competitions. She aspired to be a famous singer and perform on stage, but her parents were skeptical. They believed that the heiress lacked the talent to become a star and that because their family had no connections in the entertainment industry, a career as a performer was not worth pursuing. Edith, following the advice of her family, decided to attend university, pursuing a more practical and down-to-earth career as a public relations specialist at the State University of Guayaquil's Faculty of Communication Sciences. Her dream of becoming a singer, however, remained unfulfilled. He believes that everything has a time and that she should wait a little before pursuing the most appropriate path to fame. While attending university, Edith worked as an assistant teacher and kindergarten teacher, a seller of sweets and maroca, a traditional Ecuadorian drink, and a dancer in the local creative team, performing as a warm-up act for visiting popular artists and musical groups. But all of this was just to save money, which he later used to record her debut music album, Braveheart, which was released in 1998. In 2005, the singer released her third studio album and received the prestigious award for being the first solo techno cumbia artist in the country to top the music charts. In 2010, she released her fourth album, Poco a Poco. Two years later, her fifth album was released, which unfortunately became the last in her life and career from the early 2000s until her untimely death in 2015. Sharon was the author host and co-host of numerous entertainment programs and TV shows broadcast on TV channels in Ecuador and other Latin American countries. She has appeared in several television series and has worked as a public relations specialist for Canela TV. In addition to a successful career in music and television, he has decided to try her hand as a fashion designer, creating seductive lingerie from her own sketches. And in this case, she waited for success and the brand she created quickly gained popularity among women across America. Sharon was not interested in doing whatever business. She was successful in every way, reaching new heights and receiving recognition. Personal life of the performer. Despite her dizzying success on stage, television, and in the fashion industry, one of Ecuador's most prominent stars had a less than idyllic personal life. She disliked discussing this topic with the press and avoided answering such questions from journalists at all costs. However, Sharon Law Haxera was constantly in the crosshairs of numerous photo and video cameras, making hiding anything from prying eyes impossible. It is known that in the mid-1990s, the aspiring performer was romantically involved with Eduardo Gray, an entrepreneur and music producer. The couple had been officially engaged for several years, but the wedding did not take place. Although Edith gave birth to a daughter from her lover, whom she named Samantha, the daughter inherited her mother's entrepreneurial spirit and artistry, becoming a well-known performer 
and actress. Despite her best efforts and connections, she was unable to surpass her mother. Sharon began a new romance shortly after her breakup with Eduardo. This time, her chosen one was a little-known television operator, whom she met while working on a telenovelia. Their relationship grew quickly, and after a brief engagement, the couple held a modest wedding, attempting to conceal the event from others. However, the information quickly became public, and the marriage itself lasted only a short time. The performer preferred to remain silent on the reasons for his sudden divorce. Later on, the artist had romantic relationships with a well-known impresario named Pedro Francisco, a young ballet dancer who performed with her on stage, and some of her star colleagues. Unfortunately, none of these romances progressed to a serious level, and Sharon ended her relationship with her boyfriend for various reasons. The performer declined to comment on the events in her personal life. She raised a career, oriented daughter, but still hopes to find a worthy, loving man in her life. Relationship with Giovanni Lopez In 2009, the performer met Giovanni Lopez, a young man who was more than 10 years her junior. He was born in Ecuador but moved to the United States with his parents when he was a young child. The family settled in New York City, where Giovanni spent most of her childhood and adolescence. They first met during the singer's large tour in the United States. But at the time, their communication was limited to work, and Lopez assisted in the organization of Sharon's performance. Even so, these two have most likely developed some sympathy for one another. Furthermore, it turned out that the young man was a longtime fan of the Queen of Technocumbia, and he was thrilled to have the opportunity to work with her directly. A year later, Giovanni decided to return to his native Ecuador. He brought with him designs he had created for artists, including one for Sharon specifically. So began their collaboration, and almost immediately a stormy romance developed between them. At the start of this relationship, the performer was already 36 years old, while Giovanni was only 24. However, the 12-year age difference did not embarrass them, and the couple was unconcerned about what others would think of them or how the media would write about them. Almost immediately, the lovers moved in and decided to live together. However, it should be noted that the performer's parents and daughter treated her new chosen one with caution, and Giovanni immediately disliked it and they concluded that the young man's twisted romance with the star was solely for selfish reasons, and that he did not love her at all, but only wanted to use her. Sharon ignored the warnings of loved ones because he believed he had met the most important man in his life, with whom he would share many happy years. Soon after the couple married, they began to consider the birth of a common heir. However, they encountered a problem because the performer was unable to become pregnant. As a result, she decided to use in vitro fertilization, and in May 2012, the 38-year-old celebrity gave birth to a boy named Brian Giovanni Lopez. The abusive relationship Giovanni, they only tried to be a caring and loving man on whom you could rely on everything. However, as soon as the couple married and the performer became pregnant, the young husband's behavior began to change dramatically, and he literally transformed into a domestic tyrant. He no longer sought to earn money independently, and he was content with his position as an Alphonse. He willingly spent his wife's money on his own needs, entertainment, expensive clothes, and personal grooming. Lopez also began to abuse alcohol, and appeared less and less frequently at home, preferring to spend time with friends and mistresses. To all of this, Giovanni began to openly insult his wife, pointing to her age and fading beauty. According to some reports, as a result of his offensive statements and remarks, Sharon decided to undergo a number of plastic surgeries in order to maintain her youth and resemble her husband. In particular, the performer enlarged her breasts and performed a number of cosmetic manipulations. However, all of her efforts were in vain and did not contribute to the restoration of family peace and harmony. The Queen of Technocumbia continued to work actively, starring in TV series, hosting entertainment shows, and preparing material for a new album. She tried to smile in public, claiming that she was finally content in her personal life. However, only people close to her knew about how things were really going in her family. In early 2014, when little Brian was not yet two years old, the artist made the first serious attempt to end the relationship with Giovanni, but he said that he would agree to give a divorce only if Sharon would give him half of his property and funds in her bank accounts so that he could continue to lead an idle and carefree lifestyle to which he was used. Sharon could not agree to these terms, 
so she began consulting with lawyers about how to end the marriage while keeping the property and full custody of their joint young son. By the end of the year, family life had become unbearable, but the couple continued to appear happy in public. One final family trip. On the eve of the new year 2015, the performer gave a number of festive concerts, and she also starred alongside her star colleagues in several dedicated Christmas and New Year's events. After that, exhausted by her work, the young woman decided to take a small vacation to the warm coast with her friends, husband and son to relax a little and try to gather her thoughts before deciding what she should do next. On the evening of January 3, 2015, the entire company decided to return because the journey was going to be long and they were driving. The friends decided to follow each other and stay in constant contact in case anyone needed assistance. They decided to pre-plan all of their stops along the way. Sharon had to drive the car at evening because her husband had consumed alcoholic beverages throughout the day. After a few hours, the company stopped at a gas station and decided to eat dinner in a roadside cafe. During the meal, the singer and her young husband got into a heated argument because Giovanni ordered another drink. Despite his earlier promise not to drink and drive, he allowed Sharon to rest and spend time with the child. The couple argued for about 30 minutes and couldn't agree on who would drive the car. Finally, their friends couldn't take it and asked if they could go on their way. The singer stated that she did not want to delay them due to family issues, so they could continue, and he and Giovanni would need to stay a little longer. The friends reluctantly agreed, and after another half hour, drove away, leaving the couple at a roadside cafe. They had no idea Sharon would die before they saw her again. Strange accident. On January 4, around half past 2 a.m., the friends received a phone call from an agitated Giovanni who asked them to return because there had been an accident and Sharon might have died. His words were shocking because he did not provide specifics, making it impossible to determine what had occurred on the night road. By the time they returned, emergency services were already on the scene, attempting to assist the victim and reconstruct the sequence of events. According to Giovanni, at around 1, 15 a.m., on the highway to Del Spondilis, Near the Ecuadorian province of Santa Elena, his wife got out of the car to comfort her crying son and change his diaper. At that point, another car smashed into her at high speed. Without stopping, this car sped away from the accident scene. The young woman was thrown a few dozen meters to the side of the road by the impact. When the ambulance arrives, she was still alive. She's been taken to the hospital. Despite the doctor's best efforts, Sharon died of massive injuries and internal bleeding. Giovanni was still drunk and confused during his testimony and his testimony, and his story sounded strange and illogical. As a result, the police decided to detain him until the morning so that they could question him thoroughly. When he had come to his senses, Lopez confirmed the words of friends that he and his wife argued all evening and admitted that, despite his wife's promises and prohibitions, he defiantly drank alcohol in order not to drive and piss off Sharon Giovanni's testimony. He did not see the license plate number of the car that hit his wife, wife. He didn't remember the mate and only mentioned that the car was white. There were no CTV cameras along that stretch of road. No witnesses could be found, and the accident itself appeared suspicious because Sharon did not even turn to the side of the road before leaving the cabin and did not ensure her safety. Although any vehicle on a straight, deserted road can be seen and heard from afar even at night, the longer the police tried to correlate all of the facts with Lopez's story, the more it resembled a premeditated murder. Giovanni was confused about the timing and chronology of events and could not recall details. Most interestingly, he couldn't explain why their car was facing the opposite direction of the road they were on. Following another interrogation, the deceased singer's husband was arrested as the primary suspect in her death, the autopsy results, and Sharon's funeral. The autopsy revealed that the deceased woman's body had numerous injuries consistent with a traffic accident. However, experts discovered a clear and fairly deep mark on Sharon's chest that could have been caused by a seatbelt. This fact raised additional questions and suspicions. Samantha, who spent the New Year's holidays with her boyfriend, was stunned when she learned about the tragedy from singer Sonia Ramos, a close friend and colleague of her mother. She called her father, Eduardo Gray, and asked him to come to her as soon as possible so that they could go to Sharon's house together and start planning the funeral. After making all the necessary preparations, 
the celebrity's body was transported to the Colosseum Voltaire Paladins Polo in the province of Guayaquil. Thousands of Ecuadorian friends, colleagues, and fans gathered to say goodbye to one of the brightest stars. Furthermore, this sad event was covered in all of the country's leading publications, and it was even announced on television one morning. Samantha, overcome with grief, sobbed on her father's shoulder, surrounded by her grandmother, grandfather, uncle, and aunt. The deceased celebrity's family refused to comment on what had occurred. None of them directly accused Giovanni of what happened, but they all demonstrated their disapproval of him through an investigation and a surprising court decision. The case was among the most high profile in Ecuador's history. It received extensive media coverage and jeopardized the reputation of the country's judicial system. The initial verdict literally shocked the celebrity's relatives and fans, and the case's revision was so delayed that the final point in this matter has yet to be resolved. So the white car, which presumably hit the artist, was discovered a few days later. The car had characteristic damage, which experts have determined could have resulted from an accident. If you hit someone at high speed, the owner of the vehicle is a young woman named Tatiana Chavez, who has categorically denied any involvement in the accident. However, the prosecutor's office has opened criminal cases against Tatiana for negligent homicide and Giovanni Lopez for premeditated murder. His story sounded extremely unconvincing. He was confused and contradicted himself before recognizing the car and even claiming to have seen the driver only to doubt his own words by referring to alcohol intoxication. In parallel, the deceased's daughter and parents issued a statement blaming the singer's husband for the incident. They believe he never loved Sharon and committed the murder to seize her money and custody of the child. Samantha stated that her mother had discussed the dissolution of their marriage with lawyers shortly before the tragedy. Samantha also stated that her younger brother, who was the only witness to the incident, cries all the time and repeats, Daddy is bad. However, they did not involve the child as a witness in order to spare the boy further psychological trauma. After a detailed reconstruction of the events of that evening, Tatiana was ruled out as a suspect. By comparing the times and locations where Tatiana had been seen before and after the accident, it was determined that she could not have been physically near the accident site at that time, and her car had been damaged in another accident. The other car was soon identified as the one that struck Sharon. Louis Carrillo, the owner and driver that night was arrested. By that point, he had already replaced the broken headlight and repaired other body damage. However, experts were able to determine that at the scene of the accident, shards of glass from his car were discovered. Lewis admitted to everything and stated that Sharon literally fell under the wheels of his car and he was so scared of what had happened that he simply drove away. Giovanni was convicted of manslaughter against his wife in June 2015. Experts determined that the woman's chest injury from the seatbelt was caused by her attempting to protect herself before her husband pushed her out of the car, directly under the wheels of another vehicle. However, Sharon's relatives and fans were taken aback by the court decision. Because her killer was only sentenced to three years in prison, he is seeking a retrial and appealing the new verdict. Such a lenient sentence sparked a media frenzy and prompted widespread protests across the country. People demanded just punishment for the murder of a celebrity and national favorite. Already in July of that year, the judges involved in the case were suspended and later dismissed. The new judicial staff overturned the previous verdict, citing a number of administrative and bureaucratic errors. All defense lawyers' attempts to challenge the reversal of the verdict were unsuccessful. Louis Carrillo was cleared of any responsibility for the singer's death, but he was charged with fleeing the scene and attempting to conceal evidence. But Giovanni Lopez was brought to every court session under heavy security to avoid attacks on him by Sharon fans. In October 2015, the singer's husband was found guilty of her death and sentenced to 26 years in prison. The court also considered Samantha's evidence of Giovanni's cruel treatment of her mother, as well as the fact that he blackmailed his wife by demanding a large sum of money in exchange for her consent to divorce. A few months later, two appeals were filed simultaneously. The prosecution demanded that the sentence be increased to the maximum of 35 years, while the lawyers argued that the new sentence was legal. However, both complaints were dismissed. In 2021, Lopez attempted to appeal the court's decision. In addition, he claimed that he was mistreated in prison and that his rights were violated severely. The prisoner even went on hunger strike to persuade the court to release him.
He claimed that he was wrongfully convicted, while the primary perpetrator of the tragedy, Luis Guerrero, remained free. Giovanni appealed again in 2023, this time with a new lawyer, in the hopes of securing his release. It is worth noting that in this difficult case, the judge's composition was changed once more due to the revealed abuse of power. As a result, Lopez's defense team hopes to not only challenge the verdict, but also seek compensation for the years he spent in prison. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Today, we will examine a case that unfolded in Minnesota in 2013. Kira Steger, a 30-year-old store clerk at a clothing store in the Mall of America, was known for her dedication to her job. She had never missed a shift. So when she didn't show up for work on February 23, 2013, her co-workers grew concerned. They attempted to reach Kira, but received no response to calls or text messages. Consequently, they alerted the police that she was missing. Kira K. Steger was born on November 19, 1982, in Des Plaines, Illinois. She was the daughter of Marcy and Jay Steger, who lovingly described her as a lively, dedicated, and sweet daughter. Kira had been employed at the Mall of America, working at two stores, Wet Seal, and more recently, Delia's. Her co-workers were not just colleagues, she considered them family. Kira had a unique ability to recognize people's strengths, even when they didn't notice them themselves. She had ambitious plans and dreams for a bright and serene future. Tragically, all those dreams vanished in an instant when Kira mysteriously disappeared on Thursday, February 21st, 2013. On that day, she had a shift at work and her coworkers reported that she seemed in good spirits, planning to enjoy a nice dinner with her husband after her shift. Kira and Jeffrey Trevino had met three years prior and had ignited a spark, leading to a romantic relationship and ultimately a wedding. Overall, they appeared to be a happy and stable married couple. Although they had occasional disagreements, these seemed minor and were kept within their private circle. Neither their relatives, friends, nor co-workers were aware of any serious issues. However, two days after Kira failed to come to work, on Saturday, February 23rd, her co-workers grew increasingly concerned as her behavior was atypical for her. She was known for her punctuality and strict adherence to her schedule. Unable to reach Kyra, her co-workers contacted Jeffrey, who had no knowledge of her whereabouts. Jeffrey explained that Kyra had left their home the previous morning and hadn't returned. He didn't find it particularly concerning since Kira had a history of occasionally disappearing for a day or two, staying at a friend's or relative's place unannounced. One possible cause for concern was the heavy snowfall that day, which could have resulted in difficulties on the road, such as her car getting stuck or her phone battery dying. Receiving no news from his wife, Jeffrey filed a missing persons report and contacted Kira's family. This mysterious disappearance shocked Kira's loved ones profoundly. Detectives immediately started working on Kira Steger's missing persons case upon receiving the report. Typically, Investigations in such cases begin by questioning the spouse and searching the immediate vicinity. This case was no exception, and detectives visited Jeffrey's residence to speak with him. Jeffrey told the detectives that on Thursday, he and Kira had spent time together after work, having dinner, playing bowling, and eventually leaving the mall. According to Jeffrey, they went straight home as Kira intended to watch a movie. Jeffrey also mentioned that his wife left their house the next morning, a Friday, around 8.30 a.m., as she had a work event that required her presence. He didn't find her absence unusual, given her history of occasional disappearances. Jeffrey, however, did admit to some relationship problems over the past few months. He considered these disagreements to be minor, typical of any family. When the detectives asked if Kira might have had a lover, or been staying with someone else, Jeffrey denied this possibility. He claimed to trust his wife and love her deeply. The investigators gathered information about Kyra and her car, and they personally visited the Mall of America to verify Jeffrey's account. The mall, one of the largest in the world, 
is located in Bloomington, boasting 520 stores, theme parks, an oceanarium, movie theaters, a golf course, and more. Given its size, it had numerous security cameras. After reviewing the surveillance footage, detectives confirmed that Jeffrey's account held true. They observed that he met Kira after work, and they spent time together at the mall before heading to the parking lot and leaving. There were no signs of any arguments, and the evening seemed ordinary. However, the anxiety of not knowing Kira's whereabouts weighed heavily on her loved ones as each day passed without any news. Unable to bear the uncertainty, Kira's family traveled to Bloomington to assist with the investigation. They distributed flyers with her pictures in an effort to raise awareness and garner public help. While Kyra's family distributed flyers, investigators continued their efforts. During interviews with neighbors, officers noticed a surveillance camera at one neighbor's house, which partially captured the area around Kira and Jeffrey's home. They asked the homeowner to provide them with the camera footage in hopes of finding clues. Meanwhile, cell phone records provided a new lead. Kira had another man in her life besides Jeffrey, Ryan Went, who managed one of the stores she worked at. They had a significant and ongoing romantic relationship, as evidenced by frequent correspondence. Ryan was out of state at the time of Kira's disappearance, traveling towards Colorado. This raised questions for investigators. Was it a mere coincidence, or was there more to Ryan's sudden move? They had to find the answer, but they eventually cleared him of suspicion as the timing of their text messages indicated he was not involved in her disappearance. Examining the video footage from the neighbor's surveillance camera became crucial for investigators. The camera's rapid rotation made it challenging to observe anything carefully. Still, they managed to capture a few seconds of Kyra and Jeffrey's house. Jeffrey's account of their evening appeared to align with the footage. However, upon closer examination, they noticed Kira's car reversing into their yard shortly after 2 a.m., although the poor quality of the footage and the camera's constant motion made it hard to discern details. Nonetheless, the car soon left the property. Jeffrey explained that he drove to a gas station because Kira had asked him to fill up her car before her morning commute. Surveillance footage confirmed his trip to the gas station around 3.30 a.m. Surprisingly, after leaving the gas station, Jeffrey didn't return home but instead headed towards the highway. The neighbor's camera didn't capture his return, but this could have been due to the camera's constant rotation. Investigators considered the possibility that Jeffrey might have returned home later when the camera was facing another direction. Further analysis of the footage showed Kira's Chevrolet leaving at 9.21 a.m., but it was impossible to determine the driver. A missing persons report had been filed on Saturday, February 23rd, on Monday, February 25th, the police received a call about a suspicious vehicle near the shopping center where Kira worked. Security guards at the multi-story parking lots had noticed a car parked there for several days and called a tow truck. Upon closer inspection, the tow truck driver found red smudges on the trunk lid and reported it to the police. It turned out to be Kira's white Chevy, containing a few small bloodstains. Inside her purse, they discovered divorce court forms that appeared to have been downloaded from the internet. Additionally, a rolled up trunk mat found in the snow behind the car was stained with Kira's blood, confirmed through DNA testing. This grim discovery suggested that Kira was likely no longer alive. It devastated her family and friends as her last hope of seeing her again had faded. Many questions remained unanswered. How had she died? Had she suffered? and who could have harbored such resentment as to take her life. The absence of Kyra's body made the situation even more difficult to bear for her loved ones. The detective's top priority became identifying the person who abandoned the vehicle in the parking lot. The car left the house at 9.21 a.m. and the mall's cameras captured it shortly after. Although there were no cameras in the parking lot where the car was found, one camera pointed towards the path leading to the car. This camera captured the arrival of the car, followed by the appearance of a hooded man. Given the cold weather, the hooded attire wasn't unusual. The man crossed the street, had a brief conversation with a taxi driver at a nearby stand, and then got into the cab. 
The police identified the taxi company based on the timing of the interaction and the license plate number. All the taxis in the parking lot were equipped with GPS tracking devices, allowing the police to determine that the hooded man's journey ended near Kira and Jeffrey's house. He paid cash and left the neighborhood, passing by the same camera that partially recorded the couple's home. Two minutes later, another hooded man entered the frame. Although the footage had low resolution, they noticed a white logo on his hoodie. As they continued watching, the hooded man entered the house where Kira and Jeffrey lived. Kira was still missing at this point, making it highly likely that the hooded man was Jeffrey. With a search warrant secured, law enforcement officers headed to the house. At first glance, it appeared to be an ordinary home. But upon closer inspection, forensic experts discovered dark red stains in the bedroom. Stains were found on the wall next to the bed and approximately a hundred on the mattress. Luminol revealed more hidden bloodstains on the carpet that extended from the bedroom into other areas of the house. Forensic analysis confirmed that it was Kira's blood, strengthening the investigator's belief that she was no longer alive. The police also examined Jeffrey's car but found no blood or signs of a struggle. However, they did discover something interesting, a gas station receipt in Jeffrey's car, issued an hour and 40 minutes before Kira's car was discovered in the mall's parking lot. The receipt showed that Jeffrey had used his card to make a purchase at the gas station, followed by a cash withdrawal from an ATM. To gather more evidence, detectives reviewed the gas station's security footage, which showed Jeffrey filling his car with gas, going inside the station, and withdrawing cash from the ATM. The footage briefly revealed his face, as well as a logo on his jacket that resembled the logo on the man seen in the earlier surveillance footage. Based on this new information and the evidence found in the house, Jeffrey Trevino, 39 years old, was arrested. He was taken to the police station for questioning and became the prime and only suspect in the case. During questioning, Jeffrey immediately invoked his right to remain silent, seeking advice from his attorney. The police had enough evidence to charge him, but locating Kira's body was crucial to further cementing his guilt. Everyone believed Kira was no longer alive. As the police, Kira's family, and volunteers conducted extensive searches, they made a disturbing discovery in late March. Near Keller Lake, a few miles from Trevino's house, volunteers found a peculiar bag by the roadside and contacted the police. Inside the bag were a bloodied pillow, a shirt, and a bra, all linked to Kira through DNA analysis. Although divers searched the lake, they found no remains in the water. The area around the lake was also scoured multiple times using search dogs specifically trained to find bodies, yet their efforts yielded no results. After two and a half months on May 8, 2013, the St. Paul Police Department received a troubling call. A caller reported seeing what appeared to be a dead body in the Mississippi River. Police retrieved the body and dental records confirmed it was Kyra Steger. Kira had suffered severe blunt force trauma to her forehead and a fractured index finger on her left hand. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, the exact cause of death could not be determined. With this new evidence, investigators sought to reconstruct the timeline of events leading to Kira's death and its aftermath. It was speculated that upon returning home and discovering Kira's romantic correspondence with someone else, Jeffrey grew increasingly angry. When Kira refused to show him the messages, he forcibly took her phone, resulting in a broken finger. As his rage intensified, he tragically took Kira's life and attempted to hide the evidence. Using Kira's car, he transported her body to the house, then later used the car to dispose of her remains in the river. He made a stop at a gas station and withdrew cash, knowing he would need to pay for a taxi after abandoning Kira's car at the mall. Returning home, Jeffrey attempted to create the impression that Kira had left on her own that morning and was fine. However, surveillance cameras foiled his plan. In October 2013, a jury convicted 39-year-old Jeffrey Trevino. His defense argued that the act was not premeditated and resulted from a heated and sudden argument sparked by the discovery of his wife's infidelity. Before sentencing, Kira's family members made statements in court. Her sister, Carrie Ann Steger, referred to Jeffrey as a calculated criminal. 
and expressed that he deserved no mercy. Marcy, Kira's mother, pointed out that Jeffrey had shown her daughter no mercy and had discarded her like trash in a polluted river. Jay, Kira's father, emphasized that no punishment could ever compensate for the pain Jeffrey had caused their family. In November 2013, Jeffrey Trevino was sentenced to 27 and a half years in prison. He became eligible for parole in 2031. Family members and loved ones come together to celebrate the holidays together. Uh, certainly this happens, it's, it's very tragic. The Christmas, to be the Christmas. Christmas. the decorations on each storefront along its historic Main Street to its endless list of holiday events and programs. There's over 1,500 activities from the start November 22nd all the way to January 10th. The city of Grapevine takes Christmas to a whole new level. To be the Christmas capital of Texas, you can't buy it out of a catalog and have the same thing the next city has or the next state or county. Every December 25th, individuals from all corners of the globe come together to celebrate the Christmas. Anticipation fills the air as people eagerly await the sumptuous feasts, the exchange of heartfelt gifts, and the delightful tradition of watching Christmas movies. In the midst of this festive season lies Grapevina, Texas, a charming suburban town spanning 16 square miles and boasting a population of approximately 50,000 residents. It's an understatement to say that the residents of Grapevine hold a deep affection for Christmas. Their devotion to the holiday even earned the town the prestigious title of Christmas Capital of Texas. The Christmas Day of 2011 in Grapevine unfolded as a tranquil and peaceful day. Families gathered, sharing cherished moments, and all appeared to be in its usual state of harmony. However, at precisely 11.34 a.m., an unexpected turn of events would disrupt this idyllic serenity. Grapevine 911, where is your emergency? Hello, Grapevine 911. You need help? Are you sick? What was that? Do you need an ambulance or police? Hello? One moment. I'm just getting heavy breathing on the phone and I need to to talk to you, so please hang on. The caller was breathing heavily, and it was unclear what they were saying or what the situation was. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Approximately 20 seconds elapsed in eerie silence after the caller's mysterious heavy breathing and then the line abruptly went dead. The caller remained unresponsive. Originating from a local apartment's landline, this puzzling incident prompted an immediate dispatch of both police and firefighters, tasked with unraveling the enigma that unfolded on that unsettling Christmas morning. In a mere three minutes, the police arrived at the two-story unit nestled within the Lincoln Vineyard Apartments, situated in the 2500 block on Hall Johnson Road. The apartment from which the call had emanated occupied a position towards the rear of the complex, affording a view of Colleyville Heritage High School's sprawling fields. Given that many residents had departed to enjoy the holiday, with their loved ones, numerous apartments stood vacant. Upon reaching the apartment in question, the front door revealed itself to be securely locked from the inside. A series of knocks reverberated through the hushed corridor, yet the only response was an eerie silence devoid of any signs of life. Law enforcement officers, fueled by growing apprehension, peered through the windows, and what they encountered was a macabre tableau. Within the living room, seven lifeless bodies lay strewn about, some on the sofa and others on the floor. Their demises bore the grim signature of gunshot wounds with telltale defensive injuries, 
suggesting they had desperately sought refuge from the relentless bullets. It appeared that these unfortunate souls had just concluded the act of unwrapping their Christmas gifts when the horrifying massacre unfolded. Adding to the macabre scene, both of the adult males clutched firearms in their right hands. Strangely, no neighbors reported hearing the unmistakable sound of gunshots, though it was understandable given the sparse occupancy of the apartments at that time. As the police meticulously combed through the complex and embarked on crime scene examinations, a particular detail emerged as striking. An SUV was conspicuously parked outside the apartment. Subsequent checks revealed that the vehicle was registered to a man residing two miles away in the suburban enclave of Colleyville. The gravity of the situation spread rapidly throughout the community, but before any information could be released, the victims needed to be officially identified and their next of kin notified. The authorities believed they knew the victims' identities, but sought unequivocal confirmation, a process that would take longer than desired due to the unavailability of the state driver's license fingerprint database on that fateful Christmas day. It's the, uh, probably the worst investigation that we've had to, you know, investigate in, uh, you know, many years. Uh, this is something that's very tragic and, uh, you know, regardless of what day of the year it happens on, it, it's, it's something that's very uh, unfortunate, but uh, it's certainly amplified uh, given the fact that it is Christmas today. Uh, I've been with this police department for 12 years and uh, this is probably the most tragic thing that we've, you know, I've certainly been involved with. Uh, and I think, you know, I can speak safely for the rest of the police department. I don't think any uh, members of the police department has encountered something like this on Christmas Day. Grapevine police say someone inside the family's apartment called 911 around 1130 Sunday morning, but the line stayed silent. Officers soon arrived and broke down the door. It appears that the victims are all in one central location, living area, kitchen area. The four women and three men, ranging from their late teens to early 60s, had been shot with a pistol. The bodies were removed from the house and taken away for autopsies to be carried out. After this, the names of the victims were eventually released, revealing that they were all part of the same family. Sergeant Robert Eberling, in a press briefing, divulged crucial details of the investigation. It was revealed that two firearms had been involved in this tragic event. A Glock 23, a 40 caliber pistol equipped with a 10 round clip, and a Smith & Wesson 9 15 model, a 9 mm pistol featuring a 15 round magazine. The latter weapon was registered to the owner of the SUV found parked outside the scene and had been acquired back in 1996, further deepening the intrigue surrounding this devastating incident. Uh, it's still early in this investigation, obviously, though this did play out some almost 24 hours ago. No, there is no known motive, at least as one that police are telling us about. There is also no outward sign of the horrible tragedy that unplayed right through this sliding glass and door uh, frame here of this apartment complex. Here is what we do know at this point. No one heard any of the gunshots that were fired inside of this home. Someone from inside of the home called 911 around 1130 yesterday morning, but that person did not speak into the phone. An operator then sent police, Grapevine, Texas police, here to this scene to go and investigate, and they found the scene that we've been talking about. Their bodies were found in what was otherwise the evidence of a normal Christmas morning. There were Christmas presents that had been unwrapped, and there was paper strewn about the room, but obviously, no doubt, a very right. sad situation in this town on Christmas morning, which calls itself the Christmas capital of Texas. As far as what neighbors are saying, I mean, I can show you a bit here, Richard. This is a uh, sort of tight knit, uh, very packed together apartment complex. Mm. We have spoken to several neighbors who are waking up this day after Christmas morning. They're all asking us what happened. They're speaking about a tragedy, something like this. Uh, they would not otherwise expect. On the other side of this apartment complex, there is a brown fence, and beyond that is a high school here, Colleyville Heritage High School, which is noted to be one of the best high schools in the entire North Texas mm. region. People move here because this is a safe community, uh, and they're saying, obviously, they have to question that, given what happened yesterday. On the 26th of December, the owner of a local spa became concerned when one of her employees, who had worked for her for four years, failed to show up for work. She tried calling her employee but got no answer. For someone who's always early to work and who never misses a day, we expected the worst, she said. 
Residents were terrified. This was the worst gun violence that the community had ever seen, and the police needed to address their fears, Sergeant Eberling said. We are pretty confident that the shooter is among the deceased victims inside the apartment. We are not actively looking for a shooter that we believe is at large. As they began to piece together what they knew, the truth about who these people were and what had happened would eventually come out. Colleyville, Texas, a wealthy suburb of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just a few miles away from Grapevine, was home to the Yazdan Pana family. The parents, 56-year-old Aziz and 55-year-old Nisreen, had both been born in Iran. They married in 1987 and moved to the United States, where they later welcomed two children, Nona and her younger brother, Ali. Nisreen had worked in a salon doing manicures and often talked about her family with people. Family was everything to Nisreen. She was close to her sister, Zori, and together they were described as two of the nicest people you could meet. Zori was married to a man called Muhammad Hussein, also known as Hussein, who was well known among the Iranian American community. He owned a large ranch in Dallas, and the family was incredibly close. The Yazdanpana family lived in a 3,000 square foot property in Colleyville, and on the surface, things appeared to be fine. Neighbors would see the family having yard sales, and Aziz appeared to be very active in his children's lives. He volunteered as a debate coach at Knox High School. One neighbor said, from everything we saw, he was actively engaged with his children. He was described as outgoing and would say hello to people if he passed them in the streets. But neighbors did note that he seemed to be very protective of his children. Nona and Ali were both doing well in school, so their parents had plenty to be proud of. Nona graduated from Colleyville Heritage High School and was a student at a local community college. She had big dreams of moving to the West Coast and attending school in California, with hopes of one day becoming a lawyer. One of Nona's friends said that she had implied that all was not well within her family and that things were becoming tougher for them, but she didn't provide further information. Her friend said that she was aware that Aziz was, in her words, really strict with his children and would take Nona's phone and refuse to give it back. She added that Nisreen was far more understanding than Aziz was. Nisreen's brother, Ali, said he had been supporting the family financially, as Aziz had not been employed for a number of years, having previously worked in the mortgage and real estate business. His financial problems had been ongoing for years. In 1996, he was placed on probation for three years after pleading guilty to one count of subscribing to a false income tax return. He was issued a fine of $1,000 and ordered to pay $3,119 in restitution to the Department of Justice. Just three years later, Aziz and Nisreen jointly filed for bankruptcy. The case was discharged a few months later, but their financial problems continued to worsen. In August 2010, Nisreen filed for bankruptcy, hoping it would help them keep their family home. However, the house was foreclosed on. Aziz initially attended meetings with Nisreen during the proceedings, but this would soon change. During the proceedings, she separated from her husband and moved with their two children to an apartment in Grapevine, two miles away. Nisreen's brother had paid for the apartment as they were living without electricity or water due to the foreclosure. Nisreen was the only one bringing in money. Nona opened up to one of her friends and said she felt like her family was falling apart. The bankruptcy Nisreen had filed for was later dismissed because she had not made the planned payments. According to her lawyer, George Barnes, she had told him, please don't talk to my husband at all. Aziz had listed his employment as self-employed, even though he was out of work and not earning any money. Aziz allegedly sold the family's furniture and rugs to pay for sex workers. The separation and financial difficulties had been incredibly hard on Nisreen. She had a state cosmetology license but disease had forbidden her from working after Aziz became unemployed and the family's finances took a hit. She had worked two jobs at different spas to try and keep the money coming in after they separated. A family friend said that Nisreen had done everything she could to remain on good terms with Aziz. She, along with the help of her sister, had decided to buy only the basic necessities for her apartment. She was described as a quiet, super kind lady a peacemaker who didn't want anything to happen to her kids or her family. 
she was a really wonderful mom and always protective of her kids. After Nisreen moved out, Aziz stayed in the family home and neighbors would often see him working in the yard. One neighbor said he wasn't even aware that Aziz's wife and children had left the home. Although separated, they appeared to be on good terms, and Aziz also had a key to the new apartment and would occasionally visit his children. As the year began to come to a close, it was soon time for what the people of Grapevine loved most, Christmas. On Christmas Eve, the extended family had all gathered at Muhammad's ranch to enjoy a large Christmas party and spend some much needed time together. One of those in attendance was 22-year-old Sarah Zeri, Muhammad's daughter, who attended the University of Texas at Arlington as a pre-med student and was also a member of the Tri-Delta sorority. Dozens of people were there and the celebrations carried on late into the night. Aziz had not been invited. The following day on Christmas, Nisreen and her children were at the apartment in Grapevine. That morning, Aziz set off to the apartment in his sport utility vehicle, dressed as Santa Claus. He parked outside, and shortly after he arrived, Nisreen's sister, brother-in-law, and niece came to the apartment too. Just before 11 a.m., Sarah sent a text message to her friend which said, So we're here. We just got here. And my uncle is here too, dressed as Santa. Awesome. She was, of course, referring to Aziz. Just 15 minutes later, she sent another message. Now he wants to be all fatherly and win Father of the Year. Within a few minutes after opening their gifts, Aziz revealed he had brought two guns with him. He opened fire and, in terrifyingly quick succession, killed six members of his family, Ali, Nona, Zori, Sarah, Muhammad, and Nizreen. All had multiple gunshot wounds and had been shot several times. At 11.34, less than 20 minutes after Sarah had sent that text message, the 911 call was made. Great plan, 911. Where is your emergency? Do you need help? Are you sick? What was that? Do you need an ambulance or police? Hello? Although the dispatcher couldn't initially discern the contents of the call, the police opted to process it through specialized software to enhance the audio and extract more information about what had transpired. After this analysis, it became clear that someone had urgently said, help, help, followed by the caller stating, I'm shooting people. This led them to the conclusion that Aziz had placed the call to emergency services. Grapevine 911, where is your emergency? Hello, Grapevine 911. Do you need help? Are you sick? What was that? Yet more revealing information. Very hard to stomach this morning as we listen to Grapevine Police give us the latest update. They are now telling us that this gunman dressed as Santa Claus was definitely an invited guest. Welcome at this Christmas celebration that no one knew he had arrived with two handguns he intended to use. And when he did, police say he caught his victims totally by surprise. We await more information, but what we already do know is that this family involved definitely had some financial problems. We know that mom and Depp had separated back in March and that dad was still living in the Colleyville home that the bank had foreclosed on last year. Seven family members shot and killed on Christmas Day. Just to know that like the entire family was murdered is pretty awful. It's certainly the worst signal shooting that we've had with this many victims. Neighbors broke away from their holiday gatherings and watched as police searched the apartment for clues. They say the family kept to themselves and are stunned by the timing. It's just crazy, you know, unexpected, especially on Christmas Day, and family members most of all. With so many unanswered questions, investigators are trying to determine why the gunman massacred his own family on what should have been a day of joy. Mayor Tate Williams expressed profound shock and sorrow in the wake of this horrific tragedy, labeling it a profound and heart-wrenching event. He underlined the added anguish that it occurred on Christmas a day that should have been filled with joy and celebration. Sergeant Eberling, who had been dedicatedly working on the case, echoed these sentiments, characterizing the incident as the most horrifying homicide Grapevine had ever witnessed 
and highlighting that it marked the town's first murders since 2010. The community found it almost inconceivable that such a violent and inexplicable event had transpired right on their doorstep. Funeral arrangements were swiftly organized, with friends, family, and loved ones traveling from across the nation and beyond to pay their respects in Texas. In a somber and private ceremony, the six victims were laid to rest, leaving behind a heart-rending void in the lives of those who cherished them. Meanwhile, the police diligently continued their investigative efforts, turning their attention to the foreclosed home in Colleyville in search of potential clues. The hope was that Aziz's computer might yield information shedding light on a possible motive, but their inquiries hit a stumbling block when they discovered that the property's electricity had been disconnected, rendering the computer inaccessible. The perplexity surrounding the motivations behind such a violent attack persisted. As investigators conversed with friends and family members, a portrait emerged of a man profoundly discontented with his wife's apparent success without him. Amidst unemployment and the looming eviction from the house he called home, his situation appeared dire, with the bank scheduled to reclaim the property as early as the following March. The prospect of homelessness, coupled with his wife's flourishing life, could have conceivably fueled his actions. However, with Aziz no longer alive to account for his deeds, the exact workings of his mind would forever remain a mystery. Lieutenant Todd Deering reflected, You can speculate about his bankruptcy. You can speculate about his family relationships. You can speculate about a bunch of different things. But we just don't know right now. Everybody who may have known what the motive was, or what set everything off, is now deceased. Sergeant Eberling added, We really don't have a clear idea of why he did this. Sometimes there's not a really good explanation for irrational behavior. One of the family's friends voiced her belief that the murder stemmed from Aziz's resentment towards his wife's newfound independence and success. The shootings that transpired in Grapevine on that fateful Christmas day not only left the community in shock and the police department in disbelief due to their senselessness and brutality but also inflicted irreparably pain on a shattered family. Nona, Ali, and Sara, with their lives just beginning, had limitless opportunities and potential ahead of them. Zori and Muhammad, who meant so much to their local community and their family, left an irreplaceable void in the lives of those who loved them. For Nizreen, who was on the cusp of thriving and embracing a fresh start on her own, her life was tragically taken by the very person who had vowed to love and protect her, amplifying the devastation caused by this inexplicable act of violence. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Sierra's case. She died after crossing the ocean. Ten years ago, the high-profile case of Sarai Sierra, an American girl photographer, shook the world and brought the intelligence services of two countries on different continents to their feet. The U.S. citizen vanished without a trace during her photo tour in Istanbul, as if out of thin air. As if out of thin air. This story received extensive media coverage, and the situation and circumstances were so unusual that it sparked numerous rumors and conspiracy theories. Despite active, large-scale and timely searches, the girl could not be found alive. Her body was discovered in the city's historic center, near Sarabernus walls. But how did it happen that on a bright day in a popular tourist destination, someone's life was taken so casually and no one noticed? To understand this case, it is necessary to reconstruct the entire chain of events that led to the tragedy. And now we'll try it together. Sarai Sierra, Early Years Sarai Sierra was born in New York on November 9, 1979, and is the second child in a large family. She grew up alongside her older brother, David, and younger sister, Christina. Their parents, Dennis and Bethany Sim Jimenez, were of Puerto Rican descent, but moved to the United States in 1973, settling in Manhattan, where their children were born. Shortly after moving, the couple joined the local Protestant community and converted to evangelical Christianity. They raised their children strictly according to the religious canons of their adopted faith, 
The family attended church on a regular basis, socialized with other members of the community, and sent their children to Sunday school. Sarai grew up to be an active, creative individual who stood out for her strong-willed but complex personality. Sarai was regarded as a rebel and a hooligan, in contrast to her younger sister Christina, who was quiet, obedient, and very modest. At the same time, she respected her parents and acknowledged their undisputed authority in the Jimenez home. There were strict rules that all members of the family followed. This applied to its inhabitants' daily routines, many everyday moments, and behavioral norms. For example, the daughters were not allowed to socialize with boys, go on dates, or leave the house after 9, 0 p.m. All of their friendly interactions were monitored, and parents always knew where and with whom their children were. Sarai's entire life revolved around home, school, and church, and her social circle consisted solely of people from those places. The active, energetic, socially-oriented girl was bored and cramped within the confines of her environment, but her parents were confident that they were doing the right thing for their children. Sarai intended to attend a pedagogical university and work as a teacher in the arts or culture during her school years. However, as she neared the end of her studies, she became interested in psychology and began to consider how her future profession could be related to this field. During one of the religious community's meetings, a slender, dark-haired beauty caught the eye of a young man named Stephen Sierra. He was the first to approach her and made an excuse to speak with her. Sarai was only 18 at the time, and her new acquaintance was seven years older than her. Despite their age differences, the young people began dating with their parents' approval. Dennis and Bethany were immediately impressed by Stephen, believing that he was a decent, polite, and honest young man who would make an excellent match for their daughter. Sarai was most likely not deeply in love with the guy, but she agreed to marry him primarily to get out of her parents' house and gain some freedom from such tight control. It should be noted that Sarai had a good relationship with her parents. She desired the freedom to live her own life and plan her own future. Less than a year after meeting in February 1999, the couple married. The bride was 19 years old at the time, while the groom was 26. The couple soon moved to Michigan, where Stephen's parents lived. Sarai saw this move as a significant event because she had spent almost her entire conscious life in New York. The change of scenery benefited her, and she appeared to be revitalized in her new surroundings. Sarai enjoyed shopping for her new home, making it cozy, meeting new people, and exploring new places. She started working as a receptionist at a local dental office and thought about going to college. Sarai, on the other hand, became pregnant quickly and gave birth to two children, one boy and one girl. Entry into university had to be postponed because the young woman was completely absorbed and enjoyed motherhood. A few years later, the Sierra family, which included two children, decided to relocate again, this time to sunny California, settling in the picturesque neighborhood of Silver Lake in Los Angeles. Stephen was offered a job here, but the couple quickly realized that the money he was earning was insufficient to cover their expenses. So, after consulting, they decided to return to New York and live in a modest rented apartment close to the Jimenez family's home. At the time, the couple was having serious financial problems. Sarai remained at home with the children, and her husband had to rely on sporadic income, which caused them to accumulate debt. The situation improved when the children started school and the young mother got a job at an advertising agency. Stephen had also found a steady job as a bus driver on one of the city routes. Sarai reconsidered her long-held plans to pursue higher education around the age of 30. After their children had grown and their lives had stabilized, Sarai had lost interest in the pedagogical faculty by that point, and she enrolled in one of the local universities to study psychology. However, Sarai quickly became disinterested in her studies, finding the long hours of lectures tedious, she decided to look into other fields and find an occupation that she truly enjoyed, one that allowed her to express her creativity. Sarai had always been a creative person with a talent for drawing and an eye for beauty, so she became interested in photography and soon joined a well-known New York photography community to hone her skills in this area. She was recognized for her talent, demonstrating the ability to capture the right angles and create harmonious compositions, resulting in breathtakingly beautiful photographs. Even professionals lauded her work for its originality and vision. Sarai created a profile on one of the popular social networks in early 2012, 
as advised by her colleagues, and began sharing her work. Success quickly followed, with thousands of other users subscribing to her profile and enthusiastically commenting on each of her works. She quickly rose to prominence, and her subscriber base grew at an exponential rate. Her newfound fame overwhelmed her. Sarai believed she could achieve more and wanted to continue growing and improving in this field. So she proposed organizing a group photo tour to explore beautiful and unusual locations around the world. Sarai Sierra began with small trips within her home country, specializing in photographing architectural ensembles and historical sites. Her photographs were widely acclaimed, so she decided to broaden her horizons. Sarai wanted to go to Istanbul, one of the world's most ancient and beautiful cities, to photograph its landmarks and historical sites. It should be noted that her parents were not thrilled with the idea, as she had never left the country before, let alone been away from home for so long. But Sarai was determined to go. She also planned to bring her best friend, Magdalena, along for the trip. Sarai's family was in crisis, and her marriage was failing. Perhaps part of her motivation for planning a photo tour on the other side of the world was a desire to get away, change her surroundings, and reflect on what was going on in her family from afar. Sarai had been living within strict boundaries for far too long, and she yearned for more. She wanted to follow her heart's desire. During that time, her husband's social media account began to contain unusual posts and statuses. He philosophized on the importance of marriage, love, and mutual respect between husband and wife. He also hinted that he would stay faithful even if their marriage was shaky. Stephen cryptically suggested in one of the posts that his spouse had been unfaithful, but he deleted the post a few hours later, leaving concerned followers with unanswered questions. Stephen seemed unhappy and unloved, and he expressed this on his social media page. Sarai was going through similar turmoil, but she kept her emotions to herself, trying not to complain and focusing on her creative pursuits. The long-awaited trip. Sarai learned shortly before the planned tour that her best friend would be unable to accompany her due to work obligations. The young woman was disappointed, but she did not change her plans because she had anticipated it for too long. Sarai's family was worried about her flying alone to a foreign country across the ocean, but she assured them that everything would be fine and promised to call, write, and send photos every day. Sarai also planned to visit Germany and Austria, where she already had several commercial photography assignments scheduled. Her entire trip was literally planned by the hour, and she was not going to deviate from it. On January 7, 2013, a young American woman took a flight from New York to Istanbul. She was carrying a small amount of cash, a smartphone, a tablet, a low-cost solar camera, and several lenses designed for professional photography. Sarai called her family to let them know she had arrived safely and was on her way to check into the hotel she had reserved ahead of time. It should be noted that she had a limited budget, so she had to stay in a remote location that the locals deemed unsafe. Sarai Sierra went straight to the nearest metro station to reach the historic city center after leaving her belongings in the room and changing her clothes on the road. She wandered Istanbul's streets until nightfall, photographing its beauty and savoring each shot. During the evenings, she would call her parents and husband via video call to share her impressions and plans for the following day. She would also process new shots and share them on her social media accounts. Sarai was accompanied in Istanbul by a young man named Talin, who would later become her new friend. They met through social media in the middle of 2012, and Talin persuaded the American to fly to Turkey. For a few months, they communicated frequently and grew close during this time. Sarai placed complete trust in her new acquaintance. They saw each other almost every day and visited a variety of attractions. The guy was an Istanbul native who knew the city like the back of his hand and arranged for Sarai to go on exciting excursions to the most interesting and sometimes unusual places. After a week in Turkey, the photographer planned a trip to a couple of European countries where she, as previously stated, arranged several commercial photo shoots Sarai saved money on hotel accommodations by agreeing to be hosted by her long-term subscribers. These moments had been pre-negotiated and agreed upon. So, at Vienna's airport, she was greeted by a young man in whose home she spent a few days. Sarai was a few years younger than her Austrian acquaintance. He enjoyed photography and admired her work, so he was eager to communicate with such a talented photographer. The trip went according to plan. 
Sarai went to all of the places she had planned and met everyone she had scheduled to meet. On the third day, she flew to Berlin, where she was met at the airport by her subscribers who took her on a tour of the city. After finishing her business in Germany, the photographer returned to Istanbul where she planned to spend two more days before returning home. Talon greeted her upon arrival, and they spent the day driving around the city before heading to a popular local bar together. After midnight, the Turk escorted Sarai to her hotel, where they said their goodbyes. A strange disappearance in a foreign country. Sarai called her parents and husband on the last day of her photo tour, January 21st, 2013, to inform them of the time and flight she would be taking to New York. She had never been away from home for so long, so everyone was relieved when her trip came to an end. Sarai, on the other hand, decided to take one final walk around the city and capture some more stunning photos for her account before leaving. Sarai's father arrived at the airport on time to pick up his daughter because her husband was working and couldn't make it. He arrived early to avoid getting stuck in traffic and being late. They announced the arrival of the plane. All of the passengers disembarked except Sarai. Her phone was also unavailable, and all attempts to contact her were unsuccessful. Dennis waited a little longer before approaching airline representatives, concerned about his daughter's absence. However, Dennis was shocked to learn that a passenger with such a name had not boarded the aircraft. Dennis immediately called Stephen and informed him of what had occurred, emphasizing the importance of organizing a search right away. Sarai's husband first contacted the hotel where his wife was staying in Istanbul, but was told that her belongings were still in the room and that she had not checked out despite the fact that she should have done so yesterday and did not return to the hotel for the second day. This information caused a real panic among the family members because they didn't know where Sarai was or how to proceed. Stephen, who had access to his wife's accounts, decided to check them for any clues. He discovered his wife's correspondence with Talon, which seemed very suspicious to him. Nonetheless, he decided to contact the Turk directly to find out what he knew, but Talon claimed to have seen the missing woman the day before the planned departure and flight. She did not call him, despite her promise. Sarai's family immediately reported the incident to the American Embassy in Turkey, and a day later, a large-scale search operation was organized on the spot, with a special unit even established. Sarai's husband and parents flew to Istanbul almost immediately, deciding that they needed to be personally involved in the search. After all, it hadn't been long since her disappearance, and there was a good chance she'd still be alive. Investigating police officers, the first step was to determine the American social circle and speak with those who saw her shortly before she disappeared to testify, which included employees of the hotel where she stayed and her friend Talon. The hotel manager stated that he last saw Miss Sarai the night before her departure. She was leaving with a small bag and a camera in her hand. She was supposed to check out later, but she never showed up, and the next morning they received a call from her concerned husband who informed them that Sarai's belongings and documents remained at the hotel. The receptionist also described Sarai's outfit that day. The situation with Talon was far more interesting and ambiguous. First, the guy's real name was Tarkan, and it was unclear why he introduced himself to his new acquaintance under an assumed name. Second, they had been in close contact for several months prior to their meeting, and Sarai had traveled to Istanbul at his invitation. All of this suggested that they had a romantic relationship, but Tarkin categorically denied it, claiming that they were just friends. The next step in the investigation was to recreate Sarai's route as accurately as possible. Her cell phone data and street CTV footage were examined for this purpose. It was discovered that the young woman took the subway to the Sultan Ahmet district, visited the promontory between the Bosporus Bosphorus Strait and the Golden Horn Bay, and visited Emanonu Market but became lost in a large crowd of tourists. The trail was then retraced to the subway, where she was about to descend to the Sarabernu walls, but she quickly vanished from the camera's view. A frightening discovery, the searchers decided to go to the Sarabernu wall ruins to comb the area and conduct interviews. Perhaps someone remembered seeing a lone woman holding a camera. After several hours, the search was deemed successful, if you can call it that. A young woman's lifeless body was discovered near the ruins of the ancient Constantinople walls. It was covered with an old dirty blanket making it less noticeable. Investigators assumed Sierra had been brought here in this blanket. Forensics believed the body had been there for 10 to 12 days before it was discovered. There were no clothes on the lower half of the body, which immediately prompted a version of violence that was later confirmed by specialists. 
Sierra died as a result of a blow to the head with a blunt, heavy object, but she also had several hematomas and a couple of broken ribs, according to the autopsy. Pathologists discovered particles of epithelium and blood under Sarai's fingernails, indicating that she defended herself and scratched the perpetrator. The crime appeared strange and even ridiculous because the victim's bag, smartphone, and camera were stolen. However, she was wearing gold earrings, a wedding ring, and an expensive watch, which immediately caught my attention. On camera footage from the area, all that could be seen was a young woman who appeared to be Sarai filming something on her phone, followed by a man who approached her and either hit or pushed her, and either hit or pushed her before they both vanished from view. The attacker was not immediately identified. Versions and conspiracy theories. Almost immediately, the information was leaked to the media, nearly causing an international scandal. The main point is that people have been asked to help in the search for the missing American woman and to report any information they may have. However, the investigation remained silent, and when the body was discovered, the situation became even more complicated. Many people wondered why a young married woman flew across the ocean alone. What was she doing in Istanbul in Europe? And how did she pay for her trip? It all looked suspicious. Investigators initially believed Sarai had gone to see her lover, Talon, a Katar Khan, and then flew to another man in Austria. However, neither of her friends admitted to having an intimate relationship with the victim. Later, it was discovered that the man who sheltered Sarai in Vienna had a criminal record, leading to speculation that he might use the American as a drug courier, but a thorough investigation found no evidence to support this theory. There were also rumors that Sarai could work for us intelligence services and collect information in other countries, which explains the money for intercontinental flights. This version appeared untenable, so it was not seriously considered. Turkish Special Services and the FBI worked together to investigate this high-profile case, but they initially found no serious leads. Only a few weeks later, the police discovered the alleged perpetrator, a previously convicted and unemployed man named Tal Salih, collecting waste paper on city streets. But it was impossible to communicate with him because, almost immediately after the crime, he borrowed money from relatives and fled the country, most likely to Haiti province, where he illegally crossed the border into Syria. After obtaining a warrant, police searched the suspect's home, extracting a sample of his DNA and comparing it to skin particles and seminal fluid found on the murdered woman. That cleared up any remaining doubts. Tal Salih was the perpetrator of the crime. Furthermore, the victim's phone was last turned on in the neighborhood where he lived. When it was discovered that the criminal had fled to Syria, the special services had given up hope of locating him, but fate soon surprised them. This man was detained while attempting to cross the border illegally again, this time to return to Turkey. He joined the rebels in Syria and obtained firearms, but after being injured in the conflict, he decided it was safer to stay at home. However, he returned with his weapon, which was the initial reason for his arrest, but the local police quickly recognized who was in their hands and immediately reported him to security services. When Tal Salih was brought in for questioning, his story was literally depressing with graphic details. He saw a young woman on a hiking trail along Sari Bernu's walls and spent a few minutes admiring her and watching her take pictures. Sarai tried to ask him something with gestures as he approached, but the language barrier prevented him from understanding what she wanted. However, he noticed a brand new iPhone in her hands and a high-end and a high-end camera around her neck. As Sarai walked on, he followed her, determined to rob her. It was getting dark outside, and there were no other people near the wall that I could see. Sarai turned around and, it appeared to him, took a photograph of him. That action served as a trigger for Tail Salih, who grabbed a boulder and lunged at Sarai striking her hard in the head. After that, they literally rolled together down to the ruins of the wall, resulting in bruises and broken ribs on Sarai's body. Tal Salih then decided to commit intimate-related violence while the victim was unconscious. The perpetrator then delivered another severe blow to Sarai's head to finish her off. Tal Salai took the victim's bag, camera, and phone before walking away. On his way, he came across the same blanket that had been discarded and decided to use it to cover the victim's body again. It was finally dark outside, and there was a chance of meeting someone at the wall. Normal. When the perpetrator returned, he dragged the body to the side, making sure it was not visible from the hiking path. 
He then covered it with a blanket and departed. Surprisingly, while the search for the American woman was ongoing, the perpetrator returned to the crime scene to ensure Sarai was dead and her body was where he had left it. When Tal Salih heard that his victim had been found, he realized that the police would soon be on his trail, so he fled the country, borrowing money from his sister, who always felt sorry for him. By the way, he was never able to realize the stolen goods. The camera was broken in the process of falling, and the smartphone had a password that the criminal unsuccessfully attempted to unlock while at home, resulting in the signal and all of the other stolen items he threw away when he fled. The defendant did not deny his guilt, and according to his accounts, he had no regrets about what he had done, nor did he experience pangs of conscience, which was key evidence. DNA forensic evidence was presented, confirming that his skin was found under the murdered woman's fingernails as well as his seminal fluid on her body. In addition, Sarai's cell phone was last turned on near his home. In addition, the case file now includes a video surveillance camera recording of the attack. After all of the evidence was presented, it was determined that a psychiatric examination was required due to the belief that Tal's sale was insane. This idea was supported by his actions, behavior, and the calmness with which he described the atrocities he had committed but experts concluded that he was seen and fully aware of his actions when he attacked his victim in the summer of 2014. The judge eventually delivered the final verdict. Tal Salih was found guilty of all charges against him and sentenced to life imprisonment. Sarai's relatives thought this was a fair decision. After all of the necessary expert examinations, the body of the murdered American woman was transported to her homeland in New York with a Turkish airline covering all associated costs. Sarai was buried in accordance with all religious rituals and traditions. The deceased's family members created an internet site dedicated to her memory, where they published previously unpublished works. The photographs were a huge success, with people from all over the world eager to purchase them. The proceeds from the sale of pictures were saved by the family for orphaned children's college education. Sarai, Stephen categorically denied that there was a crisis in his and his wife's family life that prompted the young woman to embark on that fateful journey. Stephen quickly became close to a girl from the Christian community who helped him through a difficult time and frequently visited his home to assist him with his children and household chores. Two weeks before his wife's first funeral anniversary, Stephen walked down the aisle with his new chosen one. When the perpetrator was finally sentenced, Stephen was already married and about to become a father again. Sarai Sierra's story inspired a number of television programs, talk shows, and detective documentaries. It has also served as the foundation for several feature projects. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.